Yellow is my promise to even the odds for kids through education. Yellow Hab is about the students embracing and engaging the yellow lens of possibility. We are reimagining education, and to do that, we need like-minded partners. Cisco is driven by innovation and imagination, but our purpose is to power an inclusive future for all. Cisco shares Yellow Hab's vision of inclusivity, and we are so happy to announce our partnership to provide state-of-the-art networking, collaboration, and security tools for Yellow Hab and its students. Partnering with companies like Cisco that really believe in what we're doing is what we're all about. And we're just getting started, so let's make it happen. Humans and nature. We're in this together. Yet nature has given and given. It's our turn to do more. Cisco Smart Building Solutions and our partners' technology benefit both humans and nature. Catalyst switches connect securely, delivering power over Ethernet, reducing costs and greenhouse emissions. Cisco Wireless and DNA Spaces use intelligent automation, creating efficiencies that help the workplace and the planet and collaboration tools enable hybrid work, decreasing environmental impact. Sustainability is essential to powering an inclusive future for all. That's why Cisco is committed to achieving net zero emissions by 2040. Between meeting human needs and a sustainable future, there's a bridge. Cisco, the bridge to possible. Hybrid work is here, it's there, it's everywhere. But for someone to be able to work from here or here, there has to be someone here, making sure everything is safe, secure, consistent. So go ahead, log in from here, dial in from here, sit in from here, assured that someone is here with a view of everywhere, ready to fix anything, anytime, anywhere even here. That's because nobody, and I mean nobody, makes hybrid work work better. Cisco, the bridge to possible. Running makes me feel happy. My favorite part about cross country is like the mental part. I'm Max. When I was 11 years old, I was diagnosed with aplastic anemia. And if I didn't find a donor, I probably wouldn't be here right now. I'm Dylan and I'm 22. Three years ago, I joined the registry at Be The Match. It was simple, just swab your mouth and send it in. Be The Match is a global database of donors. To save more lives, they needed to make more matches. So they consulted with technology integrator E+. The solution, cloud-based management made possible by Cisco UCS. Now, Be The Match team members use Cisco WebEx and Contact Center to collaborate with patients, donors, and their critical career network. And their data is secure, protected by Cisco Umbrella Security. Knowing what Max had to go through, what I had to do was easy. One person in the world was a match to me. It's pretty special. The Cisco network allows Be The Match to make matches faster than ever. And that's just the start of what's possible. I am excited to meet Max. I don't think he knows it yet, but he's always going to have a number one fan. Me and Dylan are DNA twins. <laughs> Dylan's like my brother. <laughs> Managing microservice-based applications can look like this or like this. You need a service mesh to connect, control, and observe microservices deployed on containers or VMs. But using one can be like trying to control all the traffic across an entire city. 
and makes an already complex job even harder. Callisti, the Cisco Service Mesh Manager, offers a simpler way to manage microservices with less friction and more flexibility. Whether it's managing multiple clusters with a mix of VMs and containers or running them in public clouds or on-premises, do it all with a single tool. Manage east-west traffic and SLOs. Handle production-ready Kafka clusters on Kubernetes. Get complete and accurate visibility, all from a single pane of glass. With Callisti, app developers, SRE, and DevOps engineers can easily manage multiple clusters with a single service mesh manager, each cluster with its separate control pane that is synchronized. So you can run highly distributed apps in an efficient and frictionless way. Callisti brings the benefits of all your teams, developers, DevOps, SRE, security, and cloud ops. Callisti helps you manage workloads running in virtual machines and container clusters, all with the same mesh manager, which enables use cases like brownfield workload migrations from VMs to containers, makes mesh deployment easier and development faster. Callisti can help you get started with a few simple steps. The sky's the limit. What are you waiting for? Managing microservice-based applications can look like this or like this. You need a service mesh to connect, control, and observe microservices deployed on containers or VMs. But using one can be like trying to control all the traffic across an entire city. It makes an already complex job even harder. Callisti, the Cisco Service Mesh Manager, offers a simpler way to manage microservices with less friction and more flexibility. Whether it's managing multiple clusters with a mix of VMs and containers or running them in public clouds or on-premises, do it all with a single tool. Manage east-west traffic and SLOs. Handle production-ready Kafka clusters on Kubernetes. Get complete and accurate visibility, all from a single pane of glass. With Callisti, app developers, SRE, and DevOps engineers can easily manage multiple clusters with a single service mesh manager, each cluster with its separate control pane that is synchronized. So you can run highly distributed apps in an efficient and frictionless way. Callisti brings the benefits of all your teams, developers, DevOps, SRE, security, and cloud ops. Callisti helps you manage workloads running in virtual machines and container clusters, all with the same mesh manager which enables use cases like brownfield workload migrations from VMs to containers, makes mesh deployment easier and development faster. Callisti can help you get started with a few simple steps. The sky's the limit. What are you waiting for?
Managing microservice-based applications can look like this or like this. You need a service mesh to connect, control, and observe microservices deployed on containers or VMs. But using one can be like trying to control all the traffic across an entire city. It makes an already complex job even harder. Callisti, the Cisco Service Mesh Manager, offers a simpler way to manage microservices with less friction and more flexibility. Whether it's managing multiple clusters with a mix of VMs and containers or running them in public clouds or on-premises, do it all with a single tool. Manage east-west traffic and SLOs. Handle production-ready Kafka clusters on Kubernetes. Get complete and accurate visibility, all from a single pane of glass. With Callisti, app developers, SRE, and DevOps engineers can easily manage multiple clusters with a single service mesh manager, each cluster with its separate control pane that is synchronized. So you can run highly distributed apps in an efficient and frictionless way. Callisti brings the benefits of all your teams, developers, DevOps, SRE, security, and cloud ops. Callisti helps you manage workloads running in virtual machines and container clusters, all with the same mesh manager, which enables use cases like brownfield workload migrations from VMs to containers, makes mesh deployment easier and development faster. Callisti can help you get started with a few simple steps. The sky's the limit. What are you waiting for? Managing microservice-based applications can look like this or like this. You need a service mesh to connect, control, and observe microservices deployed on containers or VMs. But using one can be like trying to control all the traffic across an entire city. It makes an already complex job even harder. Callisti, the Cisco Service Mesh Manager, offers a simpler way to manage microservices with less friction and more flexibility. Whether it's managing multiple clusters with a mix of VMs and containers or running them in public clouds or on-premises, do it all with a single tool. Manage east-west traffic and SLOs. Handle production-ready Kafka clusters on Kubernetes. Get complete and accurate visibility, all from a single pane of glass. With Callisti, app developers, SRE, and DevOps engineers can easily manage multiple clusters with a single service mesh manager, each cluster with its separate control pane that is synchronized. So you can run highly distributed apps in an efficient and frictionless way. Callisti brings the benefits of all your teams, developers, DevOps, SRE, security, and cloud ops. Callisti helps you manage workloads running in virtual machines and container clusters, all with the same mesh manager 
which enables use cases like brownfield workload migrations from VMs to containers, makes mesh deployment easier and development faster. Callisti can help you get started with a few simple steps. The sky's the limit. What are you waiting for? Managing microservice-based applications can look like this, or like this. You need a service mesh to connect, control, and observe microservices deployed on containers or VMs. But using one can be like trying to control all the traffic across an entire city. It makes an already complex job even harder. Callisti, the Cisco Service Mesh Manager, offers a simpler way to manage microservices with less friction and more flexibility. Whether it's managing multiple clusters with a mix of VMs and containers or running them in public clouds or on-premises, do it all with a single tool. Manage east-west traffic and SLOs. Handle production-ready Kafka clusters on Kubernetes. Get complete and accurate visibility, all from a single pane of glass. With Callisti, app developers, SRE, and DevOps engineers can easily manage multiple clusters with a single service mesh manager, each cluster with its separate control pane that is synchronized. So you can run highly distributed apps in an efficient and frictionless way. Callisti brings the benefits of all your teams, developers, DevOps, SRE, security, and cloud ops. Callisti helps you manage workloads running in virtual machines and container clusters, all with the same mesh manager which enables use cases like brownfield workload migrations from VMs to containers, makes mesh deployment easier and development faster. Callisti can help you get started with a few simple steps. The sky's the limit. What are you waiting for? Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us and welcome to the second day of Cisco Quantum Summit 2022. Uh, my name is Hassan Shapurian. I'm a quantum research scientist at Cisco. So today we have a full agenda with 10 talks in three sessions on photonic integrated circuits, various components such as source, detectors, memory, and quantum repeaters, and finally, software and quantum network protocols. So for the registered users, let me remind you that uh, you can post your questions for the speakers on the Slido panel next to where, you, uh, where, you're, where you're watching the videos. And we have also some ongoing polls and it, we would love to hear your thoughts on them. 
Without further ado, uh, let's dive into the first session. I'll be your moderator here. Um, so uh, let me introduce uh, our first speaker. It's my great pleasure uh, to introduce Dr. Anthony Yu from Global Foundry. Uh, he is the vice president of the quantum of computing and wired infrastructure business unit there. Uh, so Anthony, the stage is yours. Thank you very much, Hassan. It's really a pleasure to be here at Cisco Quantum Summit. I'm coming to you from our Malta, New York um, fab, our 300 millimeter facility, where much of the work that I will um, soon describe in a few slides here is taking place. So um, I'm sure um, it was highlighted yesterday at your uh, first day of the Quantum Summit, but um, quantum computing, this appears to be the time for quantum computing to complement classical computing, but that um, in many in many instances, people have described the state of manufacturing um, quantum computers as being equivalent to like the 1950s or 1960s um, relative to its, its um, position for classical computing. I would tend to agree with that, but what I would, would submit here uh, with these charts is that at Global Foundries, we see the opportunity to bring quantum computing to its fruition. We see quantum computing taking a, a place alongside, but we see that um, foundries such as Global Foundries have a very critical role to play in terms of um, bringing the, the necessary material science to manufacturing reality. Uh, what we'll talk about here is uh, as you go from classical computing from, from a zero and one bits to quantum computing and the qubits, the manufacturing, the control, and the polling of the quantum states drive some unique requirements. But what I'll show you is that we've been able to make it work with some key components for manufacturing, building into our existing uh, CMOS system in the case of the control circuitry, as well as our photonics foundry for the uh, execution of a PIC through some partnerships that we've announced publicly. So. It does require a long-term vision. This is not an overnight endeavor to be able to create the critical building blocks, but we've made substantial progress. Much of it has been public, and I'll emphasize the steps we're taking, but some of the challenges that remain in order to bring this to a true manufacturing process um, state that would be comparable to what's done for classical computing. So again, I think uh, I'm not stating anything that this audience doesn't already know. There are um, a variety of ways to handle qubits. There can be any, I, I view it as any two level system. We have a variety of methods that are being practiced um, with us here at Global Foundries. Some of the examples are shown on the right um, relative to using the spin of an electron or the polarization of a photon or the spin of a, of a quantum dot. Obviously people like IBM and Google have done a lot of things with their existing um, demonstrations of quantum computing. Um, uh, superconducting um, has, has been a way to, to be able to prove the existing um, matter-based qubits. What we will be talking about in this presentation is, is the pursuit that we are taking, one level of pursuit where you're taking at Global Foundries, using light-based qubits and using photons and silicon photonics um, as our two-level system demonstration. But Regardless of whether you do it through matter-based or through light-based, the success of the quantum system depends on the manufacturability and the, the making, the manipulation, and ultimately the entanglement. But what makes it much, much different from CMOS, what makes it even different from silicon um, photonics foundry, is the need to be able to uh, allow that the qubits to not be disturbed and to allow them to remain in quantum states of superposition and entanglement obviously known as coherence, but that brings about some unique challenges relative to protecting and, and handling the, the, the logical and the physical qubits and keeping it away from noise levels. And so the manufacturing challenge for the control of these qubits are to allow for coherence times that would be long enough for computation and ultimately for error correction. So Global Foundries has, has basically three elements that would go into a quantum computing solution. Three elements that we're practicing today and that we have in various states of manufacturing readiness. Probably the most mature on the far left 
is the fully depleted SOI technology known as 22FDX. I'll talk about how uh, using this technology, which, which allows you to avoid um, carrier freeze out and, and allows you to operate at low temperatures, whether it be millikelvins or 4, 4K. Um, that technology has been proven and has been exercised by several of our ecosystem partners. 3D packaging for things like the dilution cooler, we have seen form factors emerge, pairing our 22FDX ship with a photonic ship, and we see 3D system integration, which we practice as part of our CMOS technology, put to use. That is a key element for a photonic system, for a, for a quantum system. And on the far right, as I mentioned, handling of the qubits using silicon photonics has uh, allowed us to leverage our 45 nanometer photonics with an F trademark um, uh, uh, process to be able to be paired with, with 22 FDX to provide a combination of a fully depleted control chip and a qubit um, photonics chip. So these aren't the only uh, subsystems that go into a quantum system, but these are the three that are being practiced today in manufacturing state within global foundries. So let's start with 22FDX, which is a, a unique technology, which allows um, uh, you know, quantum storage and control capability. And there are four elements of the technology, which I'll, which I'll describe very briefly here. Number one is it has a very, very thin silicon film, which allows a, um, some people are allows this for, for storage of, of the quantum qubits, or also for control. But the key attribute for the 22FDX technology is the fact that there's no doping in the channel. So the 20 nanometer buried oxide layer allows the transistor channel to be undoped. It's controlled simply by the metals and the source of the drain. And the transistor body is, is isolated from the channel and electrostatically influences the channel by itself using body bias, which allows you to compensate for its operation at very low temperature. So with this architecture, our, our ecosystem partners have taken advantage of this to make it operate at cryogenic temperatures in 22 FDX. If you look on the right-hand side, you can see that the red uh, circles and the red triangles show the, the performance at a relatively high temperature, and the blue dots show it at, a, at the low temperature. And you can see the performance actually improves for FT and Fmax at the lower temperature. So this is a, an attribute of the undoped channel which allows it to you to demonstrate the possibility of a monolithic one processor at these very low temperatures. Um, on, the, on the lower right-hand side is um, a circuit that one of our partners has, has designed. I'll show you some references on the next page to actually build a transipedance amplifier with a gain at 2K, which is actually better than, than showing at room temperature. And the back bias gate allows you to actually tune the threshold voltage to maintain a sweet spot operating condition at temperatures as low as 2K. So this technology has been demonstrated by people like the University of Toronto to be able to be uh, used as a control chip when paired with um, a matter-based qubit. So there's a growing body, immense, much of this work dates in 2019 and 2020, of using this technology as a proof point for quantum computing. Um, partners and ecosystem partners like Equal One, partners and ecosystem partners like University of Toronto have both used the technology for both storage as well as for um, you know an actual control of spin-based quantum computing, leveraging the fact again that there's no doping in the channel and allows it to be operated at very low temperature. Um, it is not in production today. But um, I think the, the low temperature performance of the technology is well behaved and this seems to be a pretty high um, confirmation of its manufacturability such that I would submit that it's a technology well suited for what you need for the low temperatures required for a quantum computer. I'm not going to spend much time relative to 3D system integration other than it's, it's well practiced at Global Foundries with a variety of, of metal pitches, I'm going to move instead to the control of the qubits using our silicon photonics process, what we call GF photonics. So I would submit that while there are various matter-based qubits, 
both demonstration and in fact um, for existing quantum computers today that photonics are a unique advantage uh, of, to be used as qubits. I think light in the form of photons, you know, carries quantum information, has been shown to work across all temperatures, including the low temperatures that we just cited earlier on, on the previous pages, has no crosstalk, and by virtue of the existing silicon photonics boundary process that we have in production here at Global Foundries, photons and light can be manipulated using optical components built in an active CMOS line, such as what we have today in our Malta, New York facility. I submit with our business that we have today and our, our process that silicon photonics itself is manufacturable and a good complement to um, the, 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 the technologies that you need to build a quantum computer. Our silicon photonics boundary business at Global Foundries has been built and qualified um, in the last couple of years. And we have a production facility building parts today using silicon photonics primarily for the pluggable transceiver uh, market uh, being used within the data center. Um, silicon photonics was used um, with the introduction of 100 gigabit optical transceivers. Today we're building parts for customers up to 800 gigabits per second. And the next generation next year will be 1.6 terabit per second. We show that um, in terms of our SAM that we have our, our segmented um, market availability on the top right here, which shows that today the silicon photonics uh, foundry market is about $400 million building the optical transceivers shown in the schematic on the right. We do that with our process called GF photonics, which is a monolithic uh, integration um, foundry process. Monolithic refers to the fact that for our uh, manufacturing process, we combine the active and passive optical components such as modulators, detectors, waveguides with RF CMOS to create a system on a chip for the optical transceivers. Now for quantum computing, there are some differences, but I'll, I'll start off with the foundation upon which um, quantum computing um, is leveraging as it moves into the unique differences between quantum computing and the pluggable transceiver that I described. Shown on the upper left-hand side is a very rough schematic for what the pluggable transceiver is today. This pluggable transceiver is basically defining the foundry components that we have, uh, which make up our photonics foundry. We have laser coming in on the left-hand side, and we have a mock sender modulator. This mock sender modulator is a very carefully doped um, modulator that, that has two arms where we're able to control the refractive index and the resultant phase. The optical interconnects, which you show that we have a variety of passive photonic building blocks, are all elements that should be familiar to this audience. You know, waveguides, tapered waveguides, bending waveguides, uh, silicon-based waveguides, silicon nitride-based waveguides, polarization splitters, polarization rotators. All those are very, very important in the case of an optical transceiver. And as I'll show you in subsequent slides, are incredibly important to handle the uh, extreme low loss needed for controlling photons as qubits. The photo detector that we use for an optical pluggable transceiver is different than that which, which is used for quantum computing. The photo detector we use in this case here is a germanium based photo detector, which basically takes a photon, it comes in through, and, and is detected through a TIA. Uh, and then it, it's then translated back uh, into the electrical lo logic cell. But the handling of the passive components as shown on the right-hand side are basic, and these are foundational. Routing, coupling, polarization handling, wavelength filtering, all these things drive manufacturing capability for things like immersion technology to make sure that the sides of the, of the waveguides are smooth uh, to protect scattering of light. Uh, control of the refractive index, the variety of materials, whether it be PECVD or LPCVD, all these are base materials and base capabilities of material science that are practiced within our silicon photonics um, based process and now further extended to quantum computing. Also, well, we have a partnership, a public partnership with a company called Psi Quantum, 
which is um, using the elements that I've described for some of the components that we have in manufacturing, including uh, our 22 FDX chip, um, form factor stacking, and the use of photons. And if you just look at it from a standpoint of the basic building blocks, they beautifully describe it here relative to photon generation. I think Hassan described yesterday, you talked about the source. Photon manipulation, we show an example of photons sitting on various um, you know, waveguides and waveguide states, photon manipulation, and then photon detection, which is different from what we do with optical, um, with our optical transceivers. We're not using germanium detection there, but the base principle is the same. The control of single photons and tracking it alongside um, as it progresses through the pick and being very careful to protect it from, from noise and protecting it um, to give it the qualities of, co of coherence needed for quantum computing. So one of, some of the key differences here to summarize very, very quickly is, as I described in the first choice, in the first slide, the choice of any technology is always how do you minimize loss? And, and um, as a rallying cry for our manufacturing engineers here in the facility, loss is the enemy. And uh, it's true in optics, it's true for our base boundary process for things like pluggable optical transceivers, but it's paramount. It's probably the, the number one factor that we need to control for the material science for quantum computing. If you compare it to the optical transceivers that we have in our datacom and telecom business and our datacom and telecom customers, waveguide loss, it can never really be low enough, but roughly speaking, you're looking at about less than one dB per centimeter waveguide loss. This is a traditional link budget. You know, you, you have laser power coming in at 200, 300 milliwatts coming in there for traditional pluggable transceivers. It progresses through the line, but I think relative to its progression through the passive components, you're looking at loss of about one dB per centimeter or less. We're doing this for a combination with our GF photonics process of both um, silicon as well as silicon nitride. As I mentioned before, we're applying a 300 millimeter immersion technology for very, very low line edge roughness. And it's about a 2X improvement by using immersion versus non-immersion lithographic technologies. And if you see it on, on the table on the very left for a comparison of 150 to 400 nanometer waveguides, you see roughly what the CD sigma control is and what the line edge roughness measured in angstroms is using the immersion technology. So you can see an improvement there in terms of keeping it very, very smooth on the sidewalls. On the right-hand side, you'll see how we're pushing that process to the limit. Um, we won't be specific because it varies by customer, but basically waveguide loss for photonic quantum computing, much, much less than one dB per centimeter, or is a magnitude less. Um, this is necessary to support that single photon fidelity that we mentioned from the very start to the very end. We use the same immersion lithography, but we're probably gonna be looking at incorporating silicon nitride, various materials, um, deposition techniques for silicon nitride for low loss waveguide structures. It is a commonality material, but it is requires some unique processing in order to get you down to the waveguide loss that quantum computing demands. So oh, another example that, that's much different um, that has to be seen as a complement or an auxiliary add to our GF photonic silicon photonics platform is the fact that there are some advanced tooling necessary for the types of changes that I described earlier. Those tools are being developed by um, the same vendors that are building the CMOS tools. Uh, so we have industry leading uh, manufacturing um, tools being brought in here which are being exercised for capability and um, throughput because the cost ultimately is very important as well as reliability. But through the judicious choice of these types of unique materials, I think we can, we can go from creation through detection, which allows you to scale to, you know, the 1 million cubit machine that our partner like Cyquant was aiming for, which allows you to be able to build fault tolerance error correction into that. But there are some key differences that our partners and global founders are working on. One is the need for high-speed optical switches. Now, we need optical switches for our advanced uh, silicon photonics foundry, particularly as we move to things like um, 200 gigabits per lambda, which will be the next generation. 
we're going to need um, more uh, uh, significantly better loss in silicon-based switches anyway for our base process, but that needs to be pushed at even higher uh, to higher level of performance for quantum computing to be able to have very low loss manipulation of single photons. As I mentioned before, uh, the germanium based photo detector that we use for optical um, pluggable transceivers is not what we use for quantum computing. There we need single photon detectors. We have a picture uh, on the right hand side of a superconducting um, detection scheme that our customers are using. Um, by nature of our client confidentiality, uh, we're not going to disclose how we make this thing, but basically it operates with a near superconducting type of wire that basically is a interrupt every time it detects a, a photon. And we've been able to bring that into manufacturing production and uh, show that we can build that in quantities with repeatability and reliability. So in the example of optical switches and single photon detectors, both of those are being integrated into our base process, and both of that is be, are being developed with the necessary process control and manufacturing tool set that you need for a high volume boundary. So I showed you a picture earlier of all the passive components. I showed you a variety of PSRs. I showed you a variety of, of waveguides. I showed you a variety of, of curvilinear type of shapes. Those are very similar to, again, what our partner side quantum is showing here on the left-hand side. Those types of, of capability that we have for curvilinear shapes with one nanometer grid allow for some very unique non-CMOS-like structures to be built in the case of side uh, uh, quantum's use for their quantum computer. I think you'll recognize many of these shapes are highly unusual, uh, the circles, the bends, the, the filters. But these are all simply derivatives of our GF photonics passive components. An example on the right-hand side are some of the progress that's been made to date. These, these have been publicly shown by PsyQuantum, so we have their permission to discuss them. It's not nearly enough, but we're starting to get um, better performance below that 1 dB per centimeter um, mark that I told you. Um, we're not there yet, but through um, adjusting the material science, and the, the deposition techniques, we're able to get waveguide loss directionally where we need to get to, um, but we're still a ways from where it needs to be for a fully operating quantum computer. So in summary, it's very, very early. It's early, but um, we're committed to this. We, I know other foundries are committed to this. And I think as foundries work together to um, with their partners, to take the unique materials required for quantum computing and apply it into a high volume CMOS foundry, I think we're gonna get there. I, I, I hesitate to actually announce, although I'm asked all the time, when do we see the first um, the first quantum computer to, to be, you know, you know, fully exercising all the fault tolerance and error correction? I think it's on its way. I think it's going to be, um, you know, a little bit of time in order for us to, to develop and, and introduce these unique processes into, into high volume production. But I think the path that we have talked about today, which is using photons as qubits, truly leverages the high volume CMOS foundry. I tried to give you some examples of the overlap with our pluggable optical transceiver business using our silicon photonics foundry. And I think there's enough similarities between you know, mirror, mirrors and beam splitters and phase shifters that we use in our foundry into quantum computing. And I think that the, the confidence that we have in our known silicon photonics makes photonic qubits seem more scalable and achievable. But I think that going forward, we are gonna see, you know, what we would call in manufacturing exotic materials that have to be carefully considered for things like cross-contamination, uh, ease of manufacturability, process capability, and throughput. We have to be able to build a number of these parts through it within a certain amount of time in order for this to be manufacturable. I think there's still some careful consideration that needs to go into the use of these exotic materials for predictable performance. So Hassan, thank you very much for your time. Um, it was a pleasure to be able to kind of give you guys a survey of where we stand relative to our progress in using both 22 FDX 3D integration in silicon photonics as components for quantum computer.
Thank you so much, Anthony, for the interesting talk and sharing all these exciting efforts at Global Foundries. So we have uh, some questions from the audience. So let me start with the first one uh, from Manish Singh from MemQ. Uh, so he's asking, uh, could you talk about SNSPD materials, FAP compatibility? Is the integration with waveguides planar? Yeah. Um... Can you repeat the first question? I, I I I got the question about planning, but what was the first part of the question, Hassan? Uh, so I think they're asking about uh, the materials, fab compatibility, fabrication compatibility. Yeah, um, for waveguides. Well, I think I think as we mentioned before, certainly waveguide loss is is a paramount. The second thing you have to consider about is wafer level stress. Um, I, I think that was a part of his question about planar technology, and then ultimately also um, refractive index. I think that um, currently the, the the materials that we use in our foundry process, of course, are you know silicon and silicon nitride. There are different materials being considered alternatively, but again, you have to be able to control it within a a, a reasonable um, anneal envelope, you know, temperature anneal envelope, and you also have to consider things like stress. Um, and the ability to be able to control it and keep those sidewalls smooth relative to lithography. So those are the types of considerations that we would use as we consider different waveguide materials. That's a very that's a very good question, and it's one that our engineers are thinking about all the time. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Uh, so there is another question about uh, the loss. Uh, so you guys made a very important like break. Um, groundbreaking progress in terms of reducing the loss uh, for quantum computing purposes. Uh, but uh, uh, do you guys also work on some, uh, you know, impacts of this for classical networking? Let's say some on-chip coherent communication kind of things. Yeah, obviously one of the reasons why I'm interested in supporting quantum computing, and I, and I probably made it overly explicit, is I look to use the base of our existing photonics business you know, for things like quant for things like uh, pluggable transceivers and co-packaged optics and, and photonic computing, I, I look to be able to economically add to that base for quantum computing. I think that to develop a standalone quantum computing process all unique to itself, that's not the approach that Global Foundries has taken. But what I'm looking all the time is to try to take some of the learning where applicable for quantum computing and apply that, I think that if we can come up, for example, with a waveguide material that can support, you know, less than one dB per centimeter, that's good for everybody. There are obviously some, some materials that are unique to quantum computing, such as the, 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 the single photon detector, which probably doesn't have applicability in my commercial business, but certainly for things like, like waveguides, Hassan, those are very applicable and it makes the, the business justification for capital and for processing easier if I can apply it to different markets. Great, sounds good. Um, I guess I'm gonna ask also one question on my side. Um, so, you know, when you have this photonic circuits, you need to have also some electronic control circuit. I think that's partly why you use this uh, term like CMOS compatibility. So are you guys uh, developing technologies for the control circuits or is is this part of this 3D packaging kind of thing? Yeah, so you probably noticed that for the photonics foundry business that I have, the commercial business today, we do offer it monolithically. So what that means is that I have RF CMOS and I have the ability to build CMOS state logic TIAs and laser driver taking advantage of a intrinsic FT of about 280 gigahertz for for CMOS. But thus far, I think um, given the fact that that uses channel doping, that would not operate very well at millikelvins or even 4K. So for that reason, um, the monolithic aspect of my commercial foundry business for photonics is not really leveraged. That's where they use the 3D stack that you saw me mention with 22 FDX which doesn't have channel doping and actually performs better at low temperature, you know, packaged with the uh, photonics qubit chip. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, let me ask the, uh, just the last question uh, from Nick Wurstuk. 
uh, how much of the new process capabilities you describe is accessible to other companies through AMPW type processes? Is it restricted and limited? Well, there are there are aspects of our process that I've shown here, which I was uh, very very uh, deflecting on, which are proprietary to our foundry customers. So, as a foundry, um, any IP that's brought into me, whether it be design or materials based or you know science based, that that's proprietary, and we protect that. But we do offer um, we do have other quantum computing companies come to us leveraging things like our waveguides and our base photonics business. So we are not unique to one process. Uh, we'd be happy to meet with anybody and um, see what their needs are. But it, it has to be something that would be of interest to us in that it's a derivative of our existing technology. Okay, great. Yeah, let's thank again the speaker. Um, so we're gonna move on to the next talk. Um, so our second speaker of this session is uh, Professor Kartik Srin Srinivasan. Uh, he is the project leader and NIST fellow. Um, NIST is the National Institute for Standards and Technology um, in, in the Photonics and the Optomechanics Group and a fellow of the Joint Quantum Institute at University of Maryland College Park. Uh, so he's going to tell us about uh, towards light sources and transducers at any wavelength using nonlinear nanophotonics. So, Kartik, good to see you, and uh, the stage is yours. You can hear me okay? Yes. Okay, great. Yeah, so thanks, Hassan, for the introduction. And, yeah, I'm very happy to have this opportunity to, to speak about some of the work we've been doing in our labs at, at NIST and University of Maryland. Uh, on the topic that Hassan mentioned, this is kind of, you know, obviously a long term goal of being able to create uh, sort of quantum and classical light sources and, and different types of transducers to, to convert light from one frequency to another um, using integrated nonlinear nanophotonic circuits. Uh, so I'm going to start, you know, I'm going to try and provide a little bit of motivation for, for this problem, why this wavelength, ac wavelength access is an important challenge for, for photonic quantum information science. Um, I'll then talk a bit about why nanophotonics in particular is an interesting way to realize the sort of nonlinear optical functionalities we need. Uh, and then I'll talk a bit about some specific things that we've been working on in the lab in the form of, of highly non-degenerate entangled photon pair sources, uh, microresonator optical parametric oscillators, uh, and quantum frequency converters. Uh, so our general motivation comes, you know, from this field of photonic quantum information science and, and really thinking about it, you know, broadly speaking. So considering uh, communications and simulation and, and metrology and sensing. And, you know, one of the many, uh, you know, amongst the many things that distinguishes this field, one of them that we're particularly interested in is, is a wide variety of different physical systems that people are exploring uh, and the resulting wide range of wavelengths that one might need access to. Uh, so, of course, you know, at, at short wavelengths, say in the UV and, and the deep visible, you have trapped ions and, and neutral atoms that, you know, power clocks and quantum memories, other sorts of things like that. You go to longer wavelengths, but still within the visible, you have your color centers in diamond, different single molecule systems. Uh, going into the near infrared, we have alkali atoms, uh, epitaxial quantum dots, color centers in silicon carbide, some in diamond. Uh, and then, of course, in the telecom band, you're home to your very lowest propagation losses and optical fibers. Uh, so nonlinear optics provides you know, a very uh, natural way that you can connect these different wavelengths together. And, and we're thinking about this, <coughs> excuse me, in a number of different contexts. Uh, so one of the things that we're interested in is being able to use nonlinear optics in order to create, you know, the coherent laser fields that we need to drive these quantum systems. And in some cases, you might need multiple different laser colors for state preparation and manipulation and readout. Uh, we're also interested in the ability to be able to link these different physical systems together in, in a quantum network. And so here you really want to be able to transduce or frequency convert quantum states of light from, from one wavelength to another. Uh, and then finally, we're interested in the development of, of metrological tools, you know, based upon nonlinear optics, things like frequency combs that allow one to perform, you know, precision measurements on, on, your, on your photonic qubits and, and you know, uh, reference them to some kind of, uh, you know, absolute wavelengths, for example. Uh, so the specific platform that we want to utilize for this, uh, realizing these nonlinear optical functionalities is based upon uh, integrated uh, nanophotonics devices. And we heard obviously about some of this from the previous talk. Uh, and so these are structures where we're able to, you know, pattern materials at very small length scales, 
And that in turn gives us the ability to manipulate the propagation and confinement of light at the wavelength scale. And it gives us access to, to physical resources like strong field confinement and, and long photon lifetime and the ability to manipulate the group and phase velocity with which light propagates. Uh, and hopefully this is all done using, you know, this kind of mature, robust, scalable nanofabrication processes of the sort that, that we heard about in the previous talk that, that can allow one to integrate different functional components together and to, into some, you know, kind of complex systems. Uh, and so there have been demonstrations of people doing this in the context of using nonlinear optical functionality. This is some earlier work out of MIT where photon pair generation based upon a, a nonlinear optical process is combined with some passive elements like spectral uh, filters and interferometers and, and some photo detectors. Uh, over the last couple of years, there's been quite a bit of work in trying to combine, you know, kind of nonlinear optical functionality with the pump lasers that drive these nonlinear systems, uh, both in a heterogeneous fashion, so really trying to put everything together in the same uh, material stack, essentially, uh, as well as in a kind of hybrid fashion where you maybe have chip-to-chip -chip coupling, uh, but still trying to do so in, in kind of a compact package. You know, and so then the overall goal is to be able to take advantage of these different types of integration strategies to be able to create, you know, kind of functional systems that involve, you know, nonlinear optical uh, resources. Uh, and so over the past few years, we've been involved in some of these projects uh, at NIST. Uh, you know, these are two examples. One is optical frequency synthesis. The other is an optical atomic clock. And, and neither of these ultimately ended up with a very, very small package, but we were able to demonstrate that all the sort of key resources that are needed for these types of applications can be realized with integrated photonics technology. Uh, and, and part of that integrated photonics technology is based upon nonlinear nanophotonics, in this case, the generation of, of portable optical frequency combs. Okay, so in order to get these nonlinear optical processes to work, you know, there, there are some fundamental ingredients that, that we need. We need to have, you know, a platform that, that supports optical transparency across potentially a very broad spectral region if we want to work with very different colors. Uh, we want to have a large effective nonlinearity, so that's related to the, the types of materials we use and, and the modal confinement. Uh, typically, even if you have pretty strong nonlinear media, you need to have high optical intensities in order to really access your nonlinear response. Uh, and then you need phase and frequency matching or equivalently momentum and energy conservation uh, for any of these kind of parametric nonlinear processes, like uh, a very common one people would think about is, is something like second harmonic generation, where you where you double the color of light, for example. So one of the things that nanophotonics really brings to, to nonlinear optics, apart from all the kind of scaling and integration that, that I mentioned earlier, uh, is really this ability to control this phase and frequency matching primarily due to geometry. And that's because you're operating in a regime in which your strong modal confinement uh, is really a, a dominant effect in terms of influencing the phase and group velocity of light. Uh, so this is a little example. I'm going to come back to this a bit later, but this is a type of device called an optical parametric oscillator. And what we're doing here is we're pumping these silicon nitride ring resonators with the same near-infrared pump laser, but the output color that we generate, essentially the coherent light that we generate, <clears throat> excuse me, its color can change from green to yellow to orange just by changing the geometry of this ring resonator a little bit. And the reason is because this geometry is what's really dictating these fundamental phase and frequency matching relationships that are associated with nonlinear optical processes. Uh, and so what I'm showing here in the central panel is a plot of, of the effective index. This is basically related to the propagation constant of light going through an optical waveguide. In this case, it's a silicon nitride waveguide. I'll, I'll come back to this a little bit later. And, and the main point here is that this effective index uh, is a strong function of both frequency or wavelength, but also geometry. So these three different curves just correspond to different waveguide cross sections. And by manipulating that cross section in a precise way, we can really impact this effective index as a function of frequency and that's ultimately the type of ingredient we use to control, you know, our nonlinear optical processes. Okay, now typically we're not working with, with, re, uh, with waveguides on their own. Uh, we typically work with resonators. And, and the reason why we work with resonators is that we want to be able to achieve high optical intensities, but, but at low powers. And so working with the micro resonator, we take advantage of its high quality factor and its strong field confinement. And we can realize gigawatt per square centimeter circulating intensities for just milliwatt scale continuous wave laser inputs. And so something that's really consistent with chip integrated lasers and doesn't require 
you know, watt level or kilowatt level sort of peak powers that one might typically associate with nonlinear optics, you know, on the tabletop, essentially. Uh, so there are a lot of different cavity geometries, microzener geometries that one can consider. Uh, ultimately, for the types of things that we do, we, we mostly work with these simple ring resonators that I, that I showed on the previous view graph. Uh, and the main consideration is just that it's straightforward to achieve very low losses or high quality factors across multiple widely separated wavelengths. And, and we sort of have the right amount of sensitivity with respect to fabrication in order to tune things, but not so much sensitivity that it's you know, very practically difficult to be able to, to hit certain targets. Uh, so we work with the stoichiometric silicon nitride uh, platform sitting on top of a silicon dioxide substrate, uh, silicon dioxide lower cladding on top of a silicon substrate. Uh, this material is very well known in, in both linear and nonlinear uh, integrated photonics. It's primarily a third order nonlinear medium, and so you have access to, to four wave mixing or chi three nonlinear processes. Uh, its nonlinearity is relatively strong in comparison to materials like silica, which has been used in fiber based nonlinear optics for, for decades. And, and many, many groups have been able to show the ability to realize high cavity quality factors in the system. You know, routinely, so quality factors in excess of a million. So we're talking about kind of 10th of a dB per centimeter uh, propagation losses. Uh, and, and, you know, the real reason why we use this platform is that uh, we're able to fabricate it. It can be fabricated in, in foundries and many different research and fabrication facilities. So it's kind of broadly accessible. And so that means the things that we develop can, can hopefully be transferred to the community. And, and of course, the, the reverse, that things the community is developing in this widely available platform are things that we can hopefully incorporate in our research. So there's a number of different nonlinear optical processes that one can try and realize in these resonators, depending upon your application. I mentioned frequency combs briefly. I mentioned harmonic generation. Uh, I'm not going to actually talk about those in the, in the remainder of this presentation. I'm going to focus on, on these three topics uh, shown here, uh, optical parametric oscillation and entangled photon pair generation. Uh, and this topic of quantum frequency conversion, so changing the color of, of quantum states of light. I want to spend just a little bit more time talking about this important phase in frequency matching, which is ultimately you know, quite important in, in parametric nonlinear processes. Uh, and so what I'm showing here are you know, two basic conditions, the frequency matching condition for a process called spontaneous Fourier mixing. This is where two centrally located pump photons get annihilated and they create an upshifted signal photon and a downshifted idler photon subject to energy conservation. So the, the frequencies of the two output photons need to sum up to, to twice the pump frequency. Uh, but simultaneously, we need this momentum conservation or phase matching. And so the way that we simultaneously achieve these two things, is, as I mentioned earlier, is we engineer the cross section of the silicon nitride waveguide to give us an effective index profile that, that simultaneously meets these two two criteria. Now, in practice, I also mentioned that we're not typically working with, with waveguides alone. We instead wrap them into rings, uh, but the basic idea is the same. So you have a frequency matching condition and a phase matching or a momentum matching condition, uh, but now it's discretized because a resonator supports discrete optical resonances instead of a continuum of frequencies. Uh, and we, again, though, basically just engineer the cross-section of the resonator in order to make sure that we line up these two conditions simultaneously. Okay, so in the remainder of, of my talk, you know, I'm going to go and spend a little bit of time describing some of these different types of, of applications that we've been working on, and I'll provide a little bit more context for each of them. And I'll start with this first one on, on highly non-degenerate entangled photon pair sources, where we can have one photon that we create in the visible, and it's entangled with a photon that's in the telecom. Okay, so this is work that, that uh, Xu and Lu did in my lab when he started as a postdoc. And the basic idea is what I just described. So we have this process of spontaneous Fourier mixing where two centrally located pump photons get annihilated and we create this frequency upshifted signal photon and this frequency downshifted either photon subject to these conditions of, of frequency matching and phase matching. <clears throat> Here I've written this frequency matching condition in terms of where the cavity mode resonances need to be. You know, since, since this is a cavity, you really have to make sure that you have resonances lined up at the appropriate spectral locations and you need to be able to do so essentially to within the cavity line width. Uh, so this is what it looks like in, in the lab. So this is one of these silicon nitride ring resonators fabricated through top-down fabrication processes uh, in silicon nitride. 
we inject light at 933 nanometers. That's our central pump wavelength. And we create you know, this upshifted signal in the red at about 660 nanometers, and this downshifted idler in the telecom at about 1550 nanometers. And, and we're basically able to confirm that you know, through kind of good, accurate knowledge of the material and simulations and kind of precise nanofabrication, we're able to get this frequency matching process to hold. So the frequency mismatch between these cavity modes is something like a couple hundred megahertz, even though the modes are separated in frequency by, by a couple hundred terahertz. Uh, now you can show that <clears throat> these photons, you know, are, are really, you know, quantum correlated, meaning that they're being produced at exactly the same time uh, by doing coincidence counting experiments. And so when we do these coincidence counting experiments, we see that the level of coincidences in comparison to kind of background events uh, is on the order of a few thousand to one. So this is a source that's really producing photons that are uh, being created in, in pairs. Uh, and if you compare this type of technology based upon integrated nonlinear nanophotonics versus some of the more conventional tabletop systems for creating highly non-degenerate narrow line with photons, these are typically things like nonlinear crystals put inside macroscopic cavities, you actually see that the performance of these systems is, is quite competitive. Uh, and then we have obviously the, the additional benefits associated with the fabrication processes and, and potential for scaling and integration. Uh, it turns out, you know, these photons are not just correlated in time. You can actually show that they're entangled, uh, you know, in a time energy basis. Uh, and of course, entanglement is in the news recently because, you know, the Nobel Prize in physics this year is partly due to the demonstration of entanglement uh, using photons. Uh, you know, the types of experiments we do with this type of source are basically showing that the photons are time energy entangled and that this entanglement persists even after you send the telecom photon across, you know, kilometers of optical fiber. And, and that's expected, but, but it's important because if we just had visible wavelength photons, it would be very difficult to go along kilometers of optical fiber due to the propagation losses. And, and this speaks to the kind of application of this type of source, which is in trying to connect uh, distant quantum systems that are most naturally, you know, entangled with visible photons. Uh, and so the basic idea, for example, is you can have color center spins that can act as quantum nodes, and they're very naturally connected to, to visible photons, as I showed on an earlier, earlier view graph, for example, color center spins in diamond. Uh, but then if we use our photon pair sources as intermediaries, essentially the visible photon can go interact with this color center spin, uh, while the telecom photon can, can go across uh, long distances and optical fibers. And, and through a process called entanglement swapping, you can ultimately think about being able to entangle these, these color center spins. And so you can really think about these types of sources as sort of being a type of entanglement distribution source, essentially. Now, in terms of like this kind of vision of, of being able to really flexibly tailor the output colors based upon geometry, you know, what we're able to do is to show experimentally that if we take our pump laser and we tune it a bit based upon, you know, the typical tuning range for a, a diode laser, a tunable diode laser, but we also change our geometry, we change things like our ring width, then we can really, you know, dramatically change the output colors that we produce. And, and so the signal photons in the system can go from all the way as short as about 630 nanometers to as long as in this case about 820 nanometers. While the partner idler photons, you know, they're constrained by energy conservation, and so they're going from about 1,200 nanometers to about 1,800 nanometers. Of course, if we want to, you know, really pin those idler photons in the telecom C-band, we can do that. We just need to give ourselves some flexibility with respect to pump frequency, essentially. So use different pump laser sources depending upon what specific colors you want to be able to generate. Okay, so hopefully that gives a little bit of a flavor for this work on, on entangled photon pair generation. I now want to speak about a closely related process called optical parametric oscillation, though the motivation is a little bit different. Uh, and so the motivation here, you know, comes back again to this notion that, uh, you know, there's a lot of different physical systems that we're interested in being able to explore, including all these important ones at visible wavelengths. Uh, but when we typically explore these in our labs, we use things like titanium sapphire oscillators or tunable external cavity diode lasers that are really wonderful, high-performing workhorse laboratory instruments, but they're not, you know, they're big, they're bulky, they're expensive, they weigh a lot. And so they're not necessarily amenable to, to you know, kind of field-level deployment, you know, at, at a very large scale. <clears throat> you know, on the other hand, you know, integrated photonics has seen some tremendous advances with respect to lasers. So... 
There are now heterogeneously integrated lasers on silicon that can give you tens of milliwatts of output power and sub kilohertz line widths, even sub hertz line widths have recently been, been demonstrated. You know, certainly in the telecom, you know, also uh, increasing work at, at other sort of isolated wavelength bands. But instead of having to develop, you know, a new laser source at every wavelength of interest, what we're quite interested in being able to do is, is combining these, you know, existing mature laser sources or, or these types of mature laser sources that are being intensely developed for, for certain wavelength ranges, uh, and then combining it with flexible nonlinear nanophotonics in order to access, you know, the specific wavelengths of interest for some of these applications uh, in photonic quantum information science. And, and so that's kind of the, the larger motivation. Uh, and so the specific process we want to use is this process called optical parametric oscillation. It's again based upon something very, very similar to the spontaneous Fourier mixing where centrally located pump photons get annihilated and you create upshifted signal and downshifted either photons. But now you've driven the system into a stimulated regime, you know, similar to the stimulated emission you get in a laser essentially. And so this is really producing, you know, coherent light at the output similar to, to conventional laser light. And, and the key thing is the flexibility that this process affords you with respect to wavelength access, because if our pump is located at something like 780 nanometers, <clears throat> that in principle, you can cover a very broad range of wavelengths between the visible and the near infrared, again, just by control of geometry. So if we were to take our, our previous entangled photon pair devices and simply just pump them harder, we wouldn't reach parametric oscillation for the modes that we care about. And that's because these resonators support hundreds and hundreds of optical modes. And there's a little bit of detail here I won't really have time to get into, but but there's basically nonlinear frequency shifts that, that can lead to modes that are close to the pump uh, actually oscillating instead of these modes that are very widely separated from the pump. Uh, but it turns out that we can just put an additional criterion on our design that ensures that these nonlinear frequency shifts don't introduce this additional matching for, for unwanted modes. Uh, and when we introduce this additional requirement, we're able to produce these optical parametric oscillation devices where you really see this clean signal and clean output idler. Uh, the threshold for these OPOs is on the order of a milliwatt or so, so kind of consistent with the chip integrated lasers I, I was mentioning. Uh, and and uh, in this case, we're pumping at a wavelength in the about 1030 nanometer range. We're producing the signal at about 780 nanometers and an idler you know, close to the telecom, about 1450 nanometers here, I believe. Uh, the next thing that we really wanted to focus on is the ability to realize this wavelength access. Uh, and so the idea here, these are some simulations where just the zero crossings of these curves correspond to where we're going to be generating the light. And here what we've done is we've chosen a specific geometry where we've been able to engineer the dispersion in a way that by tuning the pump laser from one mode to the next, you can really broadly change the output colors you're creating. This is essentially the example I alluded to earlier, where again, by just changing this pump laser, uh, you know, within its tuning range, we can change the output color we create from green to yellow to orange to red. If you do this for many different devices that have slightly different geometries, you ultimately can create a lot of spectral coverage going from about 560 nanometers in the visible out to about 1200 nanometers uh, in the near infrared. Just kind of going through and looking at some of these individual spectra, we start to be able to generate light at some of these important wavelengths, you know, for photonic quantum information science, the epitaxial quantum dots, various color centers in diamond, uh, different rare earth dope crystals, different alkali atoms, and so on. Uh, but if you look at any one of these spectra, you know, it, it kind of becomes clear that, that there's not a whole lot of power being generated. And in particular, the amount of light, for example, in the signal is, is many tens of dB below the amount of pump light that we've injected into the system. Uh, and so over the last year or so, last couple of years, we've really been working on improving this. And now, you know, just by kind of improving the kind of the engineering of coupling of light in and out of the rings and then certain other sorts of things, uh, we've really been able to improve things so that now we have these OPOs that span this same kind of wavelength range going from about 580 nanometers uh, in the visible to about 1200 nanometers in the near infrared. But now we can get milliwatts of output power on the chip, and we have conversion efficiencies from the pump to the to these signal and idlers that are on the order of about uh, fifteen percent or so. Okay, so I have maybe a, a few more minutes, um, so I'll just talk, uh, maybe go through a little bit more quickly this final application, which is on on quantum frequency conversion. 
And, and the basic idea here, it's, it's very similar to what I mentioned with respect to the entangled photon pair generation when it's highly non-degenerate. It's just this notion that, you know, you would like to send your light over telecom fibers, you know, so say the 15-15 nanometer band, but many of your quantum light generators or many of your different quantum systems are naturally addressed by photons that are at, at much shorter wavelengths where the propagation losses uh, are much larger. Uh, and so you can think about this in terms of like, you know, sort of homogeneous networks, apologize for this, uh, homogeneous networks where you have the same type of nodes uh, or heterogeneous networks where maybe your matter-based systems are, are different types of nodes. And, and people are certainly quite aware of this. So there's a lot of work that's been done in using kind of conventional nonlinear optical med uh, media for doing this, this quantum frequency conversion. Uh, in our case, we, we continue to use these silicon nitride micro rings as, as our platform for all the reasons I've described thus, thus far. And so there's a process for quantum frequency conversion that's technically called Fourier mixing Bragg scattering. But, but the main thing to know is it's just a non-degenerately pumped process where, where you have two pump lasers at two different frequencies, and the difference in their frequencies tells you how much you shift your photons. And so if the pump lasers are close to each other in frequency, you get small shift. If they're far away from each other in frequency, you get a large shift. Uh, and so I won't go into too much detail here. I'll just mention kind of the results that we've been able to convert light between the 900 nanometer band and the telecom 1550 nanometer band, both down conversion and up conversion with efficiencies on the order of about 60% or so. Um, we've done uh, also experiments where the frequency shifts are small. So by taking pump lasers that are more closely uh, separated uh, from each other in terms of frequency, then we can get shifts of you know maybe a few terahertz. And, and so there's kind of different applications. When you want small shifts, maybe you're trying to make systems that are dissimilar, uh, identical basically, if they're only dissimilar in wavelength. For the large shifts, you're maybe trying to connect to and from the telecom band. Um, and we've done things like looked at you know really explicit frequency conversion of, of quantum states of light. So for example, in this intraband process where we frequency shift the photons by a few terahertz, We've taken light from a semiconductor quantum dot. So this is a quantum emitter that's producing photons one at a time. And then we frequency shifted these photons by a few terahertz and looked at this kind of telltale signature of, of single photon states, which is, which is anti-bunching, just showing that you're really producing photons one at a time and seeing that this anti-bunch source remains anti-bunched after you, after you frequency shift the photons, which you, know, you might not be able to take for granted just because your pumps are these kind of strong classical fields that have very different statistics than, than your single photon states of light. And I won't go into this experiment into detail. I'll just say that we've also looked at experiments that, that reflect upon the coherence of the photons after they've been frequency shifted and confirmed at least to the level to which we've looked at these types of experiments that uh, the coherence is preserved, meaning that you could take photons that are initially at, at different wavelengths but are otherwise identical and then map them to the same wavelength using one of these nanophotonic frequency converters. And when you interfere with them, they really show quantum mechanical interference associated with identical uh, bosonic particles. Okay, so last thing is that a lot of what I've described involves these basic micro ring resonators, but there's a lot of interesting things one can do with different resonator geometries. In the last couple of years, we've gotten quite interested in combining a different type of resonator approach based upon something called the photonic crystal. This is basically a periodic patterning of a dielectric structure. We've looked at combining these kind of photonic crystal concepts with, with these micro ring resonators. And this gives us a new knobs with respect to highly localizing optical modes to give strong fields, being able to generate free space beams that are in orbital angular momentum states. So now thinking about things like spatial mode multiplexing and also being able to manipulate dispersion, which is this key thing associated with phase and frequency matching. Okay, so with that, I want to stop. I do want to thank all the people in my lab who, who contributed to this work, particularly Xi Wen, Jordan, Greg, and, and Cheng, a lot of collaborators at, at NIST and abroad, and support from, from NIST and from DARPA, and, and happy to take any questions, and, and thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Kartik, uh, for the interesting talk. Uh, sure, we have some questions. Uh, so one is, uh, maybe I can make it actually a little bit more general. So one of the questions is about uh, what is the Q factor of the rings or the loss of the SIN waveguide? Or maybe if you can give us a general idea about, let's say, different various figures of merit. Sure, of absolutely. This. Um, so the typical quality factors for our ring resonators, uh, I would say, are as high as about maybe 3 million 
Uh, and that would typically occur at the telecom. And then as we go to these shorter wavelengths in the visible, say in the green, they're probably on the order of a few hundred thousand, uh, or they are on the order of a few hundred thousand. So it does go down a little bit as we go to these shorter wavelengths where it becomes, you know, a little bit more difficult to get high cues just associated with, with a scattering that you get basically from surface roughness. Uh, and this corresponds to propagation losses that are at their best on the order of a tenth of a dB per centimeter and then are going to be on the order of a few tenths of a dB per centimeter at, at the shortest wavelengths. Um, so hopefully that that kind of gives an overview of, of where our losses are in this system. Um, and one thing I do want to mention is, is silicon nitride as a material platform is one in which people have observed very, very low propagation losses. So something like dB per meter propagation losses. Um, but that's typically in very different geometries where the field is really delocalized into surrounding silicon dioxide. Uh, but for nonlinear optics, where you're really relying upon this modal dispersion engineering, you actually are necessarily having your field interact with your sidewalls and so on. Uh, because what you're really relying upon is the field fraction in the core versus the cladding changing as a function of wavelength. Uh, so right. that's just a long-winded way of saying that silicon nitride as a material can support very, very low losses. But then when you want to do nonlinear optical functionality, it's not just the material losses that are impacting you. It's really kind of the geometry you need for your nonlinear optics, and then that's introducing, you know, maybe surface roughness or absorption as, as sorts of things you have to worry about. Mm -hmm. Great. So there is another question about this non-degenerate photon pair sources. Sure. So the question is, is the wavelength of the visible photon tunable enough to hit the resonance of the memory? Right. So that's a good question. And, and our understanding is, is yes, because uh, what we basically have is we have sort of a, a discrete tuning that is associated with going from one resonator mode to the other. And so that would be associated with kind of the free spectral range of the resonator. But then on top of that, we can use like a thermal tuning, basically. So the fact that the refractive index depends upon temperature. And so that that's what we've typically exploited. And, you know, you kind of need to have your thermal tuning range be you know, a significant enough fraction of your free spectral range that that you kind of can have gap free coverage. Um, but in practice, this is what we've used for various sorts of devices, like the frequency converters, where we had a fixed wavelength source and we needed our converter to be resonant with that. We utilize this this thermal tuning approach. Um, and so our understanding is that, you know, that should generally be be the case, but it is still interesting to think about other tuning approaches, especially if you need to think about putting these devices in cryostats and, and things like that. I see. Okay, thank you very much. So in the interest of time, I think we have a few more questions, but in the interest of time, let's move on to the third talk of this session. Uh, so it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Galen Moody, who is an assistant professor from the electrical and computer engineering department at the University of California, Santa Barbara. And he's gonna tell us today about uh, all these interesting efforts in his lab on integrated quantum photonics uh, beyond silicon. Galen, please take it away. Uh, I th Galen, I think you're on mute. No, we can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay, great. All right, sorry about that. Yep, thank you for the introduction. Um, and it's a pleasure to be here to present some of my group's research um, on integrated quantum photonics beyond silicon. We um, heard two excellent talks earlier in this session. Anthony Yu from Global Foundries um, nicely sort of pointed out the manufacturability of silicon photonics that we can leverage for quantum photonics. Um, but he also touched on a little bit at the end of his talk, the need for exploring more exotic materials or sort of beyond silicon type materials that could maybe offer some new functionality um, and new capabilities that silicon can't necessarily offer. And so that's a little bit about what this talk will be focusing on. So before getting into some of the materials that we've been working on, I think it's, it's worth kind of taking a step back and thinking about where is this field of integrated quantum photonics right now? Um, so I would uh, refer all uh, the, the audience to uh, the roadmap on integrated quantum photonics that was published a little bit earlier this year with a number of uh, excellent 
uh, sort of two-page article contributions to this compilation from leaders in this field talking about different aspects of integrated quantum photonics. Um, this figure here sort of uh, highlights the progress in sort of the last decade or so on integrated quantum photonics. Most of the work has been leveraging silicon photonics due to sort of its maturity and the ability to fabricate uh, devices in a silicon uh, foundry. Um, so, you know, just over a little bit of a decade ago, uh, some very nice demonstrations of, for example, we started out with two photon interference and controlled knot gates. Uh, and in the past, you know, 10 years, the the progress and advances have been pretty remarkable. And so now we can generate sort of more complex quantum states on chip using uh, silicon photonics, for example, with four photon graph states, very nice experiments on uh, boson sampling with a single quantum dot source, um, and even sort of beyond silicon, some very nice demonstrations, for example, coming out of MIT with 128 emitter arrays in diamond. So there's been some very nice progress in the, in the last decade. Um, and this uh, figure kind of exemplifies that. And so looking at some of the, the work coming out of KET labs at Bristol, if you look at the number of integrated components that can be sort of combined onto a single silicon photonics chip, and here's sort of the timeline here over the last decade, we're approaching sort of, you know, on the order of about a thousand components on chip now. And this allows um, one to do uh, certain um, applications and functions such as programmable two qubit gates, teleportation for qubit graph state generation, devices for QKD and so forth. And so the progress has been very remarkable using silicon photonics. Um, but thinking about photonics uh, in terms of, you know, light for computing and communications, as well as photonics that support other quantum technologies, such as trapped ions, neutral atoms, defect centers, spin qubits, uh, and, and so forth, as well as various applications, such as QKD, clock, sensing, and networking, there's a lot of different technologies that are needed to actually uh, make these work, right? So uh, this includes lasers, quantum light sources, detectors, modulators, interferometers, quantum frequency conversion that we heard a lot about in the last talk uh, by Cardic, as well as uh, memories and repeaters. And so thinking about this a little bit more holistically, I think there is a need for heterogeneous integration just beyond silicon. We can't just rely on silicon and we're starting to see a lot of uh, trends in this direction. Um, and so I'd like to highlight one particular article in this 2022 roadmap in integrated quantum photonics. It's coming out of MIT Lincoln Lab uh, titled Heterogeneous Integrated Photonics for Quantum Information Science and Engineering. And they really touch on sort of the, the current and future challenges as well as sort of advances in science tech and technology needed for heterogeneous integration. And here's a very nice concept figure that they've put together where they're sort of showing in a general sense and a heterogeneous integrated photonics platform that could comprise a number of different components and a number of different materials. These materials could be, you know, bonded or deposited. Um, these could be thin fi film materials such as compound semiconductors, lithium niobate, polymers, defect centers, and, and diamond or silicon carbide, for example. Um, one could also envision pick and place methods where you sort of uh, are performing sort of fabrication on separate chips and then combining them through these sort of pick and place methods. And then also just as important, uh, eventually will be electronic and photonic integration. So we can have the control electronics integrated um, uh, in various architectures with the quantum photonic circuits. And so some of the current future challenges are really the breadth of requirements for different applications. Um, there's also potentially a variety of materials that are needed. So we need compatible fabrication processes that are manufacturable and electronic photonic integration. And so advances in science and technology needed, um, highlighted in this article that I, I, I strongly endorse is community defined set of broad wavelength platforms, heterogeneous integration techniques that are fabricated using a silicon foundry compatible process also with open process des design kits, and then 3D integration to, to decouple sort of the photonic and electronic processes and their individual requirements for their designs. Um, so beyond silicon, there's many material choices that one could envision um, for different functionality. And so in this table, what I'm showing is different integrated photonic material platforms, some of the most common ones that have been developed, and then some of their basic material and device properties, for example, the Chi-2 and Chi-3 nonlinearities, the quality factors of resonators made in these different structures, the refractive index contrast, which can tell you about the, the confinement of the optical modes in the waveguides, the band gap, and then the level of scalability for the individual platforms in terms of just sort of the wafer size that 
um, has been fabricated for these different kinds of components. And so what I'd really like to point out here is sort of the, the gallium arsenide and aluminum gallium arsenide uh, material properties. They're very appealing, especially for nonlinear photonics. And the reason for that is the, the really high optical nonlinearity. So they have some of the highest chi-2 and the highest chi-3 optical nonlinearities. So as I'll show, that this, this is very important for entangled photon pair generation. This will really enhance the, the on-chip pair generation rates. Um, we can make routinely make microresonators with quality factors in the millions, um, which corresponds to about 0.2 dB per centimeter of propagation loss. So that's competing um, and if not outperforming some other platforms uh, for these kinds of applications. Very high uh, index contrast, which allows tight modal confinement in the waveguide, which uh, helps enhance the interaction and enhance the pair generation rates. A fairly wide and tunable band, band gap, which this is pretty important um, for reducing loss. And so, for example, at telecommunication wavelengths, there's no two photon absorption in these materials. Um, and then the scalability isn't quite at the level of silicon photonics, but we can make these on, on much larger wafers um, than what we have even five years ago. Uh, and so we're working on sort of the manufacturing of this platform. Okay, so an outline of some of the things that I want to touch on that we're doing in my group. I'm going to begin with uh, entangled photon pair generation and squeezing with aluminum gallium arsenide on insulator. And then I'll talk about some of the, the more um, sort of expanding the, the component library for this, this platform, including a number of passive elements. And then a couple examples of applications that we're developing using this platform. Okay, so let's begin with um, entangled uh, photon pair generation. So just to highlight um, what we're doing in the group, we're um, uh, working on fabricating and testing and characterizing these devices. So we have uh, a very nice 12,000 square foot class 100 cleaner facility on campus here at UCSB where we um, fabricate all the devices here on campus. We also have a number of MBE and MOCVD facilities here for growing 3.5 materials as needed. And then uh, last year, um, a cluster of new photonics labs at UCSB opened up in Henley Hall. Um, so we have uh, a 1,000 square foot lab space in this new building where we have a number of different experiments built up at, with both cryogenic capabilities and room temperature capabilities. Okay, so a little bit about um, the ALGAS on insulator platform. So here's a process flow for how we actually fabricate these kinds of devices. We start out with a silicon and silicon dioxide handle wafer. We either grow on at UCSB or through uh, a commercial vendor, uh, ALGAS materials um, using molecular beam epitaxy. And then we will bond chips um, of the algas onto the silicon dioxide. We'll do some passivation steps and substrate removal. And so here's typically what we end up with before we fabricate any of our devices. We have our four inch silicon wafer, and then we typically are using about um, a sort of a square inch sort of size chips for a lot of the devices that we're making. Um, and I'd just like to point out that with this process, we have about 0.2 dB per centimeter loss typically um, for these materials. And so then after we do this bonding step, then we can fabricate whatever devices we want. Uh, and this includes sort of waveguides, ring structures, working on modulators and various other passive components, including um, metallization as well. And an important um, uh, step in this fabrication process is a, re a resist reflow technique. And so you can see here, this is sort of the sidewall of one of the structures that we can make. If we do a, a resist reflow technique, we can actually get very nice smooth sidewalls. And this is a pretty important step for uh, reducing the propagation loss and making high Q resonators. And as Cardic mentioned, um, in these kinds of structures as well, because we're doing a nonlinear optics, we want really tight modal confinement of, of the light within the waveguide. And so our quality factors are limited a little bit by that, as well as any sort of roughness on the sidewalls. Um, and so it's sort of an optimization procedure of optimizing sort of the quality factors and the propagation loss and the, the confinement in, in the waveguide itself. And by tuning the width of our, our waveguides or the microring resonators that are fabricate, we can also tune the dispersion quite nicely to achieve phase matching for uh, efficient frequency conversion and generation. Um, so there's a number of nice uh, experiments done in the past few years with nonlinear photonics with algas and insulator or, or gallium arsenide on insulator. Some of these were led by NIST a couple of years ago. For example, uh, with Jeff Childs and Rich Mirren's group demonstrating multifunctional integrated photonics in the mid-infrared using suspended algas on silicon. 
um, also with Eric Stanton at NIST, demonstrating at the time record high second harmonic generation efficiency on chip. Um, and he, I would also like to point you to this reference here um, for how they actually do their bonding process. They have a very nice sort of three inch wafer scale bonding process for the gallium marsnite or aluminum gallium marsnite on insulator. They have all the details here, um, open source, which is quite nice. And then uh, a little bit more recently, just a couple of years ago, um, some very nice work on ultra low uh, threshold frequency comb generation from John Bauer's group at UCSB using uh, Algas microring resonators. Uh, so this past year, um, we've sort of used these same ideas for entangled photon pair generation. So the, the concept is fairly straightforward. I'll walk you through that in a couple of slides, but they're based on microring resonators coupled to a, a, a waveguide. Um, where we can use spontaneous four-wave mixing to convert pump photons into entangled photon pairs at the telecommunication wavelengths. Okay, so the basic idea it relies on spontaneous four-wave mixing, and so we're coupling pump light into the waveguide. Some of that pump light couples into the microring resonator. Through the four-wave mixing process, two pump photons will get converted into signal and idler photons, um, and these will all be resonant with the different modes of the resonator. And so on the top right here, I'm showing, for example, a, a normalized transmission spectrum of a representative microring resonator. You can see the different modes here of the ring resonator. Um, and so if we tune our pump to be resonant with one of these modes, then through this four mixing process, we can produce entangled photon pairs at these different modes. Um, and so this produces a biphoton frequency comb of time energy entangled photon pairs. The entire spectrum can be very broadband, um, approaching sort of 100 nanometers or so, um, but it's comprised of many uh, narrow discrete frequency modes. And so what we'll do in our experiments typically is we'll tune our pump to one of these resonances, and then we'll tune filters off chip to isolate the entangled photon pair. So we'll tune a, a pump filter to be resonant with this mode and one to be resonant with this mode for example, and then we'll look at the, the sort of generation rates of photons at those modes and the entanglement for those. And something that's uh, very important to point out is the entangled pair generation rate is proportional to the nonlinearity squared and one over the confinement squared. And so you want a really highly nonlinear material with really tight confinement. It's also proportional to the quality factor cubed, and so we want as low loss as possible. And then it's also proportional to one over R squared. So we want as small rings as possible to enhance that rate. Um, so just to summarize some of the results from some of the chips that we have, I'm showing here on the left the detected signal or idler count rates. So these are the rates that we actually detect on our detectors. So for around 100 microwatts of on-chip pump power, we can get in sort of the millions of uh, photons per second at our detectors. If you look at the detected coincidence rate, also at sort of similar pump powers, we can get about 20 kilohertz um, detected coincidence counts per second. And this, uh, this results in about a 1% sort of heralding efficiency, and that's not so surprising as we have about 10 dB of loss in each of the signal and the idler channels. And so that's why these rates are a little, quite a bit lower than the detected signal um, and idler rates. Okay, so we can verify um, the level of uh, sort of entanglement, the fidelity, and the visibility um, using a Franson interferometry experiment. Kardec also introduced this uh, in his talk, so I won't go into details of that, and just point out that we can uh, get greater than 99% visibility with greater than 99% single photon purity. We can achieve coincidence to accidental ratios greater than 3,000, um, and with sub sort of 100 microwatt on-chip pump power, we can get about megahertz detected count rates. So to maybe put this in a little bit more context in terms of these rates compared to other platforms, on the figure on the right, this is the entangled pair brightness. So this is basically the on-chip number of pairs per second that are generated normalized to the bandwidth across which they're generated. Um, and so looking at different materials such as aluminum nitride, lithium niobate, silicon nitride, silicon on insulator, and so forth, um, we have about a thousand-fold enhancement over silicon with Algas on insulator. And, and that um, is primarily due to the fact that we can make pretty high Q resonators with really high nonlinearity. And a lot of this is leveraging that high nonlinearity. Okay, so beyond entangled pairs, we're also interested in using this platform for um, a number of other different kinds of sources. For example, using similar kinds of devices for squeezing where we can achieve uh, roughly on the order of about one dB of squeezing off chip. So we're working on developing new kinds of uh, micro ring resonators that can optimize the amount of squeezing that we can achieve on chip as well. Working with the Bowers group, we're also um, 
heterogeneously integrating lasers with different entangled pair sources. And so here's an example of a tunable laser um, that's uh, feeding into uh, spiral uh, entangled photon pair sources on silicon. And then also um, uh, another direction that we're working on pursuing in this next year is heterogeneous integration. So looking at al gas on silicon on insulator, for example. So leveraging the manufacturability of silicon, but then uh, combining thin films of al gas for sources and modulators and so forth. So combining their advantages on a single platform. And then also exploring um, uh, integrating on demand single photon sources with these micro resonators, for example, with quantum dots integrated into these rings. So here's just one example of devices, uh, sort of preliminary devices that we're working on developing right now and characterizing. Uh, this is an array of micro ring resonators um, with uh, electrodes placed on the side of the waveguides themselves. And within the, uh, the, the ring resonator here, there's various uh, quantum dots at different wavelengths that we can explore and, and study. And so if we apply an electric field across uh, this micro ring resonator, then we can actually use the Stark effect to tune the quantum dot into resonance with the micro ring resonator. Okay, so um, thinking about expanding the quantum photonic toolbox beyond um, just sources, we've done quite a bit of work this past year on developing a, the, the component library with a number of passive components. So here's an example of one such chip with a lot of different components, highlighting some of these different components that we've developed. These include tunable mock center interferometers um, for programmable circuits, qubit demultiplexers, optimized tunable rings for maximum um, entangled pair generation rates, waveguide crossers, and so forth. We've also worked a little bit on single photon detector integration using superconducting uh, SNSPDs um, on both three fives and silicon. This, uh, was work that was started and led by NIST and JPL, a number of references here in case you're, you're interested. So to kind of summarize uh, some of these components, um, this is a table comparing the Algas on insulator platform with silicon on insulator and silicon nitride. And I'd like to point out that I'm showing uh, the performance of different components for these two platforms that have been developed for quantum photonic applications. Um, and so these uh, parameters can be actually improved depending on the geometry of silicon or silicon nitride, but those aren't necessarily useful for quantum photonic applications. So you can see that for these different components, including sort of chip to fiber coupling, waveguide crossers, mock center interferometer performance, and, and uh, heater efficiencies, the Algas and insulator platform um, performs uh, quite favorably or, or comparably to both silicon and silicon nitride. Okay, so a couple of applications um, that we've been working on using both the sources and now some of these tunable passive components. The first one is um, exploring path encoded qubits. And so we can use our tunable interferometer to uh, basically um, serve as sort of the building blocks of like single photon, uh, single qubit gates, for example, using path encoding. So here's an illustration of one such experiment where we have an Algas and insulator chip where we pump the ring source to produce signal idler photons, and then we can send them to different uh, waveguides at the output of the interferometer. And so this can allow us to control which sort of path the photons are, are propagating on. And so we can characterize the performance of this chip by coupling light off the chip, sending it through uh, fiber-based DWDMs to single photon detectors. And as we tune the phase of this interferometer, we can see that the photons are gonna switch paths to the different detectors. And so we see very nice oscillations in the detected count rates with about 20 dB of extinction between those two paths, which is, is pretty comparable to what one would get if they, they did a similar thing on silicon on insulator. Okay, um, so beyond sort of a discrete variable entangled photon pair sources, we're also working on path encoded continuous variable cluster states. And so here's an example of, of one chip that we've recently fabricated. Um, and so let me kind of just walk you through what we're doing with this chip. Um, we inject pump light onto this chip and we have a tunable interferometer here to basically equally split that into two different paths. And then we send the pump photons um, around the micro ring resonator along two uh, uh, opposite directions. And this um, produces a two mode uh, squeeze states that are output along these two paths. And then we have a tunable mock center interferometer here to basically uh, isolate the squeeze uh, states from the pump light. And then we go through another interferometer to split the signal and the idler photons into to opposite paths. And so now we have uh, two entangled, basically squeeze states and separate paths here. And then finally a beam splitter 
uh, to interfere the two signal photons. Um, and this produces the four mode sort of linear cluster state at the output. So we're working on uh, characterizing um, these devices right now. Okay, so the second application of interest is leveraging the fact that we can produce a frequency comb with our microwave resonators with up, up to about 100 spectral modes, very well isolated spectral modes. So one could use this um, for frequency bin encoding instead of path encoding. The basic idea is take uh, the output from uh, the microwave resonator, send it through a pulse shaper so we can independently control the phase on each one of these different modes, send it through a modulator, which then produces sidebands on these to mix the different states, and then, sen and then send it through another pulse shaper to then um, filter out only the modes that we care about. And one can then perform uh, various frequency uh, domain uh, gates and, and operations on, on these kinds of devices. And so I'd also refer you to a excellent work coming out of Andrew Weiner's group uh, with Joe Lucan at Oak Ridge as well, who have really pushed this direction with integrated photonics. Um, and so we're working on developing chip scale devices for this. And here's sort of a, an illustration of what one might envision uh, what this could look like. You have your quantum frequency comb source, a tunable filter to filter out pump light, and then uh, a pulse shaper on chip, which is basically just a series of micro rings, uh, uh, delayed lines, and then micro rings. This will basically isolate individual modes that we can control the amplitude and phase on. We recombine them, multiplex them, and send them through uh, a high-speed modulator to, to mix them with different modes. Um, and so on the top right, I'm showing a prototype six-channel pulse shaper that we are in the middle of testing right now, and we have very nice performance for, in this case, we have six different modes that we can independently tune um, across an entire free spectral range, and so that would allow us to actually isolate these and tune them to be resonant uh, with uh, up to six different modes coming out of our source. Okay, um, so at this point, I'd like to sort of summarize uh, some of the work in the group and kind of provide a little bit of an outlook of where we're going. So I've discussed some of the research from our group on compound semiconductor on insulator um, with entangled uh, uh, pair generation and squeezing that is ultra bright. It's compatible with quantum dot integration for integrating on-demand single photon sources. Uh, we've developed a component library with a number of tunable components with uh, performance that is, is comparable to silicon on insulator and silicon nitride. Um, and this allows things like monolithic source and gate integration. Uh, we're working on leveraging the large uh, I2 nonlinearity and the high electro-optic coefficient for frequency encoding um, and leveraging the fact that the rings can enable spectral and temporal multiplexing. So looking uh, forward a little bit in what I see are some of the challenges and things that we want to address in this platform, um, really Algas and Insulator has some, some very nice uh, properties that allow really uh, efficient entangled photon pair generation and high-speed modulation, but the, many, the level of manufacturer ability is, is not quite there with uh, silicon yet. And so we're working on wafer scale fabrication of Al gas on insulator, as well as indium gallium phosphide on insulator, and heterogeneous sort of three five silicon on insulator, and working on pushing that towards sort of a mid level or foundry fabrication process with sort of standardized um, processing and more robust processing. And so, maybe from a, more of a scientific perspective, um, we're interested in exploring sort of beyond pairs, so looking at high rate multi photon sources and hybrid continuous variable and discrete variable schemes, uh, frequency domain. Um, uh, uh, encoding and so quantum frequency combs with resonator arrays and electro optic frequency combs, and then also exploring quantum interconnects. Um, and so nonlinear photonics for quantum frequency conversion, much about what Cardic has really been spearheading in the last few years. And then also uh, working on uh, developing uh, better chip to fiber coupling and packaging so we can really reduce the loss below half a dB of chip to fiber coupling at scale. Um, okay, so I'd really like to acknowledge everyone who's uh, led a lot of this work, um, especially uh, Trevor Steiner and Josh Castro, who have uh, joined my group when I first um, came to UCSB, and they've really spearheaded a lot of, of these projects. Uh, and then we collaborate with a number of groups here. Um, I'll just list them here um, and acknowledge that they've been uh, contributing to these projects and, and really um, been uh, great to work with on, on a number of projects. Um, okay, so with that said, I'd be happy to answer um, any questions if there are any questions. Thanks very much, Galen. Uh, yes, uh, now the, the stage is open for questions.
So let me start with the first question. Uh, so what are the prospects of making a reconfigurable circuit to generate different or multi-qubit quantum states in your setup? Uh, yeah, so if you're using path encoding, I think that that, that is fairly straightforward um, with the sort of four mode cluster state example that I showed, there's a number of tunable components on that chip. And so uh, with the component library that we've developed, we have all those components now with Algas and Insulator. It's a matter of just making larger circuits, right? Um, and so the technology is there. The scalability is and, and manufacturability is not quite there in the sense that we can't make like a four and eight inch wafer where we're going to have, you know, 100% device yield. That's uh, this platform's maturity is not quite at that level. But if we're talking about sort of chiplets of, you know, upwards of 100 components, then that's something that's within the, the capabilities currently. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, sort of a technical question on my end. Uh, so you showed that uh, there is, the, uh, you guys obtained this 1 dB off chip squeezing. Mm -hmm. um, so based on what you know in terms of the uh, you know, coupling uh, efficiency and other things, what would be the inferred uh, squeezing on chip? Yeah, so the, that data is very preliminary, so I don't want to specifically quote what that would be. Um, I'm guessing it's going to be roughly around 3 to 4 dB, but uh, don't hold me to that because we're in the middle of uh, working with collaborators on characterizing that. And so, um, yeah, I'll have, we'll hopefully have better numbers in the next couple of months on, on what the on-chip squeezing is. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. great. Uh, yeah, thanks again, Galen, for the interesting talk. Uh, so uh, we are nearing the end of this session. Uh, so let's thank all three speakers again. Um, so let me also quickly go over the poll that we had online. So thanks everyone for participating in the polls. Um, so the question was, which application of quantum networks is your favorite? And the choices were distributed computing, cryptography, sensing, uh, blind computing, and all of the above. So maybe not very surprising, uh, all of the above uh, made it first, and then distributed computing second. Uh, okay, so with this, let me conclude this session. Uh, so we'll have roughly 10 minute break, slightly less. So we're gonna start sharp at uh, 9.10. So we'll see you guys soon.
you. Uh, welcome back to session two of day two of Cisco Quantum Summit. Uh, I'm going to moderate this session and the, the last session. Uh, yeah, this, uh, this, this part is about components, hardware components, technology for quantum networks, and we have uh, great speakers. Uh, so I invite, uh, well, before I, I, I introduce the first speaker, the new poll is, uh, is available. So if you want to answer that, uh, it would be great. So our First speaker for this session is uh, Peter Lodal. Peter uh, is a professor of quantum physics and technology at the Niels Bohr Institute in Denmark. Also the director of the Hybrid Quantum Net Network uh, High Q Center of Excellence. So with that, uh, Peter, please, please start. Thank you very much, Elisa, and thanks a lot for giving me the opportunity to, to speak about uh, what we're doing in Copenhagen. Um, we are developing uh, deterministic single photon sources and single and multi photon sources, and I'll speak something about about that today and uh, give you an idea about also the applications that we are foreseeing for that in uh, quantum communica communication and quantum computing. So uh, photonics, uh, well, why why do we want photons for, for for quantum technology? There are some pros and cons, like on any qubit platform. So. Uh, the advantage is first, so photons are nice because they don't experience any stochastic noise once we have them. So, uh, so at optical frequencies, there's no temperature essentially. So there's no stochastic noise on the of, on the photons. Also, we may piggyback on this advanced technology that has been developed by telecom industry to uh, to to develop all these advanced photonic integrated circuits that allows us to control many photons, um, and of course. Uh, and that's what I'll be speaking about here. We're also developing these high quality photonic sources uh, uh, nowadays. Some of the drawbacks of photons are uh, obviously that, uh, well, they don't really deterministically interact with each other. So uh, photon, photon gates is a challenge and also losses. I mean, it's uh, photonics and quantum photonics is losses, losses, losses. This is, this is really about, you know, the name of the game if you really want to scale these systems up. So, um, the hardware we are working on is a uh, solid state based, so it's semiconductor quantum dots embedded into photonic nanostructures. A quantum dot uh, consists of thousands of atoms, but has optical properties like a single atom. We embed them in a photonic crystal waveguide membrane, like what you're seeing here. It's a thin uh, membrane of 160 nanometer thickness. Uh, it's made of gallium arsenide, and the quantum dot material is indium arsenide, uh, typically. And uh, we make these Photonic band gap structures, because in that way we are guiding the photons that are being emitted from the quantum dot into a single propagating mode in the waveguide. And you can say there are two approaches to uh, deterministic single photon sources: either these planar waveguide platforms that I'm speaking about here. There's also uh, the, the vertical cavity structures that are spearheaded, in particular, by uh, Richard Warburton's group in Basel. But the physics will be the same whether you do it in the cavity and the waveguide, uh, plane or vertical. An important figure of merit is the, the source efficiency. So this is simply the probability that once I excite this quantum dot with an optical pulse, what's the probability that I catch a photon and, and root it into a single propagating mode in the waveguide? Uh, this is an, uh, a property we worked and others worked long time on uh, for quite some years and setting experimental bounds on how, how efficiently can I, can I collect the photons. This is an experimental lower bound of 98.4%, meaning that I really have a deterministic single photon source. Photons comes one at a time, pearls in a string, I route them along a single direction uh, in the photonic crystal waveguide. This is obviously an important figure of merit for a single photon source. It says how close it is to being a deterministic single photon source. But more importantly, this beta factor here is a figure of merit also for more advanced applications of this platform because it's linked to the quantum cooperativity by this simple formula, uh, quantum cooperativity is beta divided by one minus beta. 
And the quantum coopertivity is a light matter uh, uh, coupling efficiency because what we have here is not just a source of single photons, it's really a photon emitter uh, that is uh, quantum coherently coupled. Uh, so, so it's really a photon emitter uh, uh, interface that we are uh, constructing here. And uh, the quantum coopertivity is what uh, determines uh, how, what's the fidelity of the photonic quantum gates that I may implement, what's the fidelity of the multi-photon entanglement sources that I also may apply these uh, light matter interfaces for. Um, this only holds a simple relation between quantum coopertivity and the beta factor, only holds if I don't have any broadening processes of the of the emitter. And obviously, this is a solid state system or any system, you will have you will have decoherence and broadening processes. And this is really the, the very non-trivial thing you can say on this platform, that, that nowadays we really understand these broadening processes and we also know how to overcome them so that we really can make use of this extremely high beta factor also to actually realize a high quantum coopertivity and get a single photon and a single emitter to deterministically and fully quantum coherently interact with each other. So uh, how to overcome decoherence processes? Well, there are various decoherence processes and I won't talk about them in, in detail here, but one, one key parameter, one key thing to overcome is really charge noise. So, so in any, you know, uh, quantum dots would be close to surfaces here and there would be charges in the semiconductor material and putting electrical contacts on these uh, structures here and, and making use of the PIN heterostructures that, that, that you can grow in these uh, three, five gallium arsenide materials, you can really apply a very controlled uh, uh, electric field across the quantum dots and sweep away carriers uh, uh, or, or charge noise in the vicinity of the quantum dots. So you can get, uh, so you can overcome this charge noise even in the in the, in the photonic nanostructure. So even with the quantum dots close to surfaces, there are other important um, advantages of, of having the electrical contacts. It also allows you to, to tune the quantum dots. So here you see the tuning of the various exciton complexes with the voltage of the applied across the quantum dot. And it actually is also the way to do spin physics because now I can start to work with an X minus transition, for instance, which is an electron hole pair plus an additional electron. And now I can start to, to play with the spin of that electron and do more advanced protocols for entanglement generation that I will also say something about. So um, back to just single photon generation. Uh, here's some, some details on the on the also how we are operating these sources. Um, so uh, a nice feature of the planar platform is really that I can excite the quantum dot at one spatial position and collect them at another through a tailored out coupling grading here. So that means I can do exact resonant excitation of the quantum dot hitting it with the exact same frequency as it emits the photons. And this is really key in order to, to, to have highly coherent emission uh, from, the, from the quantum dots. Also, um, key uh, feature I mentioned already is these electrical contacts here that are there in order to suppress uh, charge noise, electrostatic uh, charge noise uh, due to uh, that you would otherwise have in these devices. Also, we have uh, worked a lot on these uh, gradings, uh, specialized gradings that you with high efficiency can couple off chip from these photonic crystal waveguides modes. So just some figures of merits here of uh, state of the art from, from our labs is that we can get extremely high single photon purity, meaning that more than 99% pure single photon pulses are being emitted. Also, they're highly indistinguishable, uh, larger than 98%, and the few percent distinguishability here is actually also fully underst understood where it comes from, it has to do with phonon decoherence processes, and there are even means to overcome that also. Um, importantly also that, that we can produce, you know, many, many photons. This is a deterministic source, so it just spits out photons for a very long time. And you can ask, so how many indistinguishable photons can a single quantum dot produce? And here we have uh, measured out to strings of 100 photons that are as indistinguishable as, as you know, say, we measured indistinguishability between photon one and photon two, and photon one and photon 100. And so no degradation of indistinguishability, really meaning that a single quantum emitter emits a long string of, of indistinguishable photons, a huge, quantum resource. And then coupling out of the chips into the fibers, those are current numbers, about 50%. We think we can do this up to 90% efficiency or, or even go higher if, uh, if uh, the application um, uh, requires that. So uh, 
these chips are also commercialized now. So I started the company Sparrow Quantum uh, already some, some years ago, and the company is really ramping up now. Uh, um, and here you see the, the, the roadmap of the, of the company, um, really building also on uh, strong fundamental research over many years uh, before we started the company and now really taking it to the next level. So this is a product roadmap of, of Sparrow. Uh, already sells uh, single photon chips that you can buy, purchase, uh, put into your own cryostat and operate. Next product that will be released early next year will be uh, uh, a fiber couple, so a pigtail device where, where the chip is, is, is directly um, uh, packaged and, and coupled to a fiber for easy operation for the customer. Ultimately, uh, also uh, really will be releasing a full integrated source, so a, a turnkey. Uh, a single photon source system, and uh, and and looking further ahead in time, it's also about into uh, with, uh, moving this to the telecom wavelengths. All I'll be, I'll be talking about here is 950 nanometer. You can frequency convert this to 1550 uh, or 1300, but but moving also the materials uh, to to the telecom uh, band is something that will be in the pipeline. I think I'll skip this one, and then I'll tell you something about the. So, so what's next? So now I told you about how to how to produce single photons deterministically. So what what could you possibly do? What are the applications of these single photons that we foresee? Well, maybe you want to build a, a quantum computer based on on photons, based on single photons. This is what Psy Quantum is pursuing, for instance. And 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 the architecture for doing uh, quantum computing with photons is 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 using the measurement based uh, um, uh, algorithm where uh, you are um, taking advantage of that the, the, the fact that you can trade in the, the, the I mean the, the fact that that for photons we don't really have this deterministic two qubit gate so you can trade that in if instead you are able to generate large scale entangled states uh, like what is indicated here large scale entangled states because if you can do that then all you have to do to do universal quantum computing is actually single qubit measurement on this large scale entangled cluster state uh, and that. Uh, choice of measurements will then encode your quantum computation. So that's called measurement-based quantum computing, very well suited for photonics. So how would you do it um, with, uh, with with quantum dot sources, for instance? Well, the quantum dot sources, I'll explain in a, in a, in a minute, is uh, well good for producing single photons, but but I eventually want entangled photons. So what you can think about with the, with the, with the quantum dot sources is to produce small scale cluster states, maybe five, entangled photons and then really you know many many copies of these five entangled photons and then you can do use, use linear optics to fuse these small scale cluster states into a large scale entangled cluster state that is universal for uh, quantum computing psi quantum has proven actually that that even free photon gsc states and linear optics operations so these are probabilistic fusion operations but even free photons would be enough to grow a universal cluster state, uh, enabling uh, full-blown quantum com computation. And what we are particularly interested in, how could you do that smarter? Because now I have a deterministic source here that potentially could produce smart, uh, small cluster state that I could fuse together with linear objects. And, uh, and, and having the deterministic sources, probably doesn't take much imagination to, to, to say that that, could, that would be a, a, a tremendous scale of advantage if you can produce the photons on demand as opposed to probabilistic, which is the traditional way uh, that photons have been generated. So, um, well, this is a little bit of, uh, of the protocols, the architectures that Psi Quantum have been um, pioneering. Um, uh, it's called fusion-based uh, quantum computing, uh, where they are looking at how uh, tolerant is uh, this encoding to uh, errors and also to uh, losses. And uh, and you can see the the numbers here would be ballpark that that for twelve percent loss per photon could could be tolerated and errors of up to a percent or so. So those are the bars that you're going to race against if you want to do fault tolerant quantum computing based on photonics. So how are you going to do produce these entangled states with the with the quantum dot? I only told you about how to produce single photons so far. Uh, I already gave you a hint because. Because now I want to start with a spin inside the quantum dot. I could tunnel in a single electron or a single hole inside the quantum dot, and I could use that as a as an entangler of the emitted photons. So now a protocol uh, for producing on-demand entanglement 
looks like what you're seeing here. You'll have a spin state that is, is I can prepare in a superposition of spin up and spin down. And then I have a, 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 a state here that I'm exciting and emitting a photon on. So if I'm able to do spin rotations and exciting emitting, and I'm just recycling between those two uh, operations, uh, then I can actually on demand produce uh, a, a large scale entangled state. It could be a, a large scale in qubit GHC state, uh, like you're seeing here. Uh, if I'm if the spin is pointing up, uh, then a photon is emitted in an early time bin. If the spin is pointing down, it's emitted in a late time bin. I'm preparing in a superposition state, and and then I'm emitting both in an early and a late time bin. I'm just repeating this operation over and over again to produce a large scale GHC state, like what you see here. And of course, we are very good at, at recycling and doing it many times in, in these systems. We have this high beta factor, meaning I can collect the photons with an extremely high efficiency. So this, this looks very well suited for that. Just you know, do the spin operations and let the excite and emit the quantum dot and, and, and off we go. Of course, reality is a little bit more complicated than this because uh, now I have a spin that I need to control. I need to coherently control. I need to keep it alive. Uh, and I, 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 I care about what's the entanglement fidelity that, that can be produced with such an, a, a quantum dot source. And this we have worked out in detail here um, in this work. Uh, this is the entanglement infidelity. I'm not going through all the, the glory details here. You can, you can look up the references if you're interested. Uh, but uh, but here really looking at at, at all the, the loss uh, or all the error contributions that we can have in the system. There, there's this finite indistinguishability of the photons uh, that, that matters that you have to care about. There's also a branching ratio between I want to excite and emit on this transition, but there's a chance that I could lose a photon on the diagonal transition here. That's what this B here is. You want this... Uh, uh, the, the branching ratio between the two transitions here to be as large as possible. It turns out in these photonic crystal waveguides, you actually have a large branching ratio because of the asymmetry of the electromagnetic field or the polarization of the electromagnetic field of the guided field in the waveguides. So you almost get this high B for free in, the, in this particular platform. And then there are also some detuning terms that you have to care about. So the, the bottom line is if when you're putting in numbers here, so real experimental numbers for this platform, if it all works well, is that you should be able to get to the 1.6% error per photon. So really start to approach the threshold for fault tolerance that, that I was talking about before. So, so it starts to look compatible. It starts to look worth scaling up essentially this platform that you, that, that you can get to numbers uh, like this and, and still with room for, for further improvement. Uh, it, it starts to be a, a serious contender. Of course, we do experiments in the lab also, and, and we don't have it all working uh, proper, properly yet. Of course, in, in practice, uh, you all, there are always uh, uh, challenges in, in, in your real experimental uh, implementation. So, so this is a recent experiment where we did, uh, we saw a 67% uh, entanglement fidelity. In this case, limited by the fact that the spin rotations that we do, we actually do optically. And, and it turns out that, that you are inducing an additional uh, uh, spin flip process from this optical induced, so an optically induced spin flip process. Something we think we can overcome with various tricks uh, to to get really to the to the high ninety percent entanglement fidelity. So this is this is going on in the lab in the lab at the moment. Here's another experiment that we did uh, where we um, instead of emitting entangled photons, we used the quantum dot spin in the waveguide to as a to to to, to entangle. Uh, light that was uh, sent into the waveguide, so, so we are so we are reflecting uh, photons off the, the spin very efficiently coupled to the waveguide, and this reflection um, process entangles the spin and the reflected photon with each other, and you herald actually this entanglement also by the observation of a reflected photon, and in this case uh, our spin fidelity is uh, is better uh, than, than than in the previous experiment. So, um, so that's uh, the first steps on this uh, entanglement generation, deterministic entanglement generation. And this is uh, also really work going on, 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 on scaling this up much further to many more photons and much higher fidelity. Uh, what you need to do subsequently was to do fusion operations on these entangled spins. So that's, those are linear optics operations uh, where you are interfering on beam splitters, these entangled photons that you produce from the sources. 
Uh, so so uh, and and how we're going to do that just gives you a kind of a, a high level idea of, of of our architectures. We're really thinking of a heterogeneous approach where we'll have two chips. Uh, it can a source chip with the quantum dots producing the entangled photons, and then a processing chip could be lithium niobate, for instance, is a material that we're working primarily on at the moment. It could also be silicon nitride. Uh, that that processes that's a pick uh, platform that processes all these photons uh, uh, and really you know tapping into to these advanced uh, things you can you can make in 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 foundries for instance where you can really make advanced protein integrated circuits. We're also quite interested in in you could you could think of um, um, uh, you know combining these uh, these uh, chips. Uh, uh, or the scaling mass not directly on on the on the lithium niobate platform or, or the silicon nitride platform and and really uh, uh, these kind of uh, bonding uh, techniques uh, could be an interesting uh, approach but but those are kind of the architectures that we you're seeing small scale chips for the generation of the photons of free five the gallium mass night is really really good for that but for the processing for the uh, propagating photons, you want to go into other materials that are much better suited for that. And also for the detection integrated detectors, superconducting nanowire detectors uh, integrated on the processing chip. So to that end, we work on uh, synfilm lithium niobate integrated circuits. A uh, uh, nice thing about that is really you have fast electro-optical uh, modulators and low loss. And so we can do go up to 6.5 gigahertz in, in, in a recent experiment we did. And um, and this is really very very compatible with the quantum dot sources where the internal lifetime is about uh, 100 picoseconds or so. So that's that that's spot on the speeds that we need. We don't need to go much faster than this because we, uh, yeah, that's 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 a repetition rate that that we can operate the the systems at. It's reasonably low loss also. So in this particular uh, demonstration, we saw 0.8 dB per centimeter at this 930 nanometer that we're operating. And uh, superconducting nanowire detectors can be integrated on these uh, circuits as well, and this will be next in line. So we're quite excited about this uh, particular ability to switch here, low loss, uh, um, high extinction uh, photons uh, produced from the quantum dot sources. So uh, what else can you do? So far I spoke about just a single quantum dot producing advanced uh, entangled states um, and, and single photons, of course. If you take this a step further and starts to look at two quantum dots. So two quantum dots coupled through the waveguide here, for instance, then you can actually start to generate very advanced uh, cluster states or entangled states with, with advanced entanglement topology with two dimensional entanglement topologies. And this is beautiful work from Sophia Economos group where they proposed a specific way with two coupled quantum dots to produce a specific graph state that is well suited for, for quantum repeater applications. And we also have some work in, in that line along this line of really benchmarking the hardware towards a quantum repeater architecture, one-way quantum repeater architecture. What are the requirements in, in, in specs on the on on the on the quantum dot platform in order to produce these states? And I think that those kind of benchmarks are, are really important to do for us hardware people in order to focus on on optimizing the right things. So um, towards this end, here's a very recent experiment we did where we started to observe this coupling uh, between two quantum dots in a photonic crystal waveguide. So we observed the collective uh, enhancement of and, and suppression, so super and subradiant behavior of two quantum dots coupled uh, by uh, the uh, photonic crystal waveguide mode. Uh, and the nice thing about this is that this is a 1D system. So this dipole-dipole interaction that otherwise is very weak or falls off rapidly is one of our cubed in, in free space in a in a 1D system it's actually infinitely range it's limited by the loss length of, of the waveguide so you, but we can really get dipole dipole interaction over extended distances and this is what we observed in this experiment and saw the super and sub radiant features of, of, of this collective coupling. You can also think about other applications, and one exciting uh, opportunity is uh, proposed by my colleague Anna Sørensen is to start using this light matter interface for frequency transduction between microwave frequencies and the optical domain. So one of the challenges that 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 uh, superconducting qubit platforms have is, of course, I mean, you can you can maybe 
built a thousand uh, qubit superconducting uh, uh, system, uh, but if you want to scale it uh, much beyond that, uh, you need something to, to mediate the interaction between uh, the superconducting qubits and uh, uh, in one fridge and in another fridge, say. And photons could be uh, enabling that. So this is a proposal of how to use this photon emitter interface to mediate transduction between the microwave frequency of super superconducting qubit and the optical domain so that you can transduce uh, the qubit information in the, in the superconducting qubit to a photon, send it off to another superconducting qubit and transduce back. Uh, so really solving potentially this 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 uh, scaling or linking to the related to the scaling up challenge of uh, superconducting qubit systems. So this particular proposal works at the level of just a single photon because uh, that's a nice thing about our systems that only a single photon scattering off a quantum dot uh, is enough to excite the system. So you could drive a Raman transition uh, where you're exciting uh, a, a quantum dot and uh, a superconducting qubit um, with just a single photon. And, uh, and that's, 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 that's the idea behind the, the proposal here. Ultimately, this could be, well, an, an optimal um, frequency tr transducer because, well, there will not be no stray light, no stray photons to, to, uh, to destroy the, the, um, the superconducting qubits, uh, the Cooper pairs in the superconducting qubits that are very susceptible to, to, to photons, obviously, because they're so high energy. It's just one photon that would be enough to do the frequency transduction. So, so this is something that we are quite excited about and, and want to, to start to is so far only theory, but but we think we have the bits and pieces. Uh, again, this high cooperativity photon emitter interface that is needed in order to to start working along this direction. So uh, the last thing I would like to mention, if if I still have some time, um, it's uh, you just stop me if I'm going over time. Uh, but that is related to uh, photon nonlinearity. I touched a little bit upon it already, but but a, a single quantum emitter sitting inside this photonic crystal waveguide is a highly nonlinear medium. If I send in one photon, it's reflected with beta squared uh, probability. If I send in two photons, well, I can only scatter one photon at a time. So actually, two photons would be be correlated due to the interaction uh, with the quantum dot. It might be preferentially transmitted through. So there's something that knows a difference or, or scatters differently one and two photons. So you can use that to your advantage. And then, and the, the tuning knob that you have here is that you can you can control the pulse duration that you're sending into the quantum dot. Uh, so you're and it's actually a surprisingly rich system. You may think that that you know a, a, a two level system interacting with a pulse of light. This is totally well known and uh, page one in, in, in the quantum optics textbook, but it's not. I mean, page one in the quantum optics textbook is a James Cummings model, which is a two level system interacting with a, with, with a single mode of light. If I send in a pulse, this is a continuous uh, um, uh, pulse. Uh, so, so that's a multi-mode system. That's a big, uh, Hilbert space that is required to really describe that. And it's surprisingly rich. And here we have just described the, uh, or we have experimentally studied the correlations, the quantum correlations that are induced when you're uh, comparing one photon and two photon pulses being scattered off such a quantum dot deterministically coupled to a photonic crystal waveguide. And here we are varying the pulse duration and seeing quite some uh, distinct changes in the in, in the correlations that are being induced. And we are very much in, interested in, so that's a photon-photon linearity. That's something that, that that acts differently on one and two photons. What can you possibly do that, with that in terms of quantum simulations, and in particular in terms of, of simulating anharmon anharmonic vibrations of, of, uh, of dynamical uh, um, uh, molecular processes? You can also use it for photon sorting. Uh, so this is a nice... Uh, Proposal from my colleague uh, Klaus Müllmer uh, that realized that, that that if you are so so one and two photons get correlated by this scattering, it also means that the pulses gets distorted. But you can control this distortion by controlling the pulse duration that you're sending in, and and here it turns out that if you are doing it properly, you uh, scattering off two quantum dots embedded in such a photonic crystal waveguide, you can actually scatter. Uh, if you have a superposition of one or two photons, you can scatter such that the one and the two photon 
components end up in orthogonal spectral temporal mode. And orthogonal spectral temporal modes you can you can uh, distinct from each other. Uh, so this is actually photon sorting going on, a process where if you have a superposition of one and two photons and out I get one and two photons in uh, separable uh, spectral temporal mode. Uh, so that's a way of yeah that's photon sorting. How do I how do I select these spectral temporal modes? I do that by frequency conversion methods. For instance, instance Silberhorn's group has has worked worked on 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 how to do this. So think of this scattering uh, and and frequency conversion as a sorter, so that I get one photon out in in one mode and two photons out in another mode. And such photon sorting uh, processes actually allows you to do. Uh, deterministic bell analyzers. So here's a, 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 um, a schematics of how these photon uh, scattering processes and linear optics and photon counting is all you need to do in order to deterministically distinguish all the four uh, bell pass encoded bell states from each other. So that's that, that's an, a direct application of this, this nonlinear interaction uh, that, that you cannot do with only linear optics. I think I'll, I'll end here by uh, uh, while well, summarizing, uh, saying that I think we're quite excited about the, these deterministic sources. They, they start to work very well. We also really start to, to be serious about scaling this up towards applications, real world applications. Quantum computing I talked about here, uh, but also um, things like device independent quantum key distribution is something that, that is uh, that, that direct uh, opportunities for uh, with, with, with the performance that I'm speaking about here. I'd like to thank the group and, and also my collaborators and uh, happy to take questions. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Peter, for uh, great progress from your lab. Uh, we have some questions uh, from audience. Uh, to enhance the entanglement fidelity, is it possible to spin flip the quantum dots using millimeter wave radiation rather than doing it optically? Yes, that's a that's a great question. Um, so, um, so this has been one of the things that 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 people have tried on the quantum platform, but not successfully yet. And it has to do with the time scales, really. That that, that the coherence uh, you have to do it rather fast because the T two star time is 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 really short. I mean, uh, twenty nanoseconds or so uh, for the whole spins. So you have to do it faster than this. Uh, but um, now we 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 start also to be able to increase this T2 star time quite significantly with cooling, uh, nuclear spin cooling techniques. And also the, it's also really a matter of what microwave you, you I mean, what, what microwave designs you, you, you can make on chip. And so, so my prediction will be that this is something, first of all, we will have to do <laughs> because uh, you don't want to continue to do optical uh, spin rotations. You want to do it with microwave pulses. Uh, so it's something we'll have to do, and it's also something we, we will be able to do on this platform in the future. Uh, but it's a great question. Um, Thanks. Uh, so one question I have, I mean, this, this problem of the uh, chip to fiber coupling. So you mentioned yes. you expect to get to 90%. I want to say, what's the ultimate solution? Well, maybe I said there was an interview published yesterday with John Martinez, and he highlighted this as a fun Big problem for photonics chips. Yes. So, yes. Uh, yeah. What do you, how do you see the roadmap to? It's get... a very very important question. We 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 uh, the conference has just come from. We spoke. We speak about it all the time. Uh, so and and somebody will have to have to solve it. Uh, so uh, you'll need to couple chip to fiber with ninety five percent plus efficiency uh, in order to really have something interesting for, for photonics. And that has to do with these fault tolerance thresholds for, for quantum computing. Can we do that? Uh, evanescent coupling allows you to do that. So people have demonstrated numbers like that with tapered fibers and tapered uh, uh, chips. And the uh, problem is just that it's not very stable and it's not very reproducible and things like that. So doing this with high yield, um, we, I mean, I don't, I don't see why we should not be able to do it. It's not a very sexy problem to tackle maybe, uh, but uh, but I'm sure uh, somebody will have to do it. It's actually one of the questions that, that like my own company, Sparrow, uh, is also you know, really on this this, this uh, project, also for the long haul, because uh, if you solve that, then, then okay, then, then, then this is part of the scalability of your platform also towards the, the real advanced application. 
Sure. It's, it's a sexy problem for industry when you have a product, you know, it's, a, mm. <laughs> it's hard to get graduate student work on that, but it's the yeah. engineering problem. So uh, thank you very much, Peter. We have more questions, but just to stay on time, we need to uh, move on. So uh, our next speaker, uh, we are uh, pleased to have uh, Sai Wu Nam from uh, NIST, National Institute of Science and Technology. Uh, Sai Wu is a project leader at Faint Photonics Group at NIST. So with that, please, uh, yeah, please start, so. Okay, I hope everyone can hear me. Um, yes. Thanks for the introduction, and uh, also let me thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to speak today about single photon detectors. Uh, I'll probably, I'm gonna start with a little bit of um, uh, vocabulary or nomenclature about, uh, let's say, properties of single photon detectors. Try to talk about some of the um, requirements for people for different quantum information applications. I'll talk about uh, very conventional, you know, commercial off the shelf technologies people use to detect single photons. And I'll end with some of the work that my group does in developing uh, single photon detectors that use superconducting materials. All right. So, uh, you know, when, when you have this problem of wanting to detect a single photon, there are, uh, Lots of properties of detectors that you really want to to understand because it affects how your system will perform. Uh, one of the obvious things is what people often call uh, high quantum efficient, you know, quantum efficiency, and that's basically what's the probability that you'll be able to, to detect the single photon. Um, it's often very important to know what color you're interested in detecting, uh, and whether it needs to be a very narrow band detection or whether the color could be broad, you know, maybe from blue to red even. Um, another interesting property is something that's called the dark count rate. Uh, and there are various opinions about how this term should be defined. Uh, and in my opinion, uh, it should be the, you know, the, the, the number of times per second or per unit time that you get a false positive, that the detector gives you a signal, even though there was no photon that was absorbed. Um, something related to dark count rate is something called after pulsing that often exists in, com in conventional detectors, which I'll describe later. Uh, and um, another important spec is the speed. You often want to maybe count as fast as you can. So you, you want to understand how fast after detecting a photon does the device recover and start seeing photons again. Something that's related to um, speed also is what's the uncertainty in the timing resolution of the of the single photon detector, and that's normally known as the jitter. And then something that's unique to quantum information applications, particularly quantum computing applications with photons, is the idea that you may need to be able to identify or count the number of photons that were in a short pulse of light, and that's known as photon number resolving detection. So other things that are important when trying to decide what kind of photon detector to use, um, obviously swap C is something one needs to consider. You know, if, if the photon detector weighs one ton, that may not be something you want in your lab because you may not, not be able to uh, have, you know, have a device that, that's that big. Um, other things that uh, should be uh, considered often is, is the device commercially available because you might need to buy uh, a lot of them and you don't want to ask your collaborators to make, you know, a thousand of them for you because they may not be able to do that. Um, something that people don't really recognize but uh, is important is like how user friendly or easy to use is the device because um, you may not want a device that really needs a PhD to operate. This this could be uh, maybe too much to ask for. Um, and then of course there's ideas, you know, things about like how robust it is it to you know breaking and is it easy to maintain. So these are these are properties of single photon detectors that should be considered when deciding what kind of single photon detector to use. So another thing I wanna describe that uh, is extremely confusing to people who may not be familiar with the quantum information field is uh, often people talk about photon counters and photon number resolving detectors. And this causes a lot of confusion. Uh, and what I would say is typically when people use the term photon counter, they're talking about a device that um, it doesn't really matter how many photons hit the device. It could be three photons hit the device. 
you just get a, a digital signal uh, that doesn't tell you the number. So you get a you get some kind of indication or output signal that's not dependent on the number of photons. It just has a single photon threshold. So you have, if you have one or more photons that are incident upon the detector, you get a click. And these are often called photon counters for historical reasons. Um, and what's uh, what I want to distinguish that from is uh, something known as uh, photon number resolving detectors, where you know you get a pulse height, which is or output signal that's proportional to the number. Uh, so you can say, oh yeah, there were three photons that were detected by this uh, this detector, and I get a pulse height that's proportional to that photon number. So photon counter, photon number resolving, it's a it's some jargon that you have to be familiar with when when talking about uh, these single photon detectors in quantum information applications. So there are a lot of places where photon detectors are required in uh, in quantum information science. I have listed a, a few here, um, and with some of their more uh, let's say conventional specs that they need. For example, if you want to do some kind of quantum communication, people often think, well, I want to use the fiber that's installed around the world, so that really forces you to be somewhere at 15, 15 nanometers or, or 13, 10, with, and you want really efficient detection because you don't want to lose your photons. Um, if you're interested in quantum computing with, at, with uh, let's say, trapped ions or atoms, uh, you probably are going to be detecting UV photons, and you want to do that with relatively high efficiency. And in almost all of these cases, uh, you want no dark counts if that's possible, because that's a source of error. Uh, you'd like the timing jitter to be as low as possible. So, you know, if, if you're in a communication system, uh, you know, often it's a clocked system and your timing jitter will determine how fast you can clock your system. Uh, and then you want to count as fast as possible to get the answer or do the computation as quickly as possible. Uh, so these are just uh, some of the requirements. And when you start looking at these requirements and looking at what conventional technologies are able to do in terms of detection efficiency and dark count rates, um, what you find is they're usually pretty, uh, they're not quite uh, at a high enough performance level where you can, where, can, where you should really be using them. Uh, and in red, I mean, the biggest problem with most of these conventional uh, things that you could buy available, or you can buy, then it's commercially available, is uh, that the efficiency is pretty low. Uh, that doesn't mean that, you know, the devices, the physics of the device prevents you from getting something higher. It just means what you can buy easily commercially typically doesn't have the kind of performance you want in the detection efficiency. It's still usable for very maybe simple prototype experiments, but um, long term, it, it, these kinds of efficiency numbers aren't going to make a, a viable system. In contrast, our group and other groups around the world have been looking at using devices made out of superconductors. Uh, the, kind, the two that we technologies that we mainly focus on in my group are something known as the transition head sensor and the superconducting nanowire single photon detector. And in this case, what you see is that the efficiency can be extremely high, approaching very close to 100%, and that the dark count rate uh, can be significantly uh, significantly low. And in, for example, recently we've shown for both the TES and the nanowire detector, we can be at count rates that are something like dark count rates, so false positives on the order of one dark count per day. Uh, so that's that's pretty exciting. And it's, I think, uh, why many quantum information uh, demonstrations that, that use photons often talk about using one of these kinds of detectors to do the detection. All right, so let me get into, I'm going to try to cover a few of these uh, detector technologies, the physics behind how they work. Uh, um, yeah, and hopefully I can do that in fast enough time that uh, there's time for questions. So the workhorse in single photon detection traditionally has been something known as a photomultiplier tube. And I really like this picture of uh, an array of photomultiplier tubes that are in one of these high energy physics experiments that are detecting uh, neutrinos. Here you see uh, sitting in a in a in a water raft are two technicians who are cleaning each one of these photomultiplier tube like you know uh, inputs uh, that are going to detect single photon detection when this is a huge volume of thousands of photomultiplier tubes is filled with water. Uh, so these are easily can be mass produced easily and 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 scaled to large numbers easily. 
Uh, so one of the things about photomultiplier tubes is they, you know, they're basically the first kind of device that really was shown to have single photon detection capability. Uh, so they're very reliable. There's a lot of knowledge on how to make these kinds of devices. The drawback is depending on the color you're interested in, it may not be efficient enough or may have a very high dark count rate. The physics is pretty simple. There's, uh, you know, light comes in, it hits a photocathode. And so it uses the photoelectric effect that when the light gets absorbed, it, it creates a photoelectron. And that's accelerated to a series of dynodes uh, that are, you know, accelerate, you know, the total voltage across the set of dynodes may be on the order of a few hundred volts, maybe a thousand volts. And every time an electron hits one of those dynodes, uh, that single electron got accelerated to higher energy and it creates, it, when it uh, hits the dynode, it then creates a bunch of secondary electrons that then get accelerated to sequentially more dynodes. So effectively what happens if you have a bunch of these dynodes is you gain about a million. So you have one electron that can be turned into about a million electrons, which is then measurable with some kind of uh, transimpedance amplifier or some kind of circuit to measure that very short pulse of current. Um, these things are, this is an example from the Hamamatsu uh, probably brochure of physically what this thing looks like. You have your photocathode, and then you've got these series of dynodes that are, are um, held at voltages to accelerate the electrons. Uh, this is an example of, of blue uh, or more um, short wavelength type uh, photomultiplier tubes and their detection efficiency. You see it doesn't quite get to 100%, uh, maybe 50%. You know, in the 400 to 800 range with the with the gallium arsenide phosphide type photocathode, and so for quantum information applications, this isn't something that is usually generally very. Um, it's not ideal. You'd like to have close to 100. Another potential problem with uh, with um, photomultiplier tubes is sometimes they suffer from afterpulsing, and what afterpulsing means is uh, the device saw a single photon initially, but for some amount of time after the photon was detected, and so the x-axis is time after the initial single photon detection, the photomultiplier tube may click again and tell you there was a photon. But in fact, it, there wasn't. And this, this increased probability of getting a false click after an initial photon was detected uh, is known as afterpulsing. And uh, uh, people have been working on trying to reduce the afterpulsing because that's a source of error that is highly undesired. Uh, so this is not a very... Uh, good property of photomultiplier tubes. And then here's an example of jitter. Uh, the jitter in, in um, photomultiplier tubes can be quite, quite low. One thing you should observe, though, is it can be extremely asymmetric. And so uh, if you're in a, uh, let's say, a quantum communication link, let's say a quantum key distribution link, and you want to run your link at one gigahertz, what you'll find is uh, there may be a single photon occurred in this, in this slate, this clock cycle, but because there could be a, a, a relatively long uh, delay, like up to a nanosecond delay before you actually get the click, that's what this, this is what jitter measures the uncertainty in emission. And uh, you, could, you could misidentify it as occurring in a sequential time bit in your comm system that's running at one gigahertz. So uh, Gaussian full, you know, uh, jitters profiles are preferred and you, these tails, uh, if you're in a com communication system, can introduce significant amounts of error that will compromise the security of your system. All right, so the other workhorse in, uh, conven in conventional detector technologies is the uh, avalanche photodiode. This is, a, uh, this is a reverse biased semiconducting diode. Depending on the material that the, the diode's made of, you can get very high efficiency in the visible if you're using silicon, and then if you want to detect a 1550, you have to use some kind of indium gallium arsenide based device. Um, there are a lot of commercially available products here, uh, but the big problem is that the efficiency may, may not be high enough. And if you're at 1550, the dark count rate can be quite high. Um, um, so one of the things, uh, oh, sorry, I don't know. One of the things uh, to be aware of is that you know, you're gonna be using a, a photodiode but it's not going to be biased in the traditional photoconducting region or maybe linear region. You're instead going to momentarily bias the detector in this breakdown region. So it turns out like you can have a photodiode biased beyond its breakdown voltage. And then what you're going to, and it won't break down. But what happens is if a single photon uh, gets absorbed, that electron hole pair can trigger 
the breakdown and you get a huge uh, flow of current. So the single photon detectors, avalanche flow detectors typically operate in this breakdown voltage region where you momentarily bias the detector higher than the breakdown voltage to detect a single photon. And then there's a complicated, well, it's not that complicated process, uh, but as soon as this electron hole pair is created when the bias is above breakdown, uh, electron holes drift apart and the accelerating electron and holes create more uh, electrons and holes, this, hence this avalanche that occurs somewhat uncontrollably, and you have to figure out how to turn that current off. Otherwise, the current will, will constantly be on, and so often there's a, a resistor put in series to passively quench to shut off the current so the device can reset. So uh, I'm going to switch gears now, since I don't have that much time, and talk about superconducting-based devices. I think there are two really key concepts that one needs to understand when you're trying to understand the superconducting devices I'll describe. One is that there's the notion that uh, at some temperature, the resistance goes from some finite value to zero resistance, and that um, superconductors have zero resistance, but they can't have zero resistance with an infinite amount of current. There's a maximum critical current that it is what we typically call it, at which the, the, the maximum critical current density that current can be flowing in a, in a superconducting material. So two concepts, resistance goes to zero, uh, and this change in resistance is really steep, and the other is you can't have infinite current, there's a maximum critical current density. So the one I like to describe first is known as the superconducting nanowire single photon detector, or SNSPD, and you've heard various people talk about this kind of device that's being used in their, their systems and integrating it on waveguides and things like that. Uh, one of the great things about this device is that um, with the right kind of coatings or optical structure, you can get almost 100% efficiency. And recently we've shown you can uh, make devices that basically have one dark count per day or one false click per day. One of the reasons this device is, let's say, more efficient than, than a semiconducting device is that the energy scale for creating excitations in a in a superconductor like this is about a thousand times smaller than energy scales needed to create an electron hole pair in a semiconductor. So um, it, you get a lot of excitations and just detecting whether the excitations have occurred is something that's possibly easier. So this is an example. This picture here is a SEM micrograph. The nanowire has been patterned into some uh, uh, meandering pattern that winds back and forth. We, we, in this case, we've made the wire uh, larger than 10 microns in diameter so that it could capture the light coming out of a single mode fiber like SMF28 uh, really efficiently. And one of the great things about these kinds of devices is that they're um, rel it's really simple to make since it's just a, a, a nanowire or superconducting material patterned into a nanowire structure. Uh, and so there are several companies. I've just listed the two American companies, but there are lots of companies around the world that are making this kind of detector and lots of groups around the world uh, that are doing research to make these kinds of detectors better. And I collaborate pretty closely with the guys at MIT and or the people at MIT and JPL. So let me just talk about how this works. Uh, you have some kind of uh, strip that's biased. Uh, with some current below the maximum critical current density. And then the photon creates some kind of hot spot that can suppress locally the, the superconductivity. You know, so the current can't flow because you've maybe exceeded the maximum critical current density. And that resist the because you've exceeded the critical current density, you've created some kind of hot spot. So that the current that was flowing through the nanowire detector, which we typically draw with some that has some intrinsic inductance L, the current was that was flowing there gets uh, diverted into some kind of resistive load, which is your amplifier, so you can measure the signal. Uh, and then over time, uh, the superconductor recovers, it cools, it cools back down, and the current gets rediverted back to flowing into the nanowire detector. And so one of the interesting things about these materials uh, is that they have an anomalously large inductance, not, not the standard kind of inductance that is seen in most superconducting materials, and the, this inductance couples with the resistances in the circuit to, to cause a bunch of different time constants that you might see in the signal. Uh, so one thing is that, for example, is the current is gonna get restored by, uh, with an L over R time constant given by the large inductance of the nanowire detector and let's say a 50 ohm transmission line. Uh, and that can be on the order of a few nanoseconds if you engineer it correctly. So this is the, the readout, it's really, uh, 
actually it's quite simple. If, if there's been no uh, single photon that's been detected, the current coming from this current source flows primarily through this nanowire detector, which I've drawn as, as this rectangular meander. When there's a photon detected, it stop, it blocks the current from flowing uh, in this um, meander, and that current gets diverted into norm into typically a capacitively coupled uh, 50 ohm RF RF amplifier. And you know these kinds of amplifiers are like what what you could find in your cell phone that costs like 10 cents. So it's really inexpensive to read out uh, this kind of uh, nanowire detector. So this is again a picture of what something might look like where we've got a, uh, a meander that's been patterned. And so it covers like a circle, which could cover the output mode of an optical fiber. The line width is on the order of 100 nanometers of the, of the strips. Uh, the conventional materials that a lot of people use are nibium nitride and nibium tinitride. And our group at NIST has really pioneered the use of amorphous superconductors where the transition temperature is a little bit lower, but we find that these kind of materials can be fabricated more reliably. Um, so one of the things that we do to increase the efficiency of, of detection is that um, if there's a meander pattern on a silicon substrate with maybe a silicon oxide uh, layer underneath, what you find is the light uh, that's incident upon this meander, which is drawn as these small little uh, gray rectangles, you find that the light, some of it will reflect, some of it will go through everything, uh, and you maybe see about 20% of the, the light. But what you can do is put a mirror underneath, put some kind of coatings on top to reduce the reflection and eliminate the transmission. Uh, so the light gets uh, forced to be absorbed in the nanowire material and you can get efficiencies that are very, very high. Uh, but high efficiencies are not uh, only what's needed. Uh, you really need to make sure that if you're gonna, let's say, deliver light in a fiber to the detector, that the fiber is coupled to the detector with very high efficiency. And, and we have this trick that we invented about a decade ago where we take, there's a, if you have uh, two fibers and you want, want to connect them together, there's a standard uh, you know, fiber combiner. And if you take it apart, what you find is there's a zirconia sleeve that takes the two fiber cores and aligns them to within half micron. Uh, and this is mass produced, cost about a dollar. And what we've done is we've taken these zirconia sleeves and use that to couple our, our uh, uh, let's say, fibers to our detectors. So we, we micro-machine our detectors into these silicon disks with a small little diving board off the end. We mount them on a 2.499 millimeter sapphire rod or, or some kind of appropriate rod, slide the zirconia sleeve over this assembly, and then we can plug in a fiber that's aligned to within a half micron accuracy to the center of the detector. Uh, and we can consistently get losses that are much less than 1% due to the fiber coupling. And we call this our self-aligned packaging because you don't need a, you don't need to spend any time on a microscope tweaking things back and forth to get the optical beam careful, carefully aligned to the detector. Uh, and so this is an example of uh, the kind of curves that one uses to characterize a device. Uh, so at very low current, so sorry, the x-axis seems to be cut off the label. The, the x-axis is microamps. So at very low current, let's say two microamps, um, when, a hot, when a photon's absorbed, uh, the current just can go around the hotspot and it doesn't cause a click. But if you get higher than four microamps, and there are, I think, um, there are, I think, four devices or several devices here that are overlapped on each other, uh, the efficiency seems to saturate. And depending on the polarization of the light, the efficiency saturates at something like 98%, or if you're in the less optimal or least optimal polarization state of light, you maybe get detected 80% of the time. Uh, but these kinds of flat efficiency curves as a function of higher bias is what you want to see in a high-performing uh, single photon nanowire uh, detector device. Um, and so with our collaborators at JPL and MIT, we've been trying to make cameras. Um, here, you know, we have a laser beam that's being rastered across the array uh, to spell out something. Uh, so that's something that's in that's in development and uh, pretty exciting to see how big a camera we can make at the single photon level. All right, so I'm going to switch gear. Oh, sorry. And then these kinds of detectors have been used in um, loophole-free Bell tests, uh, which can be used to make uh, quantum certified random numbers. And then we've been integrating them with, for example, our the NIST 
we've been working with the NIST group on ion traps and integrating our photon detector in ion trap uh, quantum information processors. So there could be a trapped ion that may be manipulated in one zone of the RF trap and then through the use of our electro electrodes uh, moved so that the ion is over the single photon detector where it's then interrogated with laser beams and depending on the state of the trapped ion, it may, it may emit a UV photon that is then very easily detected by the single photon detector right underneath it. Uh, so these are exciting ap new applications that uh, where nan nanowire detectors could be used. So let me switch gears now and talk about photon number resolving detectors with my remaining time. One thing that people don't realize or normally or, or know is that, you know, before, let's say the 2000s, before we had these superconducting devices, one could do photon number resolving detection with with really good PMTs, the only problem is that the efficiency is not close to 100%. And, you know, the uncertainty in whether the pulse height is a actually uh, is a one photon or two photon can be quite high, especially if you get a pulse height that's in between these, these one and two labels, you're not sure whether it was a two photons that caused a small pulse height or one photon that through noise gave you a bigger pulse height. So um, the energy resolution here isn't really good enough for photonic quantum computing. So this is the problem, and we are looking, you know, we were looking at a solution. And about 20 years ago, I heard a talk uh, from someone doing photonic quantum computing, and I realized that at NIST, we would we could solve this problem pretty easily. And that's with something known as a transition head sensor. Um, it can also have very high efficiencies approaching uh, 100%. Um, here is a, a similar histogram, but instead of, uh, let's say, probably blue photons with the photomultiplier tube, these are photons at 1.55 microns, and you have really good uh, resolution of these peaks. Uh, and because of recent interest by various photonic quantum computing entities, you can actually now get this commercially available by, from a company in, in Toronto. So let me just describe the physics of how this works. It's pretty simple. It's uh, a concept of calorimetry where, you know, what you're going to do is you're just going to measure the temperature rise of an object due to the absorption of one, two, or three photons. So what you need is a really sensitive thermometer, something that's going to absorb the photons, a weak thermal link so that the heat can escape and detect the, the microcalorimeter can reset, and then somewhere for the heat to go, a thermal heat sink. And it turns out magically this can happen in a superconductor like tungsten, where the tungsten superconducting to resistive transition is the thermometer, the light gets absorbed in the tungsten directly, and it turns out the electrons of the tungsten can be at a different temperature than the, the, nucle the nuclei, the, and, and the nuclei vibrate with, at some, with some vibrational frequency, and that's really the temperature. And it turns out the electrons and, and, and nuclei can be decoupled, and that's how it can be reset to a colder temperature. Uh, and when you start looking at the physics of microcalorimetry, what you find is that the temperature of operation needs to be something below 1 Kelvin, so 100 millikelvin, so quite cold. Uh, so, you know, if there's no, no uh, photon that's instant upon the detector, you don't see any signal. When one photon's absorbed, uh, you can get maybe a click that looks like that. Two, it you know, gets double in height, three, four, and, and higher. Uh, what you notice here is that the time scale is on the order of uh, microseconds. And this is about a thousand times slower than a, a superconducting nanowire single photon detector. So these are slow detection events, they're microsecond scale. Uh, but the advantage is you have time, the slowness is what really what gives you the advantage to see, you know, one, two, three, four photons, which you can't do in the nanowire detector very easily. Um, here's an example of us packaging a several with the same kind of packaging scheme with the zirconia sleeve, the detector. Uh, in its lollipop form, you know, you've got the lollipop part, which has got the detector on it, and then you've got the stick of the lollipop where you can wire bond leads to do the readout. Uh, we can package a bunch of these in, in copper boxes if you want a lot of photon detection, both photon detectors. Um, uh, but the real, the real beauty of this device is you have this exquisite photon number resolving capability uh, where you can easily, there's going to be basically no error in identifying one versus two, three, four, and five, they start to smear together. But for, for many photonic quantum information processing or computing applications, you just need to know zero, one, or more than one. And this easily does that with basically no error. And the, there's no probability you're going to mistake this kind of low signal level for a single photon. One of the challenges, though, is that uh, 
you know, you, let's say if the laser is off and it's connected to the detector, what we found is you still see clicks coming from the laser, and that's really just turns out to be black body radiation. So if I change the temperature of the laser cavity, what I find is, you know, this black body radiation goes up if you go hotter or goes down if you cool the laser cavity. So this is a pro, uh, a source of background counts that you, you can't eliminate because the device is at cryogenic temperatures and often you're looking at something at room temperature. Uh, and just for uh, reference, uh, these are the pulse heights you get from a, when pulsing the 1550 laser. So uh, in general, the energy of the black body radiation is a little lower than 1550, but you could see that this could cause an error in your computing system uh, from these background uh, black body photons. All right, so uh, let me summarize these superconducting detector technologies. They're really quite amazingly high performance, uh, very high efficiency, very low dark count rates. Um, they're pretty amazing at the single pixel level and, and we are working on making cameras. Uh, and let me just end by saying, I think there are a lot of options for superconducting single photon detectors. The superconducting versions are, you know, still an active area of research. We don't really know what their fundamental, limit, fundamental limits are. Uh, it's an exciting area of research. Uh, and I actually do think a lot more could be done in improving their performance uh, for future quantum information applications. And this is really a matter of doing really good material science. All right. Thanks for your attention. And I'd be happy uh, to take questions. And you can send me emails if you have questions. Uh, thank you, Saul. Thank you very much. It's a, it's a great presentation. I, I personally learned a lot. So, <laughs> uh, let's let's take some uh, questions. Um, um, yeah, from audience. Um, any potential challenges when operating SNSD SPD outside lab environment, such as in deployed QKD network? Uh, no, I don't. I don't think there are really many challenges. I mean. Um, I don't know, about 15 years ago, I would go on road trips where I would carry uh, some nanowire detectors and, and do demonstrations like long distance QKD over 200 or 300 kilometers of fiber. And in fact, I took one of my systems to Japan as checked luggage uh, and just went through customs and, and all that uh, without a problem. Uh, so I don't, I don't think so. And the beauty of these nanowire detector, and I, I'm, I'm sorry, I probably didn't show a pulse, but the pulses coming out of a nanowire detector can be easily conditioned. So they look exactly like pulses that come out of like a, a, a single, you know, a, spe, a single photon avalanche detector or a PMT. It's, be, it's really easy to, to condition the pulses. So, it, you know, it's exactly like what you'd get out of a conventional detector. And so I think it's very, it's been widely adopted in lots of places because it's, um, it's easy to use. One tremendous advantage of the superconducting technologies over, over the avalanche photomultiplier tube or the PMT is that with PMTs and, and avalanche photodiodes, people take exquisite care to make sure to not accidentally turn on the room lights when their detectors are on. Because oftentimes you turn on the room lights when the detectors are on and you blow up the device because there's so much gain that, and then suddenly you have so many photoelectrons that were created when the lights turned on that the, you know, you basically, they heat up, get too mm -hmm. hot and burn out. Um, and what's great about these single photon detectors is that, you know, they're cold, but they're extremely robust. We, you know, we often will turn on the lights on and off, you know, and not care whether it affects the nanowire or the TES because we know they won't burn up. Uh, so it makes, the, you know, adjusting things in the lab a lot easier because sometimes you just need to turn on the lights in the lab because you can't see the knob that you need to turn. Um, so um, I, I think it's pretty easy. There, the transition sensor requires more work, and maybe you need someone who's got a PhD uh, to operate reliably. But um, the nanowires are very simple to operate. Just turn on the current and wait for pulses. Okay, great. So uh, I'll take one one quick questions because to us, we want to sure. stay on time. So uh, any prospect for uh, any of these detectors at higher temperature? Oh yeah, I think that's a huge area, wide open area. There have been, there's been some work on uh, oh, uh, magnesium diboride and high TC superconductors uh, who have started to see, you know, single photon detection. 
Um, but one of the things that's challenging, right, is if, if you really want to get really high efficiencies, like 98 or 99 percent efficiency, mm -hmm. um, coupling the light to devices uh, can be a challenge because the device has to be a relatively large. Uh, you know, a 1.55 micron is actually a kind of a big, kind of big spatially. And uh, getting these kinds of nanostructures fabricated on large scales is a um, fab, fab problem and a material science problem. So I think detection in these high temperature superconductors, I, I think, will happen soon. Whether or not the fabrication technology and material science improves so that you can get large areas which are photosensitive, uh, that's that's a big challenge. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Saul. And uh, yeah, let's uh, move to the next speaker. Danny looking from uh, Stanford University from Yelena Wokovic uh, lab. And uh, yeah, please, Daniel, floor is yours. Uh, hi, uh, uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, I'm a post, sorry, I'm trying to. Uh, close this window and the cursor is not letting me get on top of it anymore. There we go. Okay, great. Sorry. Uh, yeah, so uh, I'm a postdoc in the group of Professor Yelena Vukovic at Stanford University, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here at the Cisco Quantum Summit. And I will talk to you about uh, quantum photonics in silicon carbide. Um, and first, I will uh, I'll show this slide about uh, uh, quantum circuits. What are our approaches to making? Uh, quantum circuits, and uh, the uh, there's a, a number of them, and we've heard about a number of them in detail or alluded uh, uh, over these two days. Uh, one of them is we can uh, apply the technologies that we have for making uh, regular uh, uh, electrical circuits that is a very mature technology, and just uh, pattern the circuits in a more traditional way, the way we understand circuitry. Um, like superconducting qubits or photonic circuits. Um, an example, of, of course, is uh, the work by Xanadu and many others. Um, or we can use the fundamental building blocks that nature has given us, the, the most fundamental ones, which are atoms, and then we can assemble them into, uh, into arrays uh, in, using lasers. Um, and uh, that's another example. Or we, can, uh, we don't need to do anything to make quantum circuits. We just gather them. We go to a mine or we find a meteorite, and uh, in it we would find either diamond or silicon carbide as two examples. And um, um, those are already quantum circuits. Um, so uh, what do I mean by that? Um, uh, the quantum circuits are color centers. Uh, color centers are defects in a crystal lattice, um, such as in a semiconductor. Uh, and the reason they're called color centers is because they give color to the material. And the reason they give color is because they absorb uh, one color and emit another. Um, and um, uh, in this particular picture, it's a lattice of silicon carbide, and there is one missing atom, and that creates a vacancy. Um, um, and uh, uh, it is not too hard to imagine that a uh, an absence of an atom in it perfectly periodic crystalline host can have similar physics to actually being an atom, but in a vacuum. In this case, it'd be called a semiconductor vacuum. Uh, similar rules applies, uh, ground states, excited states, uh, and in particular, the uh, thing that we are interested in, uh, the types of defects, the types of color centers we're interested in are those which have a long lived um, quantum memory in the ground states and excited states which have optical transitions to the ground states. and so the long-lived quantum memory can be encoded onto a flying qubit, a photon. And here you can see, depending on if your spin is one half or three halves at, the, uh, at any given moment, an excitation would yield a blue or a red photon. And so this is, would be an encoding for, uh, for a qubit. Now, the reason I say that uh, we can mine out of the ground or find meteorites quantum circuits as opposed to just qubits is that there is more to the color center than just its own absolute, you know, local uh, lack or modification of a, of a, of a, of a point uh, um, uh, location. Uh, specifically, uh, there are also inhomogeneities around the crystal that can actually be taken advantage of. So if you consider uh, now the same picture, but now the red and blue uh, represent uh, particular isotopes of silicon and carbon. 
And then we happen to have two other isotopes nearby that are different, the silicon-29 and carbon-13. Now, those have a spin, and those nuclear spins talk to the electron spin. And uh, now you can actually control the nuclear spins using the electron spin. And uh, now you can actually say that, uh, uh, and by say, I mean do. And uh, by do, I mean not even with just these three, uh, example of three uh, qubits, but up to uh, seven qubits and, and then beyond, you can actually um, uh, create uh, uh, already uh, operate quantum circuits, having done nothing in terms of device engineering. I myself work primarily in photonic device engineering and, and, and photonic physics. And for me, everything starts with making a device. But here, there's no device. The device is, um, is just the crystal. Um, now, the reason that um, um, this is still a, uh, we are working on this, and yet it's a, uh, this is a photonic stock, is you cannot uh, have a fully working quantum computer based just on a single color center talking to a bunch of nuclear spins. And the reason is that there's a limit to how many nuclear spins you can uh, control with a single color center. And the reason for that is you can only have so many close proximity uh, nuclear spins, they get further and further away uh, uh, um, if you want to have more of them. Uh, and uh, the further away they are, the weaker they are to control, the lower the fidelities, and at some point it's impossible. So the uh, current most uh, realistic approach towards scalable quantum computing is using color centers is network-based. And in this case, we don't mean network um, as in uh, one here and one next door or in the uh, in, in the country next door, but uh, rather uh, on the same chip, uh, just distance being more than 10 nanometers. Um, what I mean by that, uh, the reason I say this is that um, if uh, qubits need to have direct interactions with each other in some way. And if you want to have multiple color centers talk to each other, they need to be uh, uh, within 10 nanometers apart for direct dipole interaction. And uh, if they're further away, you need to connect them some other way. And the approach is through photons. Um, and so that is the approach that we, uh, we are pursuing. But of course, the challenge in making a useful uh, photonic uh, quantum computer using uh, this architecture is the same as for any other quantum computer. It needs to have be very large scale, very efficient, very low uh, losses. We've heard a lot about losses throughout this, uh, this conference and uh, um, uh, very high fidelity components. And uh, it sounds impossible, but uh, only if you don't know anything about silicon photonics or silicon technologies, because we know how amazing silicon photonics is. It's absolute feat of engineering. Um, j just like silicon electronics, that is why photonics is so good in silicon, because electronics has driven the developments. But there are two problems um, with using the technology as it is right now. The first is that a lot of these active components developed for silicon are not compatible with cryogenics, and that's because um, our the computer inside the, the CPU inside our computers is at, at a comfortable room temperature. And the second reason is that uh, silicon photonics does not host these very nice color centers that are useful for um, um, quantum applications. So silicon photonics or classical photonics on a wafer scale is large and efficient. And there's a lot of various um, amazing technologies coming out of it. And it comprises materials such as silicon, silicon nitride, lithium niobate, and others, gallium arsenide that we have uh, uh, heard about um, earlier in this, uh, uh, in, in this session. And um, aluminum gallium arsenide materials like that also are coming up. Um, but uh, they are not, again, they don't host color centers. The materials that host color centers, or um, rather we say uh, coherent point defects that emit light, um, uh, diamond, silicon carbide, hexagonal boron nitride, a 2D material, rare earth ions, um, uh, uh, their hosts. But you can see there's no overlap between those two materials. Um, so um, what are the options for scaling up quantum photonics with defects in a scalable photonic platform? There is a total of, I think, uh, three permutations that you can have. One is you can take, make a small device in the active material and transfer it onto a established material. So here's an example of diamond chiplets that are transferred onto a silicon nitride or aluminum nitride photonic platform. 
So you make a really good small chiplet and then you transfer it and then the rest is in a scalable circuit. Or you can discover capabilities in classical materials that would be suitable for quantum applications, such as uh, there's a lot of work going on right now on emitters in silicon. And of course, the last permutation uh, option is um, to develop classical photonics capabilities in a quantum material. And this is what we are trying to do in silicon carbide. And silicon carbide is conducive to, um, to uh, this uh, endeavor because it is um, high of high technological interest, primarily for your electrical car that you may have or may wish to have at some point. Um, and so all the advanced semiconductor processing technology, wafer scale availability, constant improvement in the quality of material really uh, placed the advantage of scaling up this technology. But there is this uh, completely, one can say, uh, in fact, one, one can certainly say completely fortuitous accident, which is that also silicon carbide is great for optical properties, just a very good crystal for nonlinear and linear photonics. And uh, this is what I, one of the things we have been um, exploring. So for the past few years uh, in, in our group, we have been uh, continuously pushing the, the limit of photonics in silicon carbide. And right now we can confidently say that silicon carbide is on par with state-of-the-art photonics and other materials, and it is also fully CMOS compatible. In fact, the, um, because of the chemistries uh, for etching and because of the atom composition, it introduces no uh, concerns for uh, direct you know, importing into a foundry and processing it there. Um, so one of the um, one of the things that we've been working on um, uh, uh, indirectly related to uh, color centers is combining um, is 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 discovering um, uh, capabilities uh, in nonlinear photonics uh, in silicon carbide as it applies to um, uh, in the future controlling um, color center circuits. So one example is second harmonic generation where you take a telecom light and then you generate uh, twice the frequency of light through the second order nonlinearity of silicon carbide. And we have an effic efficient devices that can do so. Why would you want to do that? Well, second harmonic generation is perhaps not directly useful, but if instead of second harmonic generation, you're relying on, um, on the frequency, you're, you're implementing a similar process, but frequency conversion, where you take your color center wavelength uh, light, which uh, very rarely tends to be in the telecommunication C-band, and you translate it to the telecommunication C-band. In fact, you can translate it to any ITU grid channel that you may want um, for multiplexing. Uh, this is something that uh, second uh, order nonlinearity can give you very well. And another thing that we have been uh, working on is, is taking advantage of the third order nonlinearity in silicon carbide, which is also quite strong. And uh, demonstrate very efficient uh, soliton frequency combs and in fact have been able to take advantage of the low losses of the material and low noise of the material to actually study the quantum properties of these devices, of, the, of these, of these uh, phenomena, of these solitons. And uh, um, in fact, there are some interesting potential applications in, in quantum computing there as well, all of them much more experimental, but this is not the focus of this talk. And uh, I would be uh, uh, remiss if I don't mention uh, combining silicon carbide with inverse design, which is something that uh, our group has also pioneered. And here the idea is uh, take advantage of the very nice fabrication that we can do in silicon carbide, quite similar to silicon, and uh, the uh, high effective index of silicon carbide, and uh, uh, demonstrate in the same device both the second, the third order uh, nonlinearity combs and uh, second order nonlinearity combs um, for a very broad spectrum of light generation. So um, with those capabilities of very low loss photonics and both linear and nonlinear uh, capabilities, really this uh, vague picture of network-based quantum computing turns into a very specific uh, and concrete blueprint of a monolithic circuit, monolithic meaning no heterogeneous integration of materials where uh, uh, all the photon processing happens inside a single inside say the single photonic layer. So your photons get generated in photonic cavities um, um, in the same um, manner as we've heard from Peter Lodo earlier in the uh, uh, in this uh, uh, session. And uh, then you um, apply various necessary transformations on the photons 
like beam splitters and uh, modulators and then interfere them on the same chip in the same waveguide and absorb them in a detector like the ones we've heard in just the talk before me uh, all in a single uh, platform and the key thing here is the photon never leaves the waveguide you can see that it you know if a photon emit is emitted here it goes through and these are just directional couplers they are very very efficient and low loss and then there you go you get to the detector this is what can get you these 90% total efficiency from source to detector that is very hard to achieve um, if you first have to go into a fiber and go somewhere or um, perform heterogeneous integration, although um, all those approaches also uh, are possible. Um, and so uh, our latest uh, work on, uh, on uh, high efficiency um, and, uh, and uh, uh, high, high uh, uh, purity um, photon generation and uh, and um, color center creation in uh, silicon carbide relies on comb combining both the photonic and material engineering in collaboration with um, uh, Javadul Hassan from Linköping University and Takeshi Oshima from uh, QST. Um, and the idea here is you start with a silicon carbide substrate and then you grow extremely high purity silicon carbide epitaxy with um, no defects in it at all. You will not find a, a single within as long as you're looking um, um, uh, color center, a single defect in this very high purity layer. And then you deliberately introduce in a controllable fashion um, color centers at the right dose via electron irradiation. And then you apply the photonic fabrication method uh, that we have been developing towards making a thin film of silicon carbide on insulator and then standard photonic techniques uh, uh, photonic fabrication techniques to arrive at the final device. And uh, the particular device um, uh, that we have uh, been working on um, about a year ago looks like this. It is a, uh, a disc resonator uh, and uh, uh, it is coupled with a waveguide. You can see there's an image shown above. And so total efficiency, including uh, collection from the end of the facet and uh, the um, and including every other loss is 24% from the waveguide right now. So once the photons in the waveguide, there's a 24% chance it will end up on the detector. Now, um, this resonator supports uh, um, uh, the modes are whispering gallery mode. So you have a mode going right and left. And while this is not the topic of, uh, uh, we have not studied it yet, in principle, there's potential for chiral photonics in such a device. Um, so uh, the first thing that we were we wanted to demonstrate is that there are actually are stable and uh, highly coherent uh, color centers in this thin film platform because uh, previously one has not been able to demonstrate a uh, a uh, high quality and stable uh, quantum uh, 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 defect based in in a semiconductor um, the point defect uh, in a thin film platform. So uh, here we excite this device with the resonant uh, laser and we scan across the resonance and then we detect the fluorescence from the emitters. So you're really looking at the absorption lines uh, of, uh, of defects via this method. And here you can see on this device, there are two color centers. They are moving around a little bit, but overall they're quite stable and quite narrow in their line width. And uh, uh, for some reason, uh, some of the slides aren't showing up, but the idea is that uh, one of the re really nice things that we can do here is uh, we can take advantage of the fact that we can slightly turn defects on and off. We can uh, uh, find the spectral location of a defect and shine it on it with a laser and the defect will go into a dark state. So it sort of almost, for all, for all purposes, it really leaves the resonator for as long as you want it to. And it just stays dark and you can work with the other defects. And this is what allows us to isolate the defects individually by turning off one at a time and doing uh, uh, on resonant pulsed excitation to measure their lifetime and uh, from it to extract the key parameter and cavity uh, quantum electrodynamics, which is the cooperativity. And here we can see that we are approaching cooperativity of unity in this device, which means that with improvements, we can get to deterministic emitter photon interactions. Now, uh, to put this into context, cooperativity of one, is not at all um, not at all amazing for the state of the art. Cooperativities of uh, hundred have been shown um, in both quantum dots 
and with color centers and diamond. But the um, uh, the reason that we think that there's uh, first we know there's room to improve here, and the second um, uh, feature that we have here is a combination of both thin film platform that allows you for very scalable photonic fabrication and the fact that these devices are uh, spectrally tunable and we can really bring them very straightforwardly on top of each other to implement multi-emitter uh, devices uh, in the near term. Uh, but one of the key things for uh, quantum networks is of course the interference of photons and the interference of two photons from two different color centers in silicon carbide has not yet been shown. Um, and so this is what we were able to do in this device. And the idea is that by exciting the resonator with a weak coherent pulse from one direction, we can prepare a coherent superposition of the two color centers, excited states, and then watch the photons emitted from the color centers and observe a coherent uh, beating of the two um, um, emitted wave packets from the two color centers. And the beating frequency is dictated by the um, uh, by the spectral separation of the two emitters. Uh, in fact, uh, we are what we have here actually is uh, um, something uh, kind of like chiral physics or approaching chiral physics. It's not the most exciting. It's the same as it's a similar effect as you would see in a classical device, but it still holds that if you look at the emission to the right or to the left, blue or red direction on the waveguide, the shape of the photo wave the shape of the photon wave packet is different. And that is because there's a relative phase on the two emitters in the resonator, and you can actually measure that phase. Uh, you can see in the dashed gray line, this is what it would look like. Um, the blue line would look like this if the emitters were uh, uh, perfectly in phase, phi equals zero. And you can see it's very different um, because of this phase difference. And this is something we can actually take advantage of for um, uh, entanglement protocols of pairs of color centers in a resonator like this. Um, now, um, uh, you can see in the, in the previous, uh, on the previous slide, I showed the uh, beating of the photon emission from the color centers. And why did we show beating? Well, uh, the reason is that showing perfect interference was difficult for us uh, because we couldn't put the emitters spectrally on top of each other. We, the, the emitters remain pretty stable in a particular spectral separation for necessary amount of time to do a measurement, but they, we cannot deterministically put them on top of each other. Suppose we wanted to do a measurement where they're on top of each other. We would start at time equals zero, and then we would just wait for about 17 minutes. And then there would be a moment in time where we, they're right on top of each other, and we start our measurement, we get really excited to start collecting data, and then, well, uh, then they go apart again. So that's, of course, not very efficient, but, uh, Fortunately, the lack of central symmetry in silicon carbide, which means that the emitters are sensitive to electric field, allows us to control the spectrums um, very uh, reliably using simply applying electric fields. So this is something that we're actively working on right now, implementing spectral control in these photonic devices so that we don't have to wait for 17 minutes just to do a 10 second measurement. Um, now, uh, Another thing that we can do, of course, is if you can apply a DC voltage, you can apply an AC voltage, and you can actually do a uh, creation of flow K, optical flow K states. Uh, um, and uh, the idea here is that you can see measurement in theory, they're overlapping well, which means that we uh, are able to, with high fidelity, control the, uh, uh, the uh, spectrum, optical spectrum of the emitter at very high speeds, at gigahertz uh, speeds. Uh, which means uh, also fast circuit reconfigurability. So the, our near-term approach uh, to uh, optically mediated coupling between multiple emitters and building up quantum networks is rather than relying on individual photonic resonators, uh, have a single resonator where you have uh, multiple emitters, all of them are controlled uh, via, a, uh, uh, via electrodes and the reconfiguring them to um, perform uh, uh, pairwise uh, entanglement uh, generation. Now, uh, uh, this, is, uh, this looks uh, relatively straightforward. Uh, and of course, uh, in the long term, we're hoping to be able to, uh, roughly speaking, order a, a circuit like this from a foundry. But just because your material is compatible with a foundry, if you're not in a foundry, then it doesn't really help you that much. 
uh, uh, in the same way that if uh, uh, you're working with Silicon Insulator and you're doing some very exciting work with collaborating with the Foundry, if suddenly there's no more Foundry, the complexity of things you'd be able to do is going to go down very quickly. Uh, simply, uh, for reasons as simple as topology, if you have more than two electrodes uh, in a device, you cannot make it efficient two by two grid of devices without in, uh, vias and uh, multi-layer interconnects. And uh, uh, we or uh, most platforms are not at the point where we can make a single device and uh, and know that it will have, uh, you know, with unity yield to cool it down and say that it works. Um, so uh, we've, we've been working on improving uh, the uh, photonic resonators and making them compatible with a different type of measurement approach uh, that allows for scalability in a university setting. So the devices that we're making right now, this is the latest generation, is, uh, is uh, you can make, call them a dome resonator, reflow resonator, or a mushroom resonator. Um, uh, the idea here is you rely on uh, beautiful etching properties of photoresist to define these extremely smooth resonators um, with practically no surface roughness. In fact, I can even say, uh, uh, let me say no surface roughness. And the reason I can say that is because this roughness over this top surface is actually exactly the same as the roughness from the um, top surface as it was polished. Um, so fabrication introduces no uh, issues. Uh, and this is what the mode looks like. Again, it's a whispering gallery mode resonator. It's a, it's a, it's a mushroom and the mode is going around the mushroom. And uh, now we uh, take this mushroom and we irradiate it at a higher dose than before uh, to create uh, more color centers than we did in the previous generation devices. And now what we can do is already observe a super radiant behavior of an ensemble of emitters. Um, uh, we can actually extract the, because of the circular geometry, we can extract a number of emitters uh, by looking forward and back, propagating uh, modes, the, the fraction of the dip and the amplitude of the peak can come in combined tell us that we have multiple emitters on the order of 10 that are interacting together and emitting um, uh, uh, indistinguishable photons. And to measure these devices, we've been developing uh, new measurement techniques, uh, new devices, new probes. And this is a, um, uh, a curious waveguide fiber probe via compliant mechanical design where a fiber gets glued to a waveguide and then delivers with very high efficiency uh, photons to and from the resonator. Uh, the efficiencies we've been demonst demonstrating so far is about 50%, but we can do, uh, we can definitely do better. Um, and we can control the coupling to the resonator very efficiently. And the idea is this is sort of an analog of these room temperature probes that, um, but on a smaller scale, uh, that are used routinely for characterizing photonic devices. And so we've seen a 10 time improvement in, uh, uh, various uh, properties have seen uh, of, of the cavity QED system, seen um, uh, coherent ensembles of emitters via dipole-induced transparency. All these peaks that you see here are individual emitters in this cavity. And we're working on uh, now adding electrical components to this probe for full electrical and microwave and optical control. Um, uh, so um, with that, uh, uh, I'll show again this outlook figure. Uh, and uh, we're taking, of course, very circuitous path. And for one, one reason is because uh, uh, we just get excited about things that we uh, didn't know existed before. Uh, um, and uh, not necessarily because they're very complicated, but because we didn't know about them. And then we start looking into them. But um, for the most part, all the components here, I'm showing various components, not just from our group, just uh, um, uh, both from our collaborators and just other uh, groups that have been developing cryogenic technology for quantum applications. And really everything is there in principle. It's uh, now a matter of, uh, of work and uh, um, continuing to explore and maybe finding new things. So with that, I'd like to thank uh, um, all our group, uh, uh, all everybody who has worked on this project and uh, our uh, funders and our collaborators. And uh, if there's time, I'll be happy to take questions. Daniel, thank you very much for the great presentations. Uh, we have time for one question. Um, uh, how do you compare silicon carbide technology with uh, VKC centers in diamond? Uh, right. So uh, in general, uh, 
uh, in terms of optical properties, there is no rival to diamond uh, color centers. They have very high uh, fraction of emissions of zero phonon line and uh, uh, very little phonon coupling um, to the optical, uh, because they have little phonon coupling to the optical state. Um, the advantages of um, uh, silicon carbide at the moment is wafer scalability and operation at higher temperatures. The color center we work with is coherent both for uh, optical and spin um, uh, uh, coherence up to uh, 10 or 20 Kelvin, whereas most color centers in diamond that have optical coherence um, need to be at uh, much lower temperatures. So I think it's, uh, in principle, the, the intrinsic properties of diamond are definitely superior. Technologically, silicon carbide has advantages. Mm -hmm. And uh, can you remind what was the uh, temperature operation for silicon carbide? Uh, for silicon carbide, uh, about 10 Kelvin, 10 to 20 Kelvin. Okay. And for and for diamond, uh, uh, the silicon vacancy, which is the most uh, the most uh, advanced color center right now, operates at millikelvin temperatures or at a few Kelvin, mm -hmm. depending on uh, if you play some some tricks with its environment. But uh, yes. Great. Thank you very much again, Daniel. And uh, let's move to the final speaker of this session, Hassan Shapurian from Cisco Quantum Team. Please uh, go ahead. Hello, everyone. Uh, let me just change my pointer. OK, great. Um, so can you hear me? OK, uh, so let me begin by thanking the organizers, my colleagues at Cisco, for organizing this event and giving me the opportunity to speak. Um, so let me start with a brief overview of theory projects uh, at Cisco Research. So I joined about a year ago, and I'm leading the uh, theoretical research on quantum photonics. Uh, and we focus on both quantum computing and quantum network. So here I'm just highlighting some of our recent works, which, you, which we posted on archive uh, uh, over the summer and earlier. Uh, so for the quantum computing, we are exploring both uh, you know, more uh, uh, efficient hardware designs in terms of the, what we learn a lot actually over this session uh, in terms of deterministic uh, uh, single photon generators uh, or in general doing uh, you know measurement based quantum computing or fault tolerant quantum computing based on these uh, like rapidly developing technologies as well as uh, developing software and compiler where we uh, recently put out this paper uh, where we characterize the power of photonic quantum processors given the experimental parameters or in terms of material properties that we have at hand and also kind of providing a roadmap of how far we need to go if we want to realize, let's say, a near-term quantum processor, photonic quantum processor. So for today, I would like to tell you about uh, a recent theory project that uh, we have finished uh, which is about all photonic one-way quantum repeaters. So this uh, project uh, was in collaboration with our two summer interns. Uh, here you see their pictures, Yushuan Zhang and Dao Hang Miu, as well as Ali Reza Shabani. And we plan to put this paper out on archive in a few weeks. So here's the outline of my talk. So I will briefly uh, give an uh, introduction to quantum repeaters, kind of uh, providing the perspective that we have kind of to pursue some of the ideas in this direction. Uh, and then I set the stage uh, for uh, our uh, architecture. Uh, so I'll briefly go over uh, this novel quantum error correcting approach that we have here. Um, and finally, I'll finish with some performance analysis and some uh, concluding remarks and uh, possible uh, future directions. Okay. So you have seen this picture, I think, um, yesterday, actually a couple of times, kind of a cartoon of, uh, let's say, some future quantum network where we have both local network where uh, there are like these, uh, these nodes kind of close to each other, short distance communication, uh, and eventually, you know, some long distance communication or quantum communication. And for that, you know, because of the reasons that we kind of extensively discussed yesterday, uh, we need quantum repeaters. And that's partly uh, the reason that we are pursuing quantum repeaters. But if it, let me just tell you our perspective. You know, uh, the ideas of uh, quantum repeaters have been around for maybe you know, since uh, late 90s or early 2000. Uh, 
but uh, there has not been any demonstration of quantum repeaters. And one may ask, uh, what would that, what would that be? Uh, what would uh, the reason be? Uh, so, uh, uh, to us, actually, uh, to our knowledge, uh, one of the uh, bottlenecks is uh, all these uh, strict uh, requirements uh, for the hardware. Let's say you need many matter qubits or long-lived long quantum memories. Uh, also, uh, the very high efficiency uh, or uh, very uh, uh, low-loss coupling. Uh, so then uh, we want to approach this problem uh, uh, having in mind how to minimize or how to relax uh, um, these uh, strict conditions so that one may, you know, kind of uh, realize some of these early versions of quantum repeaters. So quantum repeaters in general uh, are divided into two categories, kind of we can you know, all these past efforts can be divided into two categories. And I should say that here, uh, I'm not uh, uh, kind of comprehensively going over the vast literature of quantum repeaters. So I'm showing, uh, you know, a few representative examples. Uh, so the two-way repeater works uh, as follows. So we have the origin and destination, Alice and Bob, and some uh, repeater nodes in between as you can see here in this picture. So these pairs represent the repeater nodes and uh, we start by generating the bell pairs between these nearest neighbor adjacent repeater nodes. And then by performing a bell state measurement, we make, uh, we uh, realize a long range uh, bell pair between Alice and Bob. Uh, so uh, there are some challenges, you know, with this uh, approach. Uh, so first is, Let's say if you imagine, you know, in future, if you have some large scale quantum network, uh, then the problem of routing or in general scalability of this approach could be challenging. The other thing is the latency here. Let's say typically people uh, discuss uh, uh, some linear optics using linear optics to perform this, to make these belt state measurements. And uh, uh, that is probabilistic. At the same time, it requires photons arriving at the same time at the same location. Uh, so that could introduce, uh, you know, both uh, the requirement for long-lived quantum memory and also this finite uh, or uh, this, uh, you know, less than one success probability of these events may introduce extra latency, meaning that one needs to do this repeat until success process to, uh, uh, to establish a long-range entanglement between the nodes. Of course, uh, there have been a lot of progress to, uh, you know, uh, to lower all these uh, requirements, you know, relax them uh, to some extent. Uh, and those efforts can also be uh, generally divided into two categories. So uh, instead of using, uh, you know, single photons or uh, just uh, single qubits and perform bell state measurements, maybe one can uh, use uh, this encoded state, some quantum codes, and then perform the logical bell state measurements. That way, if we uh, miss some of these photons, still uh, you know, can, uh, can faithfully uh, perform this bell state measurement, or uh, you know, kind of uh, using these multiplexing ideas, we can have multiple photons and using this graph state type uh, of uh, states uh, so that uh, we have this all-to-all -all connected graph. And once one of these bell state measurements are successful on this side and that side, we can measure the rest of the uh, qubits so that we establish a link between the two nearest neighbor uh, uh, repeater nodes. So th the other uh, type of quantum repeaters are called the one-way, uh, and as uh, the name uh, stands, uh, it uh, involves sending a state or a quant logical qubit from Alice to Bob. And uh, the trick here is uh, to introduce some redundancy, meaning instead of sending a single photon, uh, uh, Alice is going to send uh, multiple photons and then encodes a quantum state, a single uh, quantum state worth of a uh, single qubit uh, uh, in uh, this multi-photon state. And then at each repeater node, we perform some quantum error correction, meaning that uh, we monitor which photons, you know, if we lose a few photons, we can still uh, correct it and then send it to, to the next uh, repeater node. 
And uh, here, you know, the popular approach has been this, uh, what is called quantum parity code, uh, where, uh, you know, the logical state is encoded in uh, this n times n um, physical qubits or uh, photons. Um, and uh, so, for example, here I'm showing you one of these early works uh, by Liang Jiang's group where, uh, you know, there are these uh, many matter qubits at each repeater nodes. Uh, and one performs uh, some logical, some control gate between the arriving photonic state and these matter qubits and eventually measure uh, the qubits uh, so that the state will be teleported. Uh, so the other approach here is again based on graph states. So notice that either in two way or one way, you know, one can uh, think of both encoding uh, quantum states in terms of some stabilizer states or a graph state. So here is the graph state example for the one way uh, where, uh, you know, uh, the state uh, or the, the desired uh, logical state of the qubit is encoded in a, a tree graph and then it is sent to the uh, next uh, repeater node where, you know, uh, one can measure all these uh, the arriving uh, photons and kind of take into account the missing one. And based on that, uh, there is an algorithm to transfer the logical qubit information to the brand new graph, uh, tree graph. Uh, so here, I guess the, some of the challenges are that um, uh, usually we need many photons namely like 100 or a few hundred photons uh, to send, uh, to faithfully send a logical qubit uh, worth of information. And, uh, you know, uh, one does uh, this uh, quantum error correction at each repeater that could be costly and also introduces some latency. And the other uh, general thing that we observe in literature is that all these uh, uh, different papers kind of discuss a specific uh, codes or a specific graph. So if I were to explain like here, for example, there, there is this nice result in terms of the quantum parity code, but let's say if there are some other codes. So these are really ad, ad hoc approaches. Uh, and here, for example, the, there's this nice discussion and, uh, you know, uh, some uh, hardware proposal based on uh, three graphs, but, uh, you know, one needs to explore all, uh, various possibilities. Uh, so there could be some other graphs, uh, you know, randomly uh, generated, uh, and those graphs can perform better. So there is, I guess, uh, my point is, uh, in both directions, we feel like there, there are a lot of room for exploring uh, alternative codes or alternative graphs. That's how uh, we kind of uh, approach this problem. Uh, so with that uh, introduction, let me get into uh, our uh, proposal. Uh, so we are proposing this all photonic one-way repeater. So again, so here I'm showing you a point-to-point -point, um, um, architecture uh, where there's Alice and Bob, and uh, there are several repeater nodes in between. Uh, so I'll explain in more detail, but uh, just to tell you the punchline here, uh, what we imagine is uh, uh, generating the quantum code as a cluster state or as a graph state and sending it over to the repeater. And then at each repeater, we just perform gates, fixed gates and fixed measurements on uh, data qubits uh, and then uh, send all this uh, classical information based on the measurement outcomes uh, to the next repeater until it arrives at the, re uh, at the uh, destination where the decoding actually happens. So we claim that this approach is actually, first of all, general. So we are not making any assumption about the code. So as long as you have, you know, we have uh, heard a lot, um, uh, especially this morning uh, and earlier in this session about, uh, you know, possible ways of uh, uh, generating arbitrary graph states on demand, like having making devices with that capability. So if we have such a capability, you know, in the future, uh, then we can play with different graphs. And uh, that's one of the things that we are considering here. So our approach is kind of general uh, and it can be adapted to any uh, quantum code. I'll explain the CSS code shortly a little bit. Uh, so it is also efficient in the sense that it outperforms quantum error correction at each repeater node because we are kind of doing this error correction across the network on this uh, 1D linear cluster state. Uh, 
Uh, in other words, if there is uh, any error at uh, a repeater, it can be fixed, uh, you know, in the next repeater after some uh, measurements. Um, and uh, uh, lastly, uh, it is simple, meaning that we don't uh, require any decoding or any software or algorithm at uh, each repeater. So what is done at each repeater, regardless of the code, is fixed. Okay, so let's uh, actually dive in a little bit more uh, to the architecture. So here I'm showing you what is going on at, at each repeater node. Uh, so here, by the way, I'm showing, I'm using this uh, seven qubit uh, graph state. I'll explain more uh, shortly about the representation, but here all you need to uh, uh, think is, uh, so we are using this graph state. We are sending, we are sending uh, uh, photonic graph state. So this is where it is received at this repeater. Uh, and then we perform some uh, control Z gate. These are uh, transversal CZ gates. And uh, uh, so this could be challenging, but there are ways to get around it. And note that uh, for the moment or for the majority of this talk, uh, I'm focusing on just the theory development of this idea. So uh, there could be a lot of uh, you know exciting opportunities to pursue this um, in terms of you know more careful analysis of the hardware and design, and at each repeater we uh, we are requiring this resource state generator. Let's say some ge general purpose uh, graph state generator, and uh, we make these two uh, copies of this uh, graph state associated with the X stabilizer and Z stabilizer of the quantum code. Again, I will explain more shortly. And uh, we measure after performing this CZ gate, by the way, this second CZ gate can be uh, done as part of the resource state generation. Um, and after that, we make measurements. And these measurements are done, you know, uh, via these uh, single photon detectors which we learn a lot about today. Um, so the important point here is uh, uh, after you know, we generate these states and make measurements, uh, we're done at this repeater node. Um, okay, so what we get effectively, so at, the, at Bob's uh, location, you know, because all these measurements, you know, these are all local measurements and they commute with each other. And because of these CZ gates, uh, uh, we effectively get this 1D cluster state. And uh, uh, you know, as I explained shortly, what happens at Bob's location is just performing um, um, error correction or you know, checking whether the state is teleported from here to there by projective measurements. Okay, so now let me get into a little bit of this uh, error correction scheme that we have. So before that, maybe uh, let me step back and tell you uh, a little bit about this notation. So we are using this stabilizer state, so a graph state, which is a, a specific representation of the stabilizer states. Uh, so here, the vertices, just you know, quickly, vertices represent uh, qubits, and links represent CZ gates. Uh, and one way to generate it is just uh, preparing all these qubits in plus states and apply CZ gates uh, um, uh, for every link on the graph. Uh, so a more useful way of representing or thinking about these states is in terms of their stabilizers. And note that these are stabilizer states, not stabilizer codes, because next slide I'll explain st stabilizer codes. And what we want to do is actually to use these stabilizer states to generate quantum codes and this photonic states. Um, and uh, here by stabilizer states, uh, I mean uh, it's uh, so the states or the uh, this uh, psi uh, can be thought of as a common eigenvector of a bunch of uh, Pauli operators. And these Pauli operators has a nice representation here. Uh, associated with this graph where for every uh, vertex you put X operator and for all these neighbors, graph neighbors, uh, you put the Z, uh, Z uh, Pauli operator. For example, if I were to write the stabilizer for this qubit 3, it's X3 times Z2, Z4, Z5. Uh, so the important point here to keep in mind uh, that uh, there are n qubits and there are n stabilizers associated with every vertex. So this gives us a unique state. That's important because when we want to talk about quantum codes, 
then it will correspond to a subspace of the total Hilbert space. So just quickly, let me show you one simple example of a cluster state. So this is a, a, you know, a three qubit linear graph state, which is also known as a cluster state. And uh, you know, if you just go through uh, some uh, arithmetic, you'll see that it corresponds to a GHZ state. And for example, the stabilizer associated with uh, qubit two is just X two Z one Z three as written here. Okay, so uh, you know what we want to uh, do is to use uh, graphs to encode quantum information in, in the form of a code. So a quantum code usually denoted by these three numbers, n, k, d, so number of physical qubits, number of logical qubits it represents, and the code distance. And uh, the code words are, uh, again, common eigenvector of the stabilizer group, which is a group of uh, Pauli operators as shown here. And then the logical operators are a bunch of operators which commute with this uh, stabilizer group. So let me show you just a quick example here. So let's take the simplest code, namely the repetition code. So it doesn't particularly perform well when it comes to, let's say, loss tolerance or uh, uh, phase flip errors here, but it's just good. Uh, it's a good example to uh, illustrate the purpose here. Um, so there are two states, you know, it encodes one logical qubit, so k is equal to one, n is equal to three, and uh, the stabilizers are given by these two operators, and these are the logical operators. Okay. And the quantum parity code that I was uh, telling you is just a generalization of this. Uh, so we are particularly interested in a specific class of codes, which are called the uh, calder bank Shorstein CSS code, uh, where these stabilizers have a particular form. Uh, so they are either a product of X Pauli operators or Z Pauli operators. Uh, so again, for illustration purposes, let me use a simple CSS code, uh, which is called a 713 Steen code, so there are seven qubits and uh, six stabilizers, effectively one logical qubit. And as you can see, the stabilizers are either a product of Zs or Xs. And here, actually, uh, you know, by accident, we have this uh, kind of almost identical stabilizers upon exchanging X with Z. Uh, but it serves the purpose. Uh, so let me now tell you. Uh, how to get this quantum code out of graph state. So this is the graph state uh, that I'm claiming to realize uh, the Steam code, uh, the 713 code. So you see there are seven data qubits. And then here there are three uh, ancilla qubits uh, associated with X stabilizers or Z stabilizers in this case. So note that the uh, graph state stabilizer here, for example, for uh, this ancilla qubit, it's x s1 times z1, 2, 3, 4, right? These are the neighbors of uh, s1. And once we measure uh, s1, then we get we may get a plus 1 or minus 1, which we uh, store uh, as a classical information. Nevertheless, we get uh, quantum code. So we stabilize or we project it down to this uh, logical Hilbert space. And that's all we need. Uh, and uh, you know, once uh, so, then once we generate these resource states, these uh, graph states, and measure these ancilla qubits immediately, or, uh, then uh, we immediately go to this quantum code space. Uh, so then again, going back to the repeater, so we have this state which is incoming, and then we use this resource state generator. Note that here, this is square, uh, um, these colored uh, squares. Uh, uh, represent the ancilla qubits, which are already measured. But you know that process could be also lossy, or let's say if we have some detection efficiency, etc. Uh, uh, you know we need to have some robustness against those internal losses as well. So and that's one of the things that we took into account, and I will tell you later as I compare it with uh, other uh, proposals. Uh, so uh, then effectively we get this uh, linear cluster state. Um, of these logical qubits, and in this case, there is only one logical qubit uh, per uh, graph. Um, and, uh, you know, 
Um, at that point, you know, when we measure, so this is now something familiar, you might have seen it in this measurement-based quantum computing. So we just uh, perform these uh, projective measurements in X spaces on each uh, logical qubit. And that actually corresponds to uh, an identity gate. So then if we prepare state psi and just do these projective measurements, we get state uh, up to some unitary, which depends on the measurement outcomes at the end. So then uh, what we want to protect here are these two operators, uh, which does the role of the teleportation or identity gate. So then our error correction here corresponds to just checking whether these operators are protected or not. Or in other words, if you want to come up with some, uh, um, you know, error correcting code here uh, with, with some uh, algorithm to check whether a specific instance of uh, transmission is successful or not is just to check uh, whether uh, the uh, these uh, these two operators commute with opto stabilizers with the Pauli operators acting on the missing photons or not. So maybe in the interest of time, uh, let me uh, skip the, the uh, this uh, pseudo code. I mean, uh, the the main point is that. Uh, so we have this kind of a quasi 1D uh, syndrome graph, uh, and we have this kind of inter-site effective stabilizers. So the syndrome uh, graph, uh, so this is also known as a foliated code. Syndrome graph is decomposed into two disconnected graphs, and one can perform error correction on each graph. And note that this graph is across the network. Okay, so... Let me uh, go to uh, some performance analysis uh, for the rest. So before I go to uh, the details of the performance analysis, uh, let me kind of connect this, uh, what I explained to earlier talks kind of in terms of the hardware realization. Uh, so one way to realize some of these, uh, uh, you know, what I uh, showed you is um, in terms of deterministic sources, what we heard uh, quite extensively in uh, Peter Lodal's talk, uh, or other talks earlier, or yesterday even, uh, where we have uh, quantum emitters as deterministic sources of uh, photons, single photons, or multiple photons. Um, and there, there's a lot of pro progress in this direction, uh, and that could be uh, uh, you know, one way to realize these states. So one important thing that you should keep in mind, or uh, I should uh, say, emphasize here is, you know, uh, these quantum repeaters don't require million qubits. So oh, it could be a near-term application of these devices, like what I was showing you, seven qubit could be a toy model or just an early demonstration, but one can imagine, you know, doing something concrete or going beyond some uh, bounds, even uh, with uh, the seven qubit code. And uh, the control phase gate, also there are several proposals uh, also from uh, Peter's group or the Harvard group uh, using uh, vacancy centers. And there actually is a little bit different. It's uh, to perform um, nearly deterministic uh, belt state measurements. So on the other side, there are these probabilistic or fusion bases. And here I'm showing you a cartoon or just a way of uh, getting this seven qubit graph states out of this resource state, these small GHZ states where you know, one can imagine a hybrid approach, maybe using quantum emitters to generate these small resource states and then apply probabilistic uh, fusion measurements. So uh, one thing you should, uh, uh, we should keep in mind again here is uh, these uh, probabilistic fusion outcomes uh, could be uh, taken into account as loss. So if the fusion fails, that could be still corrected or accommodated in this error correcting code. Okay, so now let me show you some of these uh, uh, results. So let's take just a 1D geometry where we have uh, several repeaters between Alice and Bob, and uh, we consider the error model, which is uh, you know the, the just the photons because we are using this uh, all photonic either through the direct CZ gates between photons or fusion gates. But uh, you know the major source of error uh, in photons is erasure. And here we uh, have two uh, sources. So one is just the internal efficiency, let's say from um, on chip, or uh, if we have some chip to fiber or fiber to chip coupling, that's kind of encapsulated in this ADA R plus the 
and the channel loss, uh, which is here shown uh, written in terms of the um, channel transmittance. And if we start with, let's say, 0.2 dB per kilometer uh, fiber loss, then uh, what we found is that the effective transmission rate is still given by uh, some exponential form uh, as a function of distance, but the, uh, the exponential factor now uh, is different or, uh, you know, when we use codes and uh, as we put the repeaters in between, it can be improved over the 0.2 dB. And that's what I'm showing you uh, here. Um, so if we use this 7 qubit uh, code and we consider, let's say, 10% loss uh, on, uh, you know, internal loss or 5%, so this is what we get. So, the, so uh, here I'm showing this uh, effective uh, decay rate as a function of the repeater distance. So when we have a uh, very far, you know, uh, repeaters, so of course we don't get much improvements. And as we bring them close, let's say at four kilometers, we see that at least we can improve the decay rate by a factor of two. Okay, so uh, as I kind of advocated earlier, so our approach is general and we want to use actually better codes. And we know that in photonics, we have this luxury of uh, applying non-local gates or kind of routing uh, photons so that we can get, uh, uh, there, there's no essentially fundamental reason that uh, we cannot imagine uh, some, uh, you know, complicated graph uh, using delay lines and routing. And here I'm showing you, uh, thanks to this recent breakthrough of uh, uh, QLDPC codes, I think I'm running out of time, uh, but let me just say quickly that, uh, so if we use this uh, generalized bicycle code, for example, we can get much better performance. Uh, so uh, I guess uh, I can conclude with this uh, uh, last slide in terms of comparison with uh, other uh, existing uh, pro uh, proposals. So uh, one thing you should uh, maybe pay attention to is just this number of photons that we use per logical qubit and the performance that we get. So the performance is almost the same as the existing ones, but if you compare it with in terms of number of photons and excluding this last one, which is in terms of GKP states in a continuous variable setup, uh, we managed to improve the, uh, the requirement by at least an order of magnitude. So with that, uh, let me conclude, and I guess there is no time for question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hassan. Uh, it was a nice presentation. Um, yeah, we don't have time to take questions, but uh, we had some questions from audience. We're going to uh, forward to you and that if you can answer. So with that, uh, yeah, let's move to the last session of this summit uh, on software and quantum network protocols. And it's our pleasure to have uh, Yufei Deng. Uh, she is a professor of computer science uh, at the University of California, Santa Barbara. With that, uh, Yufei, please uh, share your slides. Okay. Can you see my slides? Yeah, all good, yeah. Okay, so like, uh, thanks for coming to my talk and my, um, I'm happy to share my experience about like how to build compiler for optimizing distributed quantum computing. And here, just a little bit background. So we all know that quantum computing is becoming the new risk to the moon, and a lot of like uh, countries have announced their strategic strategic plan, uh, along with a large amount of like uh, funding spot. And it seem, uh, and here I just uh, like gave a partial summary uh, about like the development of quantum hardware um, in terms of the number of qubits in the hardware and the time. And you can see here, um, over uh, compared to the old days, for example, from 1998 to 2015, uh, like we only have dozens of qubits and they can be only assessed in the lab. And nowadays we could have hundreds of qubits and they can be directly assessed through uh, in, uh, from the cloud. And it is also envisioned that in the uh, future, like seven years, we want to extend our build large scale quantum computer and to uh, weigh like over 1 million quantum qubits. And uh, so like 
to to really achieve uh, quantum hardware with one one million qubits, we want to understand why scaling up is super uh, is is that uh, is why why it is so super important. And I think it's good to have an overview of the history of quantum computing. I think is there are like three key waves over the last four, uh, uh, four uh, almost forty years. And the first wave is try to uh, really prove that quantum computing has a, uh, this kind of quantum speed up or have the advantage over classical computing. And by assuming that we could build large uh, ideal quantum computers. And the second wave is after like experimental physics find that actually zero a lot of noise on quantum devices. And it's hard to really uh, like remove all these kind of noises at pure like, physical level. And uh, the good news is actually uh, we can have quantum error correction code and the full tolerant uh, uh, computation paradigm so that all these problems can be potentially resolved as a software level as long as our hardware can meet some accuracy threshold. And uh, and also like we could still have the quantum speed up. And for the last like seven years, uh, we are entering the third phase of quantum computing. And we are like we want to really prove that even with a near term quantum devices, we, uh, which doesn't really have a correction code and uh, only have dozens of qubits, we can still prove that. The computation power, the computation power of a quantum computer is uh, beyond the classical computer. And for this period of time, we are focusing on the computation, not uh, of some random like uh, quantum circuits, instead of some practical applications. So in summary, so over the last uh, like uh, almost forty years, we have proved that quantum computing theoretically can have the speed up, and um, we can build. We also have successfully built some prototypes um, to show the computation power. But what should be the next uh, like for quantum computing? And from my perspective, is try to build the larger scale for for tolerant quantum computer to really achieve the practical speed up to spot some practical applications. And for that work, I think computer scientists, especially from the software hardware code design, can do a lot of things. In other words, like I feel that quantum computing today is more like classical like. Uh, in, in the 1950s, when we have the first general uh, classical computer, and there are tons of things we can do to improve the performance and make it uh, uh, more scalable. And especially as a uh, software hardware person, I feel that we really need to have our entire software ecosystem to spot quantum computing. And our insight is that the quantum hardware will be more and more complicated. And you can, we cannot really having programmers to directly uh, program at the assembly level or the machine level and um, machine code level. So we want to have some high level programming uh, spot for programmers to efficient for efficient programming. And to that end, to for us to still have their performance, uh, like uh, to really harness the complicated hardware, we will need to have a software stack and especially a com optimizing, com optimizing compatibility to get the full performance. And here, just to give you an example about in classical computing, and it shows the performance of a matrix multiplication kernel runs on an Intel machine. And you can see that the performance difference by using a Python code for matrix multiplication to a compiled code Java to a C code and to a set of like optimization flex being enabled, we can have almost five orders of magnitudes performance difference. I think in quantum computing, we will have the same thing. And that's why we really need to have this kind of software ecosystem to help us to harness the complicated, complicated hardware. And the second vision of why we need to have this kind of software hardware design is we really need to systematically explore uh, exploration to find the most cost-effective cost road to future QC quantum computing. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, in the next seven years, we really want to have a quantum computer with over one million qubits. Uh, that can be directly assessed uh, assess and programmed. Um, but <coughs> 
Uh, to achieve that in a most cost-effective way, we need to understand what is good enough from the hardware side and what constraints can be resolved at the software level. And, uh, and this is usually better than a pure costly hardware solution. So that's why I feel that there's an urgent need to have computer scientists, especially people from the software side, to work from a work with physics to, to, uh, to tap the full power of future quantum computing. And here I also give you an example in classical computing. And uh, so generally speaking, in classical computing, we uh, if you really have a local view, you will feel that we uh, we want to have a memory that is perfect in terms of uh, the price and the size and the speed. Okay, but later people find that with this kind of memory hierarchy structure, we do not really need to have that. We can have a bunch of memories with different kind of pros and cons and combine them together using this kind of software hardware code design. Uh, with that being said, so we want to come back to say how this kind of uh, design philosophy should be applied to the distributed quantum computing to help, or, to help us really scale up quantum devices. And the first one is we notice that scaling up uh, quantum computer modernistically is really a challenge. If you look at classical computers, we can put like billions of transistors on one chip, but quantum hardware is difficult to scale uh, due to various hardware constraints. And if you look at superconducting qubits, if you put a lot of qubits on one chip, then because of the frequency collision, the crux talks of the transmog uh, qubits, then basically the gate error become huge. So like the quality of how can you apply operations onto the qubits become an issue. And on the other hand, for example, for ion cube, and um, one of the issue is if you put too many qubits on one trap, then mostly you lose this kind of qubit or like uh, individual qubit addressability. So that is uh, from the control difficulty. So how can we solve this problem if we cannot really modernistically scale up quantum computers? And it turns out that distributed quantum computing becomes a promising way for scaling up. Scaling up. And they are uh, they provide alternative scaling schemes beyond the monolithic growth. And here in this figure, we can see that from the monolithic quantum computer chip, we can have this kind of chiplet design, this kind of technology by bridging like several uh, individual chips together, and uh, and uh, we uh, using using this kind of near uh, short distance uh, communications, and further. We can, when we have a large nodes, for example, uh, large QC chips, we can also use this kind of long distance um, di uh, distributed quantum network to connect them together to build a larger quantum computing systems. Uh, and uh, if you uh, look at it, so uh, nowadays there are already some uh, small uh, QEC architectures being prototyped and tested. And basically, they are having several uh, major components. And first one is a communication components. And um, they are usually optically active qubits or spins that can emit photons compatible with optical fibers. And then like uh, we can have the memory qubits and they are also called data qubits. And these are the long life lived uh, uh, qubits and spins that can be used as memory qubits to store and manipulate quantum information. So these are the qubits we're really doing the computation on. And especially uh, compared to data qubits, this kind of communication qubits are harder to fabricate and control. And basically, with this kind of communica communication qubits, uh, we can generate this kind of bell, uh, bell, uh, uh, bell pulse and using this kind of remote entanglement for communication. And here, just to give you one concrete example about what we really need to have for quantum communications when we have this kind of DQC for quantum computing. And you can see here, we have two nodes, node A and node B, and we have two data qubits, Q1 and Q1 prime. And now we want to do a signal gates, a two qubit gates between them. And you can see because they are, resi they are residing on two different kind of nodes, you can directly, you cannot directly apply this kind of signal gates 
things. And um, to enable that, we really need to have the communication qubits to uh, generate an EPR pair. And you can take this kind of EPR pairs as a virtual channel to connect these two nodes together. And after you have this kind of virtual connections, you can um, uh, you can uh, you can conduct this kind of remote compu uh, computation between Q1 and Q1 prime, and I ha I intentionally uh, shadows these two blocks because they are just some local computation, local operations, and classical communications, which we know that how can we do it do them effectively, and. And one of the key computation resources, or the most precious resources we con we consumed in this process, turns out to be the NPR pairs. And this virtual link will break after we do this kind of signal gates. Okay, and if you want to conduct another remote operation, you have to establish a EPR pairs again. And this EPR pairs takes time to establish, and their fidelity is often low. Okay, and you can see uh, after the computation, Q1 is still in node A and Q1 prime is still in node B, but they, we already apply this kind of signal gate remotely. And turns out that this kind of communication is called cat communication, you know, and you, it's cost is just one EPR pairs, and it proved to be optimal for, implement, for implementing remote signal gates. And another uh, communication protocol is called teleportation-based communication, and it generally requires two EPR pairs, and uh, but they are more general uh, for uh, two uh, for 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 more general two qubit gates. And you can see here, like still, we need to have some EPR pairs after we establish the EPR pairs, uh, and with some local operations and classical communication, we basically move the Q1 to the node B. And then we can conduct whatever computations we want to have, for example, swap gates, okay? And the swap gates can uh, equals to three CNOT gates. And if you are using the previous, like, uh, cat-based computation, then it will requir requires, like, three EPR pairs. You have to do them, like, uh, three times. But now, like, we only need to have this one EPR pairs. But one of the side effects of this uh, teleportation-based communication is like after you do the computation, not only you consume one of the EPR pairs, you also move the Q1 from the node A to node B. And if you want to do an, some other computations on node, on node A between Q1 and other qubits, you have to move it back. So that's why it requires two EPR pairs. Okay, so both uh, this uh, both of this kind of communication protocol have the crowns and pros, and um, so basically based on these two protocols, we can enable quantum computing. But is that something we really uh, the all things we need to have? Um, actually, not. So DQC help us to scale out more effectively, but DQC could also lead to detrimental effect on the performance. And if you really think about it. The EPR pair generation requires really long time and low fidelity. So especially like if you look at this kind of non-distance communications, they are over 50 times more time consuming and noisy compared to the so it's likely that we will be bottlenecked by this kind of remote communication and computations. Okay. And in addition, and the communication qubits are often much more limited. The number of communication qubits are often much more limited compared to the data qubits. And in this figure, you can see that usually like we can we only uh, uh, we have three data qubits and only one communication qubits. And all these three qubits, when they require a remote communication for, uh, for uh, to another nodes, we need to use this kind of communication qubits. So the number of uh, communication communication qubits could also be the bottleneck, okay? And one thought to solve this problem could from the hardware side, try to improve the number of communication qubits and try to uh, improve this kind of EPR pair generation. But we want to know whether we can solve, resolve it from the compiler side, from the software side. And uh, before that, we want to know like what kind of existing compiler look like. And here, just to give you an example of like a three qubit program, suppose that we now we only have like two computation nodes. Each of them only have two qubits on them, data qubits on them. Then we need to distribute the, uh, distribute the program on two nodes. And uh, the previous 
work is try to uh, find a partition that uh, that minimize the number of remote uh, communications. And for example, for these two, like we can put Q0 on one node and Q1, Q2 another node. And after the partition for each local node, we can uh, use some single node compiler optimizations, which has already been done. And for this remote communication across different nodes, we already know like what is optimal way. For example, the cat communication for e uh, for always one EPL pair for this kind of synod gates. Okay, so this sounds perfect, right? So we already like remove uh, like try to reduce the number of remote communication, and for each remote synod gates, we know the optimal way to to do the uh, to do the remote communication. So how about the results? And it turns out that this kind of compile uh, compilation result. Uh, is quite disappointing. And if you look at this figure, it shows the performance of using a DQC and the performance of using a single large chip, okay, with the same number of qubits here. And we use two metrics. One is a fidelity, the other one is a total latency of the program. And uh, and this line just to show like ideally if you have a perfect DQC with a lot of communication qubits and also like uh, and with really good EPR power generation and what is the performance. But now you will look at it like uh, the number of communication generate increases with the number of nodes and uh, the high latency and noisy internodes communication becomes a performance bottleneck. And since that perfect DQC hardware is really needed, which turns out to be very noisy. But our question is, are we really hitting the hardware limit? And our solution shows that um, it turns out that previous solution focused too much on the implementation of each individual remote gates and lacks of good view uh, to, uh, and uh, gives a really far from optimal solution. And our question is, can we really explore this kind of communication patterns or communication blocks in the DQC and enable this block level communication protocols? and try to enable everything uh, <clears throat> and for example using one invocation of the communication protocol to implement many inter node gates instead of just one and turns out it could uh, it is doable and it's a collaboration work, work with Cisco and it's published in uh, Michael and here I just want to give you some high level idea and you can see here like we have three nodes yeah node A like it has a lot of inter inter node communication with node B and node C and if we look at locally then we will need to have six EPR pairs and it almost proportional to the number of remote uh, number of qubits uh, for, for, for us to do remote communication. But you may notice that many of these internode gates are closed in special and temporal accesses, meaning that it's mostly from the same qubits to other ones. And uh, and uh, it's uh, the communication is quite close in the program. And if we can have a compiler to do this kind of communication fusion to unveil some communication patterns, maybe we can do that more effectively. And on the right hand side, it's just the one program. After we do this kind of communication aggregation, you may notice that now we only have two communication block and if we can enable this block level communication uh, basically we only need to have the number of EPI pairs proportional to the number of nodes instead of the number of qubits so that's a great saving and um, and it turns out that it's doable. And uh, uh, and for example, for this one, we can only use one cat communication to implement all remote gates, and it requires only one API pairs. And for this one, we can use teleportation based communication to implement it, and it requires like two API pairs. And the reason about it is this kind of things, if you look at it, it's unidirectional, and this one is bidirectional. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, so, so another problem with that is we've noticed that, as I mentioned before, so the DQC compiler also has this kind of limited communication qubit problem. And the reason is uh, one, one way we want to solve that is we can use cheaper data qubits as this kind of virtual buffer for expensive communication qubits, just like the memory hierarchy uh, we have in classical computer. And the idea is uh, each time after we have uh, the communication qubits generate an EPR pair, 
itself, we want to swap it onto a buffer of a communication buffer on the local nodes. And then all this kind of remote communica communication can be directly conducted on the communication buffer, the data qubits, instead of the communic communication qubits. And the communication qubits just need to focus on generating API pals. And we also have a compilation policy try to determine what is the best size of the communication offer, okay, the communication buffer, the size of the best size of the communication buffer for different kind of applications because it could be different. And if you use a too large communication buffer, then you may need to map to a larger size and a larger number of nodes that could also like in induce um, more communications. And besides that, we also do some scattering optimizations. For example, like instead of uh, when we have several different kind of uh, communication blocks, we want to overlap, overlap, overlap them in the time assesses and try to generate the EPI pals as late as possible, try to minimize, uh, the, uh, try to optimize the fidelity. And also like, for example, when we notice that a node A need to, com uh, to, to communicate with node B instead of just, for example, sending the qubit back to qubit A uh, and then do the uh, do the communication from qubit A to qubit C, we may want to directly send the, uh, the qubit from qubit node B to node C, and this could also save us a lot of communications. Okay, so this is more from the, uh, the block level, try to save communication further. Uh, so in our, uh, we also have some optimization about the communication routing, and uh, the idea is usually like when we have DQC, we can have this kind of hierarchical structure. So not only we have some local clusters, uh, have some high fidelity channels, we can have some uh, uh, like high level structures. For example, from class A to class B, uh, class one to class two, the interclass channels could have a low fidelity. So and and we could have. A uh, for example, load A and load D, they are not directly uh, connected. So to spot these kind of sparse connections, we really need to, need to have some smart communication routing to solve that problem. And um, and uh, we have all like we have building a compilation framework to resolve all these kind of issues from the communication patterns to the, to to really individual uh, communication transformations, and we also do a lot of routing optimizations so that we can resolve these kind of constraints from the DQC devices, which only have few like communication resources and have this kind of topology, uh, hierarchical topology, and more details are in our paper. And if you look at the results, the results are amazing. So if you still remember, these two curves are like the previous ones, like uh, when we have DQC compiler that only um, focus on each individual communication. And these two curves are like our connective compiler in terms of both of the fidelity and the latency. You can see that we have really proved, uh, pro improved a lot. So, uh, so the things, the key insights I want to convey there is when you have a really, uh, maybe not, not perfect software design, maybe you, uh, you will, you will get some wrong conclusion. And especially if you look at only these two curve, you will believe that we need to have a perfect hardware, and that would be really costly. But after you have this kind of. Uh, uh, really good software explorations, you may change your mind. At least we can have much lower requirement on the hardware design and still push the performance towards uh, near ideal cases. I think that's a, uh, something like we really can think about. And I think there are a lot of other things we can do to really push the limits of the software optimizations and especially more hardware software co-design. And I'm looking forward to explore this kind of collaborations with Cisco to push it forward. And the last one is like more impact of our work. You can see like we are the first compiler try to utilize this burst of connective communications, and it try it really changes the mind about how can we do communication effectively. And I think another thing is it. Uh, 
uh, it uh, also like uh, provides this kind of test bed or simulation framework for future DQC designs. For example, if you have different kind of budgets, whether you want to improve the latency of the EPR help generation or really the fidelity of the EPR help genera uh, generation, which which metric is more important, I think you can use our test bed to really give you a good answer. And so third way, uh, third uh, point is, I think we are really pushing it forward to a scalable way for DQC. Um, and also like some future works, I think how to combine DQC with QEC would be very interesting. Okay, so that's all for my talk. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Yufei. It was a great, uh, great presentation. Um, yeah, we have time for, for a couple of questions. Um, so one question uh, is uh, classical communication latency can be a bottleneck. Are there some lightweight protocols that can be used to communicate the classical bits? Oh, uh, that's a very good question. So I think uh, based on our design and designs, I found, uh, okay. So that's, I think it's a great question. So we have do this kind of connective communication, right? And based on our connective communication, you will find that Mm, something we really find that latency is something easy to hide. And one of the key insights is we can do some local computations along with the remote communication, and then the latency can be directly hide it. So that is something like beyond like reduce the number of communications, uh, we can also like reduce a number, uh, re beyond like reduce the number of communications, we can also hide uh, the latency using some local communica uh, local computations. And this is, I think this is quite special for distributed quantum computing. And if your focus is only distributed communication, then you really need to uh, solve that issue, right? But if your focus is for computation, then that issue is not really serious, not that serious. But I guess we could also have some other uh, techniques to try to improve that latency classically. Uh -huh, but, uh -huh. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So, uh, and um, another question, um, since each qubit and a device is sometimes different, where should qubit quality properties be integrated into the compiler? Oh, that's a great question. So let me, I think I have one slide, right? So actually this kind of latency, this kind of fidelity, for example, this kind of, it's just 98% fidelity and this one is 90% fidelity. If you look at it, all, the, all these numbers can be fit into our compiler design and the compiler could based on the fidelity of the channel to decide the best routing, uh, 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 best routing, uh, routing paths when we do this kind of communication. That's, that can be totally done. And if you uh, like really abstract it into a graph, a weighted graph, and give it into a compiler. Yes, very good question. <laughs> okay, sounds great. Uh, and the last questions, do your simulations take the need for classical communication between nodes into consideration? Uh, so can you say it again? So what part? Uh, yeah, the question is that do your simulation take uh, the need for classical communication? Uh, yes, definitely. Uh, in our paper, you will get that number. So we have, so we modify, uh, we take the classical communication and also the fidelity of remote communication and also the time to e establish the EPR pulse and everything into consideration. Yes. Okay, awesome, great. So thanks again, Yufei, and uh, we can move to the next speaker is, uh, who is Bing Chi from Cisco Quantum Lab. You're muted, Bing. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so let me put it into the presentation mode. Okay, should I start now? Oh, yes, please. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, okay, uh, thanks, Alriza, for introduction, and uh, thanks, organizer, for giving me for uh, the opportunity to give a presentation. And I also thank everyone to stay with us. 
So uh, today I'm going to talk about our perspective on the potential application of package switching in quantum networks. And you can find uh, more details of this work in this archive paper. Okay, so several previous speakers already uh, discussed about quantum networks and the potential applications. So just a very quick summary. We are considering the cute line for uh, connecting a quantum processors at short distance to build up a more powerful machine. We are also considering a major, uh, metropolitan size quantum network, such as the one QKD for secure communication. And the, in the long term, we are also considering a wide area quantum internet based on satellite or quantum repeater technologies. And the potential application we are interested in, including quantum cryptography, distributed quantum computing, and distributed quantum sensing. So when we consider to build up a many user large area, and one thing we need to uh, consider is how we do the switching. And there are, in classical networking, there are mainly two different switching schemes. The first one is circuit switching. And uh, so in this case, if we are, if A and B want to uh, communicate with each other, we need to control all these uh, switches along the link and to establish a direct, a direct link between them. And this direct link will be reserved uh, until the communication is finished. So another uh, scheme called a uh, packet switching where the uh, data frame are sorted dynamically. So in this case, each data frame, when it arrives at a specific uh, router, the router will make a routing decision based on the availability of outgoing channel at that time. So each data frame may pass through a different path. And the, at the receiver's end, they may even arrive at different orders. So in the case of the network is very busy, some of the uh, data frame may drop out inside the network. So this is a dynamic uh, routing scheme uh, and in intuitively what we can see is the circuit switching uh, could provide a more reliable service from the point of view of A and B because they have a reserved direct link. But on the other hand, packet switching could allow more efficient use of the network resource when the number of users is large. And this packet switching is dominant in today's uh, classical internet. So now let's look at the uh, popular quantum network design. So one typical example is the one based on quantum teleportation. And this is essentially a, a two-step scheme. So the basic idea is to first distribute entanglement between two users. And then they can use the shared entanglement to teleport quantum state through the channel. And uh, note in this scheme, the quantum, con uh, quantum communication is only required for this first step, the entanglement distribution. And if we adopt the first generation quantum repeater scheme based on uh, quantum swapping, then quantum state is only required to transmit between a junction and a node. So in this case, there is no obvious need for switching or routing. Uh, on the other hand, on the second step of the uh, quantum teleportation, in that step, all the information goes through the uh, network are classical information. So the existing classical routing scheme can be applied. So this uh, two-step scheme is quite different from classical communication 
where we are relies on direct transmission. So to implement such a network, we may need not only different hardware, but also different uh, network control protocols. So another example is the quantum key distribution network. So uh, which could be uh, uh, developed a long distance based on the trust the relay scheme. So uh, in this scheme, each QKD user only need to do QKD with the adjunction uh, trust the relay. And so that's similar to the first scheme. There's no obvious need for routing at this uh, 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 at this stage. So another uh, another design for QKD network, which can be applied to a um, metropolitan side uh, QKD is based on this untrusted uh, optical switch. And as far as we know, all the existing design are based on circuit switching uh, scheme, which means uh, between two users can do QKD with each other direct optical link need to be established and it should be reserved for the whole process of quantum state transmission. So while this scheme is, uh, works, for, uh, works fine for a dedicated uh, QKD network with a relatively small number of users, uh, we think this may not be scalable for a large size uh, network with many users. So in light of the limitation of the existing design, so our envision of uh, future internet should have the following uh, properties. So the first one is universality, universality which means the same inter uh, internet should be able to support all the different applications like QKD or uh, distributed quantum sensing and et cetera. The second is transparency. So that means the network is transparent to the uh, data format of the payload. So the same internet should be able to serve both classical and quantum communication. And uh, the last one is scalability. So that means the protocol should serve a growing number of end users. And to satisfy this requirement, uh, we think package switching is a promising approach. And just like in classical uh, network, we can imagine we send uh, the quantum information in frames. And each frame contains a classical header and a quantum payload. So the classical header may contain information such as the address of the transmitter and the receiver. And at each network switch, the classical header can be uh, read out and processed and based on the outgoing channel availability, the router can make a dynamic decision, routing decision and regenerate the classical header, regenerate the whole frame, pack it with the quantum payload and send the whole uh, frame to the next router. So this is uh, very similar to today's classical package switch network. And such a unified design could support both classical and quantum uh, traffic. So uh, uh, in some sense, this is also aligned with the third generation quantum repeater scheme, where the quantum information can be transmitted directly by using uh, quantum error correction code. So just a little bit more details of the frame structure and what happened uh, at a, 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 at a, a network switch. So we can imagine the traffic from many users can be separated and recombined using some DMAX and MAX devices. And for the data frame, uh, data frame from a specific user, we can separate them into two parts. The classical header can be amplified and translated into electronic uh, signals and being processed by this classical processor. And while the quantum payload can be stored maybe in a quantum memory device. So whenever an outgoing channel is available, the quantum uh, payload can be released from the storage device 
and the classical header can be regenerated and packed with uh, a quantum payload again and send it to the next route. So this design is actually quite similar to that in the old optical classical network. And we can envision that for implement such a network, a quantum version of RODAM, the reconfigurable optical ad job multiplication, uh, could be a, a important building uh, a building block just in the case of classical optical communication. And such a device may have multiple input fiber and multiple output fibers, and each fiber could carry many wavelength channels. And at the router, all the classical header could be uh, uh, could be read out and processed in this control unit, while all the quantum payload could go through a combination of different uh, quantum devices depends on the uh, specific application. For example, we may need a quantum buffer for storage, a uh, quantum processor for uh, error correction, uh, and maybe a frequency converter to match the wavelength of outgoing channel with that of uh, the input channel. So with that such a device, yeah, we can uh, imagine a quantum internet similar to today's classical internet, which could support both quantum and classical communications. So, uh, of course, this is really our long-term uh, vision, and there are tremendous challenges to implement this, and just like the other quantum internet architectures. So here, I will list a few of them. So the first challenge is to develop quantum memory with high efficiency, high fidelity, long lifetime, and uh, ideally with on-demand recall and multi-mode capacities. Uh, such a uh, device, a quantum memory, is likely required by many uh, quantum information protocols. And secondly, to overcome the optical loss due to the channel and also other components, likely we will need quantum repeater schemes for uh, certain applications. And again, this is also shared by other uh, quantum uh, internet architectures. And certainly it's how to control the crosstalk when we send both quantum and classical traffic through the same fiber. So we will need to uh, have careful engineer control, su such as control the classical po uh, the power of classical traffic, uh, choose the wavelengths for quantum and classical uh, carefully, and apply maybe temporal and spatial filters uh, for the quantum uh, channel. And we may also uh, consider, uh, think about maybe new type of optical fiber will be available in the future to support this application. Uh, for example, such as the, uh, the, uh, the Holoco fiber uh, uh, presented by uh, Professor David uh, Richardson just today. And those kind of fiber had extremely low nonlinearity. And in those cases, the crosstalk will be much smaller than the standard uh, single mode fiber. And for certain application which extremely sensitive to the uh, noise, we may need to implement quantum error correction code. So, uh, so far, yeah, so while there are so many challenges to implement uh, uh, this scheme, so we believe this still, uh, because the potential advantage of package switching, we think this is uh, a, a perfect research direction that people uh, should look into. And for the rest of my talk, I will try to focus on a more near-term potential application of a package switching. That is package switching uh, QKD. So just a very brief summary about the idea behind QKD. So, uh, uh, so QKD allows two remote users, normally named as Alice and Bob, to generate shared randoms by sending transmitting quantum state. And the uh, shared random numbers can be used for cryptographic key to, implement, to uh, improve cybersecurity. 
and the <clears throat> Uh, 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 the basic idea behind the security is if there is a if job if we try to learn the information goes through the channel then with high probability it will introduce errors so after this quantum transmission stage artists and bob can compare a subset of their data through a classical channel and to determine how much noise is introduced by this uh, quantum channel. If that noise label is small enough, then they know if information is less than the information shared by Alison and Bob. So they can further perform error correction and a privacy amplification to generate a final key. And as you can see from this process, QKD is not an instant service. So you cannot just send a request and then freshly generate secret key will be available instantly. So what people do is typically uh, the common used uh, quantum key distribution network has three layers. So the secret key generated by the QKD system will be continuously uh, uploaded to the secret, uh, se uh, secure key servers to store them. And this is the uh, key manager level. And this is to make sure whenever is, there is a request from the application layer, there are always the keys available inside this storage room. And uh, today, commercial QKD systems are available, and there are also many uh, QKD demonstrations around the world. But we believe if we want to have a large scale application for QKD, the key is really to integrate the QKD into the classical fiber optical network. So just imagine in a metropolitan area network, we have Alice and Bob. Both of them have many applications uh, need to be run uh, concurrently. For example, they want to do uh, online banking, maybe uh, YBAX meeting, and also do QKD. And the uh, the channel capacity available for each of them could be limited. And in this case, it is a natural choice to use the package switching scheme to allow all the different applications to share the same channel. So it would be very inefficient if we have to reserve a complete uh, optical channel between Alice and Bob just for the uh, purpose of QKD. So now I just mentioned to build up a generic QKD quantum, uh, a generic quantum network, it's very, there are many challenges. But uh, fortunately for the application of QKD, because it's certain uh, some features, it can be implemented uh, with today's uh, technology for a metropolitan size network. So there are several features I list here. So the first one is the QKD can tolerate packet loss. So uh, it's okay, like uh, some of the uh, package are partially or completely lost at uh, being dropped out at the network routers. As long as some quantum signal can pass through and be received by Bob, Alice Bob can use those signals to generate a secret key. And this is very different from classical communication in uh, where if you have some dropped package, then the transmitter have to resend those package again. So this also implies for uh, the near-term application, we may don't need quantum me memory at all inside those routers. And the second uh, uh, property is kind of related to the first one, is QKD can relative, uh, uh, tolerate relatively high uh, channel loss. And in fact, even without using quantum repeater, metropolitan, uh, metropolitan side QKD network already been demonstrated. And lastly, QKD can tolerate relatively high channel loss. And there are many coexistence of QKD and classical traffic demonstrations being reported. So as a near-term solution, we 
consider two different designs for the uh, router for Q, uh, package switching QKD. The first one, it had no optical storage at all. So in this case, when the classical header is being processed, part of the quantum payload will be simply drop out. And at the output, this will introduce some deterministic uh, loss of the quantum payload because the router knows which portion of the quantum payload being uh, discarded. So they, the router can write that information into the classical header and send to the receiver. But of course, this scheme cannot work if the lens, temporal lens of of your uh, payload is smaller than the processing time. In that case, all the payload will be dropped out. So another possibility is to also, uh, use a fiber delay line as the storage uh, medium. So when, when the classical uh, head is processing, quantum payload stay in here, and then they will re uh, package it together. So in this case, the whole payload goes through, but with certain random photon loss because the storage line will uh, introduce some uh, inefficiency. And it's possible to make a, uh, a quick uh, comparison between these two schemes. For example, if we don't consider background noise and the detector noise, so the solution one is we really have uh, TQ minus TP part of the quantum payload goes through. While for the solution two, we have the whole uh, uh, frame goes through, but with the efficiency eta. So as long as this larger than this one, then solution one will be a favorable uh, choice. So one example is if we use single mode fiber as storage line, and it's easy to see its efficiency is exponentially decrease as the delay time TP. And this uh, efficiency is about uh, 0 0.04 dB per microsecond delay. And if we assume TP is 100 microsecond, then we can easily to see as long as the payload is larger than 1.66 time of the processing time, then solution Y is uh, the um, beta solution. Uh, and in general, we could introduce a delay line with a de uh, delay time between zero and the TP. So that could be a optimal uh, solution for each applications. So uh, we conduct a simple uh, uh, simulation based on really a toy model of a package solution QKD. So we consider the efficient BB84 QKD protocol with a perfect single photon source. And for simplicity, we assume there is only one link between Alice and Bob, but there are many switches. And to simulate the effect that the uh, channel is shared, be, are shared by different users, we assume this uh, switches are only available with a certain probability. So with uh, probability one minus P, the, uh, the, the packet from uh, the artist will simply be dropped out as those uh, switches. And in this model, the uh, asymptotic secret key can be uh, described by this equation. So if uh, uh, this part is just the standard uh, secret key read of BB84. And what captured in K is the, the impact of the date job at all these switches, which is uh, depends on how many switches inside the link and also how much processing time will be introduced by uh, at each switch. And uh, a simple, simple, uh, the simulation result uh, shows what's the effect of the number of the, uh, uh, of the uh, network switch. And as expected, if we have more switch in the channel, the secret key rate will be decreased because now the uh, channel is not uh, reserved for Alice and Bob. It's shared by more users. 
On the other hand, in order to show this uh, package switching scheme could have a better efficient use of the uh, uh, network, it's necessary to go to a more complex multi-user uh, 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 QKD network. And this is uh, our ongoing work. So uh, currently we are simulate a more uh, practical uh, protocols, the decoy state BB84 with finite data size. We are also considering a network structure with many users and also potentially many passes between Alice and Bob. So uh, in this case, we uh, it's difficult to uh, 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 develop a uh, analytical solutions and we are relying on some network simulation tools such as uh, the SMP and Network X from Python library. And uh, some details of these simulation tools will be presented by my colleague uh, uh, Stephen and Di Demo in the next uh, presentation. Okay, so uh, let's go to the summary. So our long-term vision of the future internet is really a unified internet based on package switching, which could support both quantum and cl uh, classical traffic. And in near term, uh, QKD could be integrated into classical network by adopting the package switching scheme. And the metropolitan side package switching QKD network is feasible with uh, today's technology. And finally, I would like to thank all the collaborators uh, on this work. And you can find more details from this archival paper. And um, more recently, we also noticed a similar uh, related works from other groups. So I also uh, put their paper here for your reference. Okay, thank you for your attention. Okay, hey, thank you. Thank you, Bing, uh, for the presentations. Uh, uh, we have one question, uh, is that, um, let me find the question. So, um, so the, the coexistent has the problem of classical and quantum has the problem of Raman scattering. Do you see using the new technology of hollow core, hollow core fibers as a solution for that? Yeah, that's it, uh, definitely a great solution if the cost of hollow core fiber can be uh, uh, reasonably uh, reduced and make that a cost effective solution. And because inside of the hollow core fiber, it's really air inside and there is very small nonlinearity and that will uh, significantly reduce the amount of Raman noise generated by those classes traffic and I would also would like to add one comment like certain uh, QKD schemes such as the one based on coherent detection they are kind of uh, more robust to the broadband background noise because in coherent detection the local oscillator function as a natural filter and that's help to improve the QKD performance in the case of coexistence. Okay, thank you, Wink. And with that we go to the last speaker of this session, Stephen Diadamo from also from Cisco Quantum Lab. Stephen, please start. Yep, thank you. <clears throat> so yeah, thanks for every thanks everyone for sticking to the very last talk. Uh, and uh, yeah, so I'll just get started. So my talk is uh, about software for quantum networks. This talk is called Software for Quantum Networks, Past, Present, and Future. And this talk, I want to discuss a bit about the, the underlying software behind networks, uh, especially behind quantum networks, and what's the current status of what software exists for quantum networks. So in this talk, I want to answer the following questions. I want to answer what does the software what does software do for networks? So there's different types of networks, there's many different things that networks do. And I want to answer the question of what do what are some of those things? Um, oops. Yeah, so I then um and why do we even need this software? 
then I want to talk about what software exists, okay, and uh, what are the missing pieces that don't over, you know, these things that we need for quantum networks, but don't currently exist. So what are the missing pieces for quantum networks? Uh, yeah, and uh, then I'll go a little bit into the roadmap we have at Cisco for developing quantum network software and a little bit of what we're currently working on. So first I want to make it clear what I mean when I say a communication network. So to me, a communication network is simply a, a network of devices that are sending messages to each other and how they're doing that is not so important right now, but you just have to know like a, a very abstract level, a bunch of devices sending messages to each other. And in order to do those things, you know, you have, there's many, many pieces involved uh, in, in the underlying structure of the network. So what do you have to do? Things like frame generation, taking your message, breaking it up in, so, in such a way that it can be reconstructed. We need routing. So if you're not directly connected to your destination, then you need to do network routing. There's physical air transmission, taking the message, putting it into a different format, taking it from digital to electric, uh, sorry, to optical, for example. Uh, we need to monitor the traffic of the network. We don't want it to be too high or else our network will become too congested and no one can communicate with it. And we also need to make sure that the security of the network, that we're not, uh, you know, no one's attacking the network, for example. And there's many, many more components to a network. Um, and in order to handle all those things, we have these structures such as the OSI model, uh, which kind of abstracts these tasks into different layers so that we can focus piece by piece on these components. And you know, there's also kind of things like the control and data plane, all this terminology of this layered structure. But what's familiar with all of these components is that they're all more or less, you know, there's some software component in all of them. So it's a key component for keeping a network running. Software is the most, you know, a critical aspect of running a network. So what kind of softwares exist for networks is, um, yeah, so, uh, so there's different things. There's control software. So how are the messages being processed? How do we take them from digital to, to the optical domain? How do we calibrate our hardware? You know, every minute or something, every periodical instance, we need to make sure hardware is receiving and transmitting accurately, which requires calibration. There's computer clusters. So if you have a big data center, uh, we know we have to allocate resources for different clients. We need to make sure that there's, um, you know, so, so yeah, when we're designing a, a network, what we want to do is be able to kind of simulate these things and make sure our network designs actually function like we intend. And there's network monitoring sensors, security software, and there's many, many more examples of where software exists in the network. So my point here is that software is again, critical for communication networks. <laughs> and this is why something we need to really start thinking about in a quantum network setting. So when we take it to the quantum network setting, we might want to ask then, Okay, what is a quantum network and what does it do differently than a classical network? So again, I defined my, uh, it's a simple uh, term terminology, a simple terminology, what's a quantum communication network? It's a communication network that instead of sending classical messages, send quantum message. Okay, then we ask then what's a quantum message? So a quantum message is simply, you know, if we're, if we're talking about fiber optics and things like that I'm considering, it's a weak light pulse containing quantum systems. Okay, what's that mean? Why is that different than a classical message? Okay, a classical message is also a light pulse. So what's the difference here? Why can't we just use the same technologies? It's because quantum mechanics is different than classical mechanics. And that's uh, some of these, these features that prevent us from doing so is that uh, quantum systems can't be copied or amplified in, in, in general. Uh, quantum error correction will require robust manipulation of a highly tangled states. Uh, we can't store quantum states very long, and not all the parts of the quantum message have to be quantum. Actually, we can't use, uh, you know, information qubits inside the, about our frame structure um, just for the, inside the quantum aspect uh, of the packet. So we need this kind of hybrid scheme of classical and quantum message being merged together, and then we need to deal with the effects of the crosstalk. And there are many other features that, you know, like, will take the rest of the talk to go over if I wanted to. <laughs> so there's many things that become a challenge. So what do I want to show by this is that there's new solutions to be invented. You know, we have to overcome problems that we never faced before. And when we want to you know, invent new solutions to things, we need to take it through a life cycle of a network technology. So when you invent something new, we go through a technology life cycle for networks. So we start with the problem 
And the way we solve the problem is we take it to theory and design. So we go into our, into our office, we start solving the problem on paper, we design some solution for it, and then we, you know, we want to test our solution. Does it actually work? So what do we do is we take it to a simulation and analysis stage. So we write some code and we simulate our network and we find out, okay, our theory wasn't as good as we want it to be. We should improve some aspects of it because our analysis is showing it's not that good, or it could be good and we still want to prove, but anyway, so we might go back to theory and design. So we go back to theory and design, we improve our theory, and now we can kind of go through this cycle again. We maybe go back to our simulation, update our simulation, and now we can take it to a lab. And so in a lab, what happens is you're in a very controlled environment where everything is kind of as good as it can be. And, you know, we make sure does our theory and design still work in the lab? And if not, then we have to go back. And we go back, we try more simulation, potentially we take it back to the lab, ensure that at least this level is good. And then we can go forward into a test bed. And test bed we heard about in some of the talks during this, the summit. Uh, test bed is more like you take your network, you bring it to a slightly controlled setting, but at least what you get from the test bed is the environmental conditions. So, you know, we have temperature now we have to deal with, we might have vibrations that we don't get in the lab. So it's a more, you know, it's a less perfect scenario. And, but yeah, so leaning towards more towards the realistic nature of deploying a network technology. Okay, we now we deploy to our test bed, we go back <laughs> to the theory. We also have to go through this cycle over and over again. And uh, yeah, so then we go to small scale development, which is something like a uh, small aspect of the network where if you take that part of the network down, it's okay. It's not gonna influence too many people, of course, but uh, you get now a real taste for what would happen when you deploy your technology. And then you might again update your theory and continue on and continue on until you're at a full scale deployment. All right, so that's that's my interpretation of how we deploy new technologies for networks. And now I want to show, you know, what's the state of quantum networks now? Where are we focused the most on? So the most effort right now is you know we have these problems of you know quantum memory, quantum repeater, error correction, all these different aspects. But most of these things are sitting right now in this red box where they, we're looking at the theory and design, simulation and analysis, and the lab prototypes. And of course, there's some testbed efforts, but we're still, those are kind of novel things that, you know, we're still waiting on the most. And we don't actually, maybe they're not the most critical aspects because we still have a lot of problems to face in the red section. And uh, so what I want to emphasize is that simulation here is really going to be a critical aspect to, def to developing these technologies and that we should really start thinking, you know, if we have to keep looping through simulation over and over and over again, we better have good simulation tools. So my uh, promotion of simulation is that what we can do with simulation is we can do the following, is we can validate our designs. So we might have a network design that we want to put into practice. And in order to motivate why we should build such network designs, we can simulate them. And that's what we might want to do that with that. Uh, we can also use those simulation tools to develop novel applications. So imagine I don't have a quantum memory at my house, but I still want to invent something new with a quantum memory. And one way I can access that quantum memory is through uh, simulation and software. And the uh, final point I want to make is that you can use simulation to predict the network requirements. So if you write your simulation and you notice, oh, my memory has to have a T1 time of at least this number in order for my application to run, now I need to go to the scientist and the physicist and say, please build me <laughs> this uh, memory because I need my application to run. So I can predict what kind of quality of hardware I need by modeling hardware and using it in the simulation setting. So I want to reiterate this point one more time and say, what's the importance of quantum network? Why is the simulation so important for quantum network development? Is that because we're mostly at a point where we have, um, you know, we don't have all that technology ready to be used in the lab but we're expecting that it's going to exist in the future. So one way to access that technology again is through simulation. And the most efficient, yeah, exactly the same. So the most efficient way to study these technologies is to now create the simulations and the models. Another aspect of, of software for quantum networks is that we can fake devices by emulating them basically. So let's say I don't have a quantum memory or a quantum you know, device that I would like access to. I want to integrate it into my network at some point. One way I can do that is to just kind of emulate the behavior of the device without actually building it. And that would also require some kind of software. And so, you know, this sounds really good. It's, it would be a great solution, but uh, it doesn't exist yet. So why not? Uh, so 
I want to take a kind of different direction and show where are the efforts in, in software development for quantum software. And I took this source from the quantum open source foundation is a list of projects that they list uh, on their website. And what I noticed is that most of the efforts for quantum so uh, open source quantum software, particularly, is that most of the effort is in not in quantum networks, but in the other aspects in quantum simulation, quantum computing, and quantum annealing. Um, quantum network software compared to quantum computing software tends to, I think, lack a strong community of developers. So in this sense, you know, we see these big projects that are coming from different companies with hundreds of contributors, really motivated, lots of textbooks coming out from the same projects, all these kind of the communities building uh, surrounding material. But then you look at the quantum network side of things and it's lacking in comparison. And I think all, one major part is that it's very hard to get started with quantum network simulation because of the lacking educational material. It's not for it's not really well suited for a beginner. And in the end, what we were the consequence of that is quantum network software uh, tends to be lagging behind. So, okay, so why does it lag behind? We can ask a few questions to see like maybe it's not lagging behind because it's it's a sad thing, but maybe it's for a good reason, but let's see, you know, is there a lack of demand? Let's say, like, assume we have all this quantum network software, great tools. Who do we see as the target audience? Is it going to be, you know, uh, is it going to be a high school students or who, who's going to use such a thing? It, how do we really, <laughs> who wants it? Um, is it too early? Like, you know, we have the ideas of what devices we want, but do we really have good concrete models for them? What if these technologies never come? Should we really be simulating them if they never come? And if we want to write emulation, there's not really any quantum network standards yet. So if I build a, an emulation tool, and I put some input output into it, but there's no standardization for what those input outputs should be, then why should I do it in the first place? Okay, we can ask these questions, but my point is that we have we've been seeing in these, these talks that the quantum networks are coming and we better start preparing, even though we might have some pessimism around the, the, the software side of things. Uh, so we should be start preparing. But in the meantime, you know, we don't have to build a full stack of quantum network software. We don't necessarily need to uh, start building tools for quantum data center or something like that, or, or all the every single aspect, but we can start somewhere. And uh, what I think we should do um, with quantum software now is start educating people with it and start focusing on the, the lower and the higher layers of the network. So we should start increasing the popularity of quantum networks by building really good educational tools for a general purpose audience. And for those who do research in the topic, we should start building tools that can let people answer, uh, how does a quantum network work? So what are the physical aspects of the quantum network? And the highest layer of quantum networks, so what does the network do? So how, can I build something interesting? Can I put some cool application on top of that network? And that's what I, I think we could do with software now. So one big part, part of this, you know, if we see in the classical setting is that a lot of these software tools have communities surrounding them. And when you have a community, you have the, the motivation to keep working on these software tools, improving them, making them general, more general purpose for different aspects of, you know, in science and education. So what I think we should be looking at is educational material. So since quantum networks is still in this beginning stage, we need to start preparing future engineers. Uh, we should look at outreach. So if we have great educational material, we should be spreading it, you know, spreading the news. So uh, people that have the skills to work on quantum networks, they might not even know they do because they haven't really read about them. And then those who work on this topic in, in their job, we need software tools that can be widely used by them. So we don't want to force every software, you know, every research group to be working on their own software tools every time they do a new project. We want something centralized so that everyone can contribute to and share. And what this will result in is the faster and more reproducible results. And this could actually attract more scientists when they see, okay, I can take someone else's work, expand on it and build something new instead of having to start from scratch every time. So I take a, you know, I step back to this educational software. I think there are some critical uh, pillars that these, these software tools should uh, encapsulate. And that is they should have an intuical, uh, intuitive graphical user interface. So I want to be able to see what my network looks like. I want to be able to interact with it in another way 
and just writing lo uh, lines of code. Uh, I want it to be easy to use, so I don't want to spend you know, two weeks learning how to write the first uh, application and first example. I want flexibility for creativity, so I don't want to be stuck in kind of one little bubble of the aspect. I want to be able to do things new. Um, it shouldn't take so much code to get started. So those who are maybe lacking in software engineering experience, but still want to get into the field, they don't want to spend time first learning a, a whole programming language just to do a couple of uh, examples, for example. Uh, so it shouldn't take too much code to get started. It should also increase in difficulty. So the simulation complexity should grow as you get more familiar with the, the tool, and that will help people learn more with more depth. Uh, it should be easy to install, so it shouldn't take me you know, a few days to get the, the thing running, or else my, or most people will just abandon the thing. Uh, there should be guides and documentation guiding the users through their first examples, and there should be some kind of support to community so that uh, so that when people get stuck, they have someone to talk to, or maybe they even can share some results with each other to build up the community. Uh, and some software tools that exist in the classical regime are tools such as the as GNS3 and the Cisco Packet Tracer. So they look a little bit similar. Uh, they have this kind of big canvas where you can see the network itself. You can interact with the network by clicking on it and you know you kind of get this feel like you're overlooking the network. You set your protocols that are predefined on each of the components. And then you can run your uh, simulations and you can actually see what's happening. And these run, you know, these are well-built tools. They're used in research and they're used for education as well. So that's uh, something that we can look at before we start to think about educational tools for quantum networks. So I take a, another direction now and I'm looking at network software for research. So what are the key features I think uh, research software should have is that first it has to be realistic. I shouldn't be able to do things on the software on the simulator that don't uh, that aren't possible physically. It should be high performance, so I shouldn't have to wait many many days for my simulations to run. You know, if I could parallelize things, get things done faster, and get my results quicker, that should, would be good. So maybe I don't write my simulators in Python. Um, I look at flexibility for creativity again. I shouldn't be stuck in one one path. Uh, main thing here that's different than the previous is that it should be open source so that, you know, people don't have to trust that the software does what it's supposed to do. They can go and read it for themselves and they can see that, yes, this is really physics. This is really a, a model of, of the, the thing I'm trying to simulate. Uh, again, an increase in simulation difficulty so you can get deeper and deeper, easy to install guides so they don't get stuck. And it should have this, uh, another key feature, modular structure. So I shouldn't have to, you know, have one big block of code that does everything at once. I should be able to kind of plug and play different pieces of the network so that I can kind of take piece out, put something in, and see how does it improve. And now I have one more point here. This is active community. <laughs> so this I think is maybe the most important. So I put it in bold. Is it when the software just sits idle? You know, there's one person working on it, building the software only for themselves. It tends to not have a good lifetime longevity. We need lots of people to be working on the tools, uh, requesting features, looking at for bugs, fixing bugs, writing documentation. We need we need many people working on it, and it should be an active community with you know you know lots of people looking at the tool. So when we we go to the classical setting again, what tools exist for that? Is we have NS3. Omnet plus plus, Mininet. There's many more, but you know these are the ones that I think had the biggest impact so far. And what are the the things that are about them that I like is that they're open source and they're openly developed. So that means you can go to their GitHub repo and you can see exactly what's being worked on. You see who is working on them. You can talk to people there. There's chats. You can yeah always interact with people. with open source. They're well maintained. So there's always like versions coming out, constant improvements large supporting communities, great documentation, lots of examples for people to, to learn from. Uh, Emulation-based, meaning you can take those simulations and you can guarantee that those are gonna work on your network. Uh, and they're research-driven so that you can use them for science. So when we take a look at what exists for quantum network software in the research field, so I list a couple of these, these simulators that I'm only judging here for research purpose. I'm not judging them for other things, these eight points. Um, 
Uh, so there's a QNET sim, Simulacron, Quantum Network Explorer. So Quantum Network Explorer, I want to emphasize, I'm only thinking about the, the tool that exists on the web. I'm not talking about the, the other aspects we saw in the first talk, just the, the one online where it's more educational based. So I'm not judging it here for educational based, just for the research based. And Quisp, that's good in sequence. So I'm, the reason I show this chart is I want to show that, you know, there's the one at the bottom is really ticking all the boxes. But one that I think, you know, in my opinion, that's still with all of these, they're still not all matching, you know, meeting all of the criteria. And it's this active community aspect where there's not still one, one piece of software that everyone is willing to use uh, for, for a long time. And that's because, yeah, there's no active community aspect in each of these maybe. And so I want to take a review of what I think is going on. So far is this high level overview is, is that uh, there's good progress made in this quantum network aspect, but there are definitely gaps to fill. You know, we need probably professionally designed and developed software tools uh, for software longevity. We need these open source communities. And my question is, can we achieve this in an academic framework? So I want to point at what exists at quantum computing and uh, to motivate why I think, no, we can't do this in an academic setting. We really need to take this to the professional level. Uh, so we look at IBM with Qiskit, you look at uh, Google with CERC, Microsoft with their quantum development kit, and Xanadu with Penny Lane. And these tools are, you know, they're meeting all these criteria that I really like is that they're open source, openly developed, they're maintained, they're constantly improving, they have full-time professional developers working on these products. Uh, they're great documentation, you, you can really learn from those tools or textbooks, there's plenty of examples. Uh, there's community support, you can chat with the developers and they're connected to hardware. So if you write some simulation in them, you can, you know, potentially run that on a real device. So you know that your simulations are not effortless. Oh, sorry, not, um, yeah, they, do, they at least produce something. They're realistic. So now I turn to what we want to do at Cisco and our goal is to, to fill the gaps that I've been talking about. And, uh, so what we start with is uh, we have this timeline. It was, we have, uh, you know, I don't put a year on that time, but there's no scale, but you know, this is a kind of a chronological thing. So first we want to look at uh, educational tools. So teaching people how to, what quantum networks are about. Uh, we want to then go into specific applications. Uh, so we want to develop research level software, but we're not looking at the general purpose network right away. We try to take like, for example, this metropolitan scale, where we focus really hard on that. And then what, as you know, the technology adapts and evolves, we can start looking at bigger scale. And then we will take those, you know, smaller applications that we build and look at general purpose software. So we're gonna definitely encounter some goals, uh, sorry, some challenges, and we have some goals set is that in order to, you know, the biggest challenges in order to create an, a successful open source software community, one of the biggest parts is that the first step has to be taken by the one who has the vision. And that step could be you know, writing many, many <laughs> lines of code, developing a really big project and taking the biggest step first so that we set the vision and you know make sure that people are aligned with that. And that doesn't have to be done alone, but still the hard work has to be done with the one who, who wants it. Um, the software architecture and design, you know, maybe we have a great vision, but if the software is not done properly, Again, you know, people don't adopt, if they don't know where to contribute, they don't know how to add their, their components, then they're, you're again, in this situation where no one knows how to contribute. And um, so our goals really are to set the standard for open source quantum network software. We want to drive community involvement. We don't want to be developing software just for ourselves. We want to develop it for everybody. And we want to make sure that our software is maintained and supported. Uh, so the last slide, uh, coming to the end here, but I'll just briefly give an idea of what we're looking at then is we're looking at an interactive quantum network simulator. This is something like Cisco packet tracer, but for quantum networks, and this is to answer the question, what does a quantum network do? And secondly, we're looking at this transmission based quantum network simulator that we heard a bit from the last talk from Bing. And, you know, this is something that we're using to determine, uh, how can we use direct transmission based quantum communication in a metropolitan scale effectively? And this is more to answer the question, how does a quantum network work? So how can we, yeah, so, you know, these projects are just kicking off. So you have to stay tuned 
in order to really hear what's going to come and to see all the details of that. But of course, it's probably most likely uh, have some chats about this in, in, the, in the coming months. Um, yeah, so that's the end of my talk. I'll summarize a bit is I believe that software is critical for communication networks. And, uh, you know, so the simulation parts of the software tend to, they lead to the innovation and we need community driven software moving forward. Uh, so yeah, thanks for your attention and uh, take questions. Uh, thank you, Stephen. Um, we have uh, one question. Uh, do you think the quantum network will be complicated enough in the future uh, and for such that only quantum computer can simulate it? Mm, no, I don't think so. <laughs> I think okay. you know, quantum network has a lot of aspects. Well, it depends on what you're simulating. If, it, for example, if you're simulating uh, distributed quantum computing and you need to run an algorithm, maybe you need a quantum computer to run the algorithm. But <laughs> the mm -hmm. the routing parts, the higher levels, I think it's okay with classical yeah. simulation. Okay, so uh, thank you, Stefan, and uh, yeah, we are at the end of our, our summit, so it was very exciting for us. Uh, uh, I first want to take time um, to quickly read the result of the final poll we had. Uh, let me just pull up the result. So the question was asked, in your opinion, how long will it take until we have a global quantum internet? And the answers has been 16% uh, voted five to 10 years. So I call it more near term. 43%, per, which is uh, basically uh, the majority, they believe it happens in 10 to 20 years. 29% uh, answered 20 to 50 years and 12% are pessimistic, they say 50 plus years. So, uh, with that, I want to uh, just say a few words. Uh, first of all, thanks for uh, staying around for the, to the end of the summit. Um, uh, I want to say the purpose of the summit was that, uh, as you notice, developing quantum internet uh, and quantum networks is a, requires, uh, is a global effort and requires many uh, thought leaders and project leaders to come together and communicate. Also, there are many uh, components of technology, there are many pieces of component technology need to be independently uh, further progress. So we, will, we want to have this summit to bring this um, different, uh, different players in the field together to exchange ideas and highlight the, the, the challenges. And uh, so for that, we would love to hear your feedback about the summit for our next years. So uh, you can write to us uh, to the address, uh, the email address is research at cisco.com. So just, uh, just our general research uh, email. And uh, either if you have a feedback about the summit or you wanna talk to us, Cisco Quantum Lab. So that would be the easiest way to communicate. Uh, the videos will be available on YouTube on the channel that you watch it live. So we can always go back and listen to them on Cisco TV General YouTube channel. And uh, lastly, uh, most important thing, I want to thank um, all the speakers who joined us and, uh, and the whole uh, team who behind the scene, uh, Cisco TV team and uh, uh, Cisco Research who, who work hard to last minute to, uh, to make this possible. And uh, yeah, with that, I want to thank all and uh, see you next year. Thank you. Running makes me feel happy. My favorite part about cross country is like the mental part. I'm Max. When I was 11 years old, I was diagnosed with aplastic anemia. And if I didn't find a donor, I probably wouldn't be here right now. I'm Dylan and I'm 22. Three years ago, I joined the registry at Be The Match. It was simple, just swab your mouth and send it in. Be The Match is a global database of donors. 
To save more lives, they needed to make more matches. So they consulted with technology integrator E+. The solution? Cloud-based management made possible by Cisco UCS. Now, be the match team members use Cisco WebEx and Contact Center to collaborate with patients, donors, and their critical career network. And their data is secure, protected by Cisco Umbrella Security. Knowing what Max had to go through, what I had to do was easy. One person in the world was a match to me. It's pretty special. The Cisco network allows Be The Match to make matches faster than ever. And that's just the start of what's possible. I am excited to meet Max. I don't think he knows it yet, but he's always going to have a number one fan. Me and Dylan are DNA twins. <laughs>